ready to go. Uh, pursuant to the state constitution and the legislative law, the fiscal committees of the state legislature are authorized to hold hearings on the executive budget proposals. Today's hearings will be limited to the discussion of the governor's proposed budget for health, Medicaid, and uh, the Medicaid Inspector General, as if that's limited, but uh, it's limited to those topics. Following each presentation, there'll be some time allotted for questions for each of the chairs of the fiscal committees and other legislators. Um, what we've been trying to do here is to move the hearings as best we can. We don't want to cut anybody off, uh, but I request a couple, uh, each legislator could be given 10 minutes. When that time's up, they can be put to the end of the list, and uh, if they still have the questions after everyone else has asked them their questions, then they can get another shot at it. One thing that's been slowing things down a little bit, if you're, uh, if you're testifying, and you can answer the question in 20 words rather than 12 minutes, please try to do that because sometimes we have very long involved answers. Uh, please uh, uh, concentrate on the question and ask it as succinctly as you answer it as succinctly as you can. So uh, with that said, uh, 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 Assemblyman Farrell, do you have any points? Yeah, no, I have nothing to say. All right. Well, we have... All right, we have uh, with us from the Senate the Chairman of the uh, Health Committee, Kemp Hannon. Oh, I'm so sorry. And I am joined by the Ranker on the Health Committee, Gustavo Rivera, and I am the Ranker, Liz Kruger, in Finance. Thank you. I have with me today uh, Assemblywoman Deborah Glick, Assemblyman Michael Cusick, uh, Assemblyman uh, and Chair of Insurance Cahill, and I also have with me Inez Barron and Barbara Clark. Uh, the Chair of Health, Mr. Gottfried, is here, and, and that gets it all. Yes, uh, Mr. Oaks. Uh, joining us also today are uh, the ranker on, in the Assembly on Health, uh, Andrew Rea, Assemblyman Goodell, Assemblyman Borelli, and Assemblywoman Corwin. The first speaker will be uh, Dr. Shah, Commissioner of the New York uh, Health, State Health Department. Welcome. Good morning, Senator DeFrancisco, Assemblyman Farrell, other distinguished members of the Senate Finance and the Assembly Ways and Means Committee, Senator Hannon and Assemblyman Godfrey. I'm Dr. Nirav Shah, Commissioner of Health, and I'm pleased to have this opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the executive budget as it relates to the mission of the Department of Health. The executive budget continues the historic Medicaid reforms initiated in 2011 as part of Governor Cuomo's Medicaid Redesign Team Initiative. These reforms are achieving better health care outcomes and containing the growth of our state's Medicaid costs. The executive budget also reflects the governor's commitment to cap the cost of Medicaid to local governments, saving them an additional $100 million in fiscal year 2014. Governor Cuomo's multi-year Medicaid reform plan has also transformed the program in ways that benefit Medicaid members and providers. One million additional Medicaid members are now accessing high-quality primary care in patient-centered medical homes. Almost 16,000 high-need people are now getting individualized care management through New York's health homes. Enrollment in Medicaid managed care continues to grow. Enrollment in the state's highly successful managed long-term care program has nearly doubled. New York is leading the nation in connecting high-need Medicaid patients with supportive housing. In 2012, Governor Cuomo announced the state's $75 million investment in supportive housing to rein in costly Medicaid expenditures while more effectively managing the chronic conditions of more than 4,000 high-need New Yorkers. Just last week, Governor Cuomo announced the ground had been broken on the first supportive housing development in the Bronx. 
The budget supports the continued move to care management for all, which is expected to be completed in 2016. A cost-neutral package of new Medicaid redesign team initiatives is proposed to make critical investments in healthcare delivery, including care coordination for mentally ill recipients discharged from state psychiatric centers and those receiving court-ordered services through assisted outpatient treatment, assisting hospitals with the transition to a new indigent care methodology, increased payments to essential community providers, integrating services uh, for in common locations for physical health, mental health, and substance abuse, and expanding tobacco cessation efforts round out the efforts. These investments are balanced by savings from improvements in benefit design, more appropriate treatment outcomes, greater control on pharmaceuticals, and compliance with federal law that requires spousal support. The executive budget also builds upon reforms to the early intervention program accomplished last year by integrating covered EI services into health insurance networks and streamlining the eligibility process to ensure timely access to EI program services for children and their families while reducing program costs. The budget support, supports reforms to the General Public Health Works Program, which provides state aid reimbursement to the 58 local health departments in New York that are at the front lines of delivering essential public health services to promote and protect the health of New Yorkers. The budget will provide administrative relief to county public health agencies, modernize program components which have not changed since the late 1980s, and improve fiscal predictability in spending. In his budget message, the governor said that it is critical for state funding to be consolidated and targeted to better meet the needs of New Yorkers. Consistent with that message, the department's 2013-14 budget provides a structure for making public health investment more effective by funding evidence-based programs and best practices. The budget also supports consolidation of state laboratory functions and better coordination of response to public health concerns. Currently, the state has public health and environmental labs that are operated by five different agencies. Most space is in fair to poor condition and in need of replacement. For the Department of Health, these conditions pose health and safety risks to employees and potentially to the general public. By improving lab facilities and supporting greater coordination among state labs, New York will be poised to leverage our lab activities with private and university partners to advance economic development. Lastly, the healthcare community, like so many other sectors of the state, continues to recover from and assess the near and long-term challenges related to Hurricane Sandy. With tremendous effort and coordination by all partners, we were able to safely evacuate over 7,000 residents of adult homes and uh, hospitalized patients in the face of unprecedented storms and its aftermath. With respect to the damaged facilities, the Department of Health has been working in coordination with the Department of Homeland Security to assure providers have the necessary information to apply for and uh, receive recovery funding through approved federal resources. The executive budget represents Governor Cuomo's commitment to reforming state government to better serve taxpayers while making strategic and targeted investments in our health care system. The Department of Health will continue to work in partnership with the legislature, health care stakeholders, and all New Yorkers to create the finest public health and health care systems in the country. Thank you. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Doctor. The first questioner is the Chairman of Health of the Senate, uh, Kemp Hannon. Good morning. Appreciate your, um, your department's work in regard to Hurricane Sandy. I also appreciate what you did just yesterday in regard to the regulations on sepsis, a particularly bedeviling condition. Um, as you speak, many of the things you're um, talking about of consolidating funding for th better things, it is probably that consolidation uh, that brings to my mind that I don't see the better things. Um, I don't see that uh, bringing pools together and giving them in the sole discretion of the commissioner 
is going to move us forward for improving health care that uh, residents can see. Um, I don't see that in moving uh, things towards the commissioner for rate setting uh, without a regulatory process is going to improve uh, so that the residents of the state will be able to see it. And um, I think this is a philosophical difference with that uh, when there's so many things that uh, are, are dependent on what the Department of Health does for their uh, flow of cash to their different enterprises. Thank you, Senator. You know, the consolidation question is, uh, it, it is partly philosophical, but I think uh, actions speak louder than words. And in some cases, for example, what we've done with our consolidated funding in cancer and in HIV and AIDS uh, two years ago shows that this can be done successfully, result in improved programs and improved outcomes for, for recipients, uh, allowing for greater flexibility within the department to coordinate programs rather than a, in a single line item, we can make sure that different program areas work together to uh, meet the needs of recipients more than just meeting the needs of the providers. Uh, historically, it has worked in the department. Our hope is that we can continue that uh, legacy of consolidation to improve outcomes. It allows us greater flexibility and responsiveness. You know, when you have a, a line item and, and public health needs change in response to emergency preparedness issues or other, it helps to have that uh, an, an RFA that can be more responsive across what had been traditionally silos uh, in a more unified fashion. When you're dealing with a specific targeted program, I would concur with you, but when you're dealing with facilities that have a multiplicity of health goals, such mm -hmm. as hospitals or nursing homes or home health care, um, I don't think that the consolidation there is necessarily something that gives us the accountability mm -hmm. that we need to see. So I just sure. leave that as, as that point. A couple of other things that are in, there's once again in the budget proposal a host of uh, proposals concerning the early intervention program uh, run throughout the state. And I'm really curious because last year we supported um, a major change, which was the appointment of a fiscal agent for early intervention. So uh, much of the collections of monies from the insurance companies could be accomplished. And I just want to know, where are we on the uh, moving ahead with the fiscal agent? We are moving ahead with the fiscal agent, and some of the reforms that we've asked for with this year's budget will continue that work and expand on it. For example, we know that um, we already have one of the finest EI programs in the nation, uh, supporting it at levels uh, more than any other state. But we want to continue to make sure that recipients get what they need uh, based on recipient needs uh, judged by an independent third party rather than judged by the providers. That's a, an example of additional accountability that will help the fiscal agent, that will help us improve the program incrementally over time for meeting recipient needs as opposed to maximizing uh, provider needs. But we don't have the fiscal agent appointed today. It, that's correct. It's a work in progress. We anticipate doing that uh, within the next few months. Because, frankly, viewing the totality of the proposals last year and then the ones that are new this year, um, I still think they all hang on the uh, efficiency of mm -hmm. the entity called the fiscal agent so monies can be received and paid, the, the savings to the Treasury of the state can be accomplished. I agree. I think that there will be savings and, and improved outcomes. Another different topic, but one that the legislature had uh, negotiated and put back into the budget last year dealt with psychotropic drugs so that for uh, the main part there was a physician prevails in regard to when the physician decides that the, there's an appropriate drug and uh, has to go through some procedures but the last word would be the physician. Um, inexplicably uh, that what we negotiated last year has been reversed again. And I didn't see a lot of insight as to what was happening. And in fact, the cost number was under $2 million for uh, that procedure. So I, I wonder if you could elaborate as sure. to where, where we're going with that. So again, this is an example where uh, we want to encourage evidence-based practices in the community. And with these psychotropic drugs, these are highly active, mind-altering drugs that have significant effects but also significant side effects. 
And when we see broad use of these drugs, remember 70% of these drugs are prescribed by primary care physicians such as myself for conditions such as insomnia or headaches as opposed to other first-line drugs that are evidence-based for these conditions. That gets me wondering on what is the right balance in terms of use of these drugs. We have seen aggressive marketing of these drugs and overuse in many instances. We've never seen underuse. And I, I want to protect uh, our patients to continue to receive the FDA-indicated labels, uh, uses of these drugs. At the end of the day, patients who need these drugs can still get them. There is still the, pro the, the authorization process, the appeal process. So patients who absolutely need them will receive them, but it will stop the wholesale overuse of medications, uh, which, which is real, and which leads to diabetes, obesity, and other side effects because these drugs are so active. Well, maybe we need to do what we started with the opiates and with uh, use uh, committee in regard to looking at the use and what type of guidelines should be out there um, instead of just reversing uh, what the legislature Yeah, what we're trying to do is we're trying to actually maintain the high standards that already exist for patients in private insurance and in the Medicare program and in many other Medicaid programs in other states. Why should we hold our Medicaid patients to a lower standard of evidence compared to all these other populations? There's lots of other questions I have, but i just leave you with the one in regard to maybe you could just make a comment as to where we're going in regard to the uh, health care exchange and the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. So, so a general question where we're going? Okay, so the exchange is one of uh, the many uh, great success stories of the Department of Health. We've already received over $369 million in federal grants to support the exchange, and we're on target. We were one of the few states selected uh, with an early certification, a contingent certification in December of our exchange plans for the next year. We're on track with 15 studies completed or, or very near completion. All of this is available on our website. Uh, we have a lot of work to do this year, uh, everything from fi figuring out the navigators, uh, working on replacing the 40-year-old uh, welfare management system with the new enrollment and eligibility system. All of these things are works in progress. Uh, and I encourage everyone to go to our website where we keep constant updates. One of the other success stories is engaging stakeholders. We have five regional advisory committees with over 200 people, all, all of the stakeholders across the state, uh, working with us on answering these difficult questions. And that, that series of committees have met five times already since September. So it's an example of where we've been very open and working with others to make sure that this very complicated uh, book of business occurs optimally. I think that's it because I, I have this clock that the chairman borrowed from the Syracuse basketball team and it's on countdown. So. Well, the 24 second clock was um, invented in Syracuse, just so you know, and so the clock could be uh, 24 <laughs> seconds as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've been joined by Assemblywoman I think, uh, and Assemblyman I Levine. And first, to test the question. Question, Chair of Health, Mr. Godfrey. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, I have a handful of questions, uh, most of which will be asking for uh, information to be provided later. Um, the provisions in the budget about uh, the phasing out of Family Health Plus and the replacing it with uh, people uh, enrolling in the exchange with various subsidies uh, and, and not a proposal for seeking federal approval for a uh, basic health plan. I'm concerned about a variety of factors, for, both for people who are currently enrolled in Family Health Plus and people who in the future would have been enrolled in Family Health Plus. I'm concerned about what their benefit package will be in what is proposed versus uh, what they currently have or what they would have under a basic health plan. I'm concerned about uh, 
eligibility for various categories of immigrants uh, and the uh, out-of-pocket costs that individuals may have to bear either for some portion of a premium or deductibles or copays under the various options. And finally, what the fiscal benefits or costs would be to the state if we were to pursue a basic health plan option versus what's proposed in the budget. Uh, I assume that before the decision was made to put in the budget what is there and to not put in pursuing a basic health plan, uh, that there was an analysis done of all of these things. I'm guessing that that analysis was at some point written down. And so my question is, could you email that to me sometime <laughs> today or tomorrow? We will get you all the information uh, that we have available on how we came to these decisions, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, the, um, the, the proposal for the half a dozen lump sums or buckets or what have you, uh, which let me make clear at the outset, I oppose. Uh, we have had proposals like this in the past. The legislature has uh, often succeeded in uh, not going down that path. My question in particular, though, is I assume from the bill language that uh, this proposal will involve running a large number of RFP processes, uh, not only a separate RFP process for each bucket, but I would imagine that within the buckets, since each bucket has a diversity of uh, grants previous line items that are going to be put in that bucket, uh, there may well be two or three RFPs uh, within a given bucket. Since the executive branch often asks us to waive state finance law RFP requirements because they are extremely time consuming and labor intensive and uh, hard to comply with, uh, where is the department going to find the resources to run all these RFPs, and how long is it going to take? Sure. So, great question. So, as you do know, the, the six consolidated buckets of funding uh, will allow us actually to simplify some of the administration. Right now, we have every line item has its own RFP with different start dates, different stop dates, uh, a lot of complexity, not just for us, but also for the providers. You know, many of these providers also provide services across these uh, historically isolated line items. Our goal is to help to simplify that for ourselves and for the providers so that we can get the best mix of programs with reasonable start dates, stop dates that are lined up and, and makes everyone's lives easier. You know, as we transition to the state, uh, the, the new SFS system, there's a lot of changes going on. Our hope in, and our goal is to make everyone's lives easier doing this to maintain and preserve and even expand on those services that have evidence-based, you know, outcome-oriented, high-quality programs for the recipients uh, while understanding that, you know, not everyone's going to be winners, that there are going to be some losers as well, but that there's reasons for that and th those programs uh, that aren't providing value reshape what they do so that they can continue to provide value in the future and hopefully be more competitive in the future. When the legislature designates a grant for a particular organization, as is the case with a lot of the items that are being put into these buckets, do you do a, a request for proposals process even where the legislature has said this money should shall go to the XYZ organization? No, but I think it's, it's more about how do we make sure that the, the money that is designated is spent not in isolation but uh, along the broader program views. How can we make sure that we get the most bang for our buck? How do we make sure that we don't work at cross purposes from one line item to another? Today, we have very limited ability to do that. When our programs internally are focused in that broader area, they talk to each other, they figure it out, and they make the program uh, much stronger as a result. So our, our intent is to actually enhance your work, ultimately, by having that accountability 
uh, and outcome uh, orientation that we haven't that had. In the I, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with that argument. I, I don't think you have the staff uh, to do those RFPs. Um, the uh, work group on uh, the question of using accountable care organizations in Medicaid managed care, how is the formation of the work group coming? It is coming along. I think we're getting close to um, – we, we've identified stakeholders, we've identified the right folks, and we will uh, advance the process very shortly. I think the, the, the part of the delay was what would happen with the federal elections. And now that we all know who's in charge in Washington, uh, we have clear direction of where the Accountable uh, Care Act is going, and, and it will help us uh, simplify our works. There's also new rules that have come from the feds that we are incorporating into uh, the work of this work group. So all of this will be coming out within the next month or so. Um, the proposal in the budget for a for-profit uh, pilot program, for-profit ownership uh, of a couple of hospitals, uh, not to go into at this point the pluses and minuses of whether we should be going down that road, one of the proposed sites is to be in Brooklyn, as I understand it. Uh, as you know, uh, next week on February 8th, we will be holding a hearing in Brooklyn on the whole Brooklyn health crisis. I would think that would be a wonderful opportunity for the department to share with the public what you have in mind uh, in that proposal and to help flesh that out for folks. Uh, do you plan to have either yourself or an authoritative representative of the department uh, accept our invitation to testify at that hearing? Um, I am not sure. Let me get back to you later today about that. I hope so. Uh, I can tell you that we have not uh, the, the half-day meeting that you attended last year where yep. we had folks from Ascension, from Vanguard, from Caritas and other uh, show how private money had worked for Detroit and Boston and across the country in meaningful ways to preserve the nonprofit mission of the organizations while introducing the discipline and, and actual uh, access to capital of the private sector is the model that we're looking at broadly. It has worked in rural settings, it has worked in urban settings, and what we're trying to do is to have as a pilot, remember this is a pilot, we can always stop a pilot in the two areas that we think are, are most needy. One in Brooklyn where we have uh, over 2.5 million residents in an area with hospitals that have net negative 1.2 or 1.4 billion dollars of assets. Negative. That means uh, their assets are versus their uh, it, income. It, it, if I can interrupt because I've sure. got 39 seconds for my last question. Um, <laughs> Assembly Member Sweeney and I sent you, and Levine sent you a letter two or three weeks ago about fracking, asking for a variety of information. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not received, the letter went to you and to Commissioner Martens. We have not received a response to that letter, nor the information we asked for. Uh, how's that coming? Uh, we have uh, actually, I, I, uh, a response in progress where we've discussed that uh, the vast majority of the material for our review, the health review, is available on the Internet uh, at the DEC website, and that we anticipate concluding our review in the next few weeks. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've been joined by Assemblyman Felix Ortiz, Assemblyman Paul Hasty, uh, and Assemblyman Crouch. As well as Senator Rivera. Chuck would be over here. And Diane Savino. Uh, and in, in response to what the chairman just mentioned, uh, we, if you have more questions, when we get down to everyone's questions, you'll have that other opportunity. We're not trying to cut anybody off, but some may be asked by others. Uh, the next question here is Senator Rivera. Thank you, Senator. And thank you, Commissioner, for being with us this morning. I have uh, three things that I wanted to ask about this morning. Number one, in the, in the current budget proposal, there is, uh, there is a 
trend factors which have not been in, in the budget for the last couple of years are completely taken out, and it seems that they're going to be made permanent. I wanted you to, to explain a little bit what was the thinking behind that. Um, so if you could. So, so the trend factors are as we move more and more toward managed care, uh, we need to align those programs that had historically had trend factors uh, into a, a form that managed care will be able to assume those programs. The trend factor is actually, if you look at the fiscals behind it, it's not really a, a big dollar amount that's changing. But we want to make sure that uh, as the transition happens to care management for all, um, we are best able to make those transitions. Now, if the – I was having a conversation with a colleague, and there was a uh, – we're having a conversation saying what if there's – what it takes to operate uh, to take out a gallbladder today is obviously not the same as it's going to be five years from now. And it is my understanding that in negotiations with uh, – if a hospital is having a negotiation with a managed care provider, that there is a conversation about what is the rate that is going to be paid for this particular procedure or for any procedure, and that that in turn, the cost, um, the, the the cost of that procedure is calculated uh, based on the prevailing rate, if you will. And if that's the case, uh, if if trend factors are in that calculation, then the calculation will be different. If uh, if the cost continues to rise as it will for for providers on any type of procedure, costs always you know, most always rise. How, how does that impact uh, those types of negotiations in the future? Sure. So, so actually I would argue that costs don't always have to rise. If, you, if we, we know that at least 30 percent of all spending on health care in the country is waste. It's duplicative procedures, it's unneeded uh, drugs and therapeutics, and to the extent that this helps focus the attention of everyone on what is actually needed and evidence-based and creates value as opposed to business as usual. Uh, this is one way of, of forcing the issue and it's worked very well in other settings where you have capitation, where you have shared savings. Uh, people find that you can actually make more money by focusing on patient value and, and our hope is with the care management movement, with, with a lot of the initiatives under Medicaid redesign team, uh, we can see that happen. I, I got a number from uh, Mr. Helgerson today that since MRT, we've actually seen on a per recipient basis, the average cost for Medicaid has gone down by 9 percent. So you can actually reduce cost while improving access. Remember, we're up to over 5.24 million Medicaid recipients now. Improve access and improve quality. We have time and again examples of where Higher quality care costs less. So that, that's part of the goals. Second, as it refers to the Affordable Care Act and the implementation of it that's going to begin at the end of this year, uh, as it relates to some of the changing, some of the, some of the reimbursement rates and how the money is going to be coming into the state's budget, there is, uh, I believe it's for the last half of the last quarter, what have you, of this year, it's going to be like $83 million and then jumps to – uh, 179, 600, and what have you, 2 billion in the out years. The, and those 83 are, it seems that they're being, they're not going down to the providers as opposed to that it seems that they're being swept to other uses. I wanted to talk a little bit about what was the, if that is accurate and what is the thinking behind that. You know, I'll get you specific details on that 83 million. Ultimately, uh, it is about trying to get the, the money to the providers. In that one instance, it may not. Uh, but overall, the, the goal of the cap is to try to get keep the right money in the system and at the provider level so that they can better do their jobs for their patients. That's the, the overarching goal of what we're trying to do, is to reinvest in the system where it's actually staying in the system and creating value. The, I, I guess the, the concern that I've heard from some providers is that they've, uh, in the last couple of years, even, they've come, even though they've come very close, they haven't gone over the cap. And, they've, uh, and there's still some impositions that will happen uh, that will make it more difficult for them, and they're committed to staying under the cap. But if there's no uh, – if, if it seems that this money is going to not go into some of the direct care that they provide, and as mm -hmm. opposed to that, it's going to go to other, to, to other things, which certainly might make the system more cost-effective in the long term, but does impact kind of their day-to-day -day operations. It is. It, 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 these are very hard choices that have to be made. You know, we have to balance the budget. We have to save the money to then be able to invest it. And the, the reality is, um, 
in, in the short term, there is a lot of pain for a lot of people at all levels. But overall, what we're building is a stronger system. And I've seen actual provider incomes go up for those providers who are providing high-value, uh, evidence-based, outcome-oriented, high-impact care. And I'm not talking in, in substantial, I'm talking substantial increases for those high-value providers because they can show the value that they're providing. They're showing how they're keeping people out of the hospital. Uh, the patient-centered medical home is a perfect example. More money to primary care, high-quality primary care, using electronic medical records. It, it's better for patients, and it's better for the system, and it saves money at the end of the day. Lastly, uh, I wanted to, to share some of the concerns that were expressed by my colleague, Dick Godfrey, uh, specifically about this, the, the, the pilot programs that are in the budget uh, for the, um, just the, the injection of, uh, as I actually would back up a second and say that I've certainly recognized that, it is, that a system like SUNY Downstate, and although it doesn't specifically mention that in the budget, but obviously we're talking about a system that needs, we need to figure out how to make it survive. It provides, uh, it's a very important part of the healthcare system in Brooklyn, so we certainly need to figure out how as a state we save it. That being said, there is a, a concern that I share with many of my colleagues uh, when you have uh, private for-profit you know, uh, the, the for-profit mindset uh, being injected into, into the healthcare system in New York, particularly considering the, uh, what exists in New York, the tradition of nonprofit healthcare that exists in the state. So I have, uh, I would share generally some of the concerns that my colleague expressed. And uh, since, you, since I'm not, I don't have the 39 seconds, I have three minutes, I wanted to give you uh, a little bit of time to see if you could kind of flesh it out a little bit on, on what, is the, what is the thinking behind it and if you share some of the concerns. Mm -hmm. So we've seen, as well. we've seen in many examples, and there's some really good books about some of these other systems, about Ascension, about Vanguard. I would like to know what those books are. I will send them to your office uh, and Vanguard <laughs> in Boston and in Detroit. Why would a for-profit take uh, on a failing system such as Detroit? Well, because there's opportunity there. And they've been able to turn it around in short order, holding folks accountable for high quality care, and we know very clearly today that quality equals lower cost. Higher quality equals lower cost. That is something we didn't know five, ten years ago, and we have evidence across healthcare to show that that's true. So when you hold folks accountable to the outcomes, when you hold, uh, you, you, you know, for example, uh, when you actually have a balance sheet that is public, that you have to report to your shareholders, there's actually some more accountability in some ways than uh, in, in some of the other institutions that haven't had to do that. And a lot of what's happened has been um, a failure of governance. In, in, you know, yes, it's been hard, money, the rates have been cut, but there have been clear instances of failure of governance. And what the pilot program would allow, a pilot program would allow us to see if we can get that discipline of the private sector if we can get that accountability of the private sector to marry with the mission of the nonprofit sector. That's our goal. And if we can't do it, we won't. But the pilot, two pilots, one in a rural setting upstate, hopefully, and one in Brooklyn, would allow us to see if we can make that work in New York. It certainly works in other sectors, even in other parts of health care, where we have private ownership of nursing homes, for example. We have, it's not that private money doesn't exist in health care in New York. It just doesn't exist in the hospital space today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I may have some stuff later. Yes, do. Thank you as well, Commissioner. Okay, uh, next, Assemblyman Cahill, Chair of the Insurance Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I have a couple of different areas I'd like to discuss with you. I'd like to start with the EI program. And uh, you said that you expect the fiscal agent to be up and running in the next few months. Uh, what are some of the things that are between this and the actual occurrence of the uh, creation of the fiscal agent? So I will ask my uh, office to give you a detailed list of timeline and milestones in terms of where we are today to where we need to be to have the fiscal agent up and running uh, after this hearing. But I can tell you in general that we've been challenged by a new number of uh, activities, including a response to uh, hurricane and storm that wasn't all hands on deck activity for a good two months for the whole Department of Health. Uh, those are things that we didn't plan. Uh, I think we did a pretty good job with it. And uh, 
we're back on track now to uh, work on uh, some of the other work that has been uh, languishing. I, I think we'll get there very quickly. We know its importance. We understand uh, <coughs> that we need to be accountable, and, and we will get there. So we'll send you that information. As, we, as, as, as you suggest that we transition to a uh, private insurance model for EI services, um, that calls into question the, the shape and the constitution of the network of providers. Do we have an adequate network of providers in New York State to uh, bring this over to, to uh, the private insurance world? Yeah, you know, our goal is to actually help the current providers transition. It's not about putting people out of business and, and starting with uh, new providers. It's really about having that ramp to the future, which is, uh, you know, a, a world of care management for all. And. And so what we've been very careful about doing is as we take two steps forward, we're more than happy to take one step back and have those conversations with the providers, with the stakeholders, with parents uh, and, and recipients of these services to make sure that they're still getting what they need. Um, it, it's a model we've actually done as we've moved to care management in many other areas already. We anticipate that uh, the slow transition that we've laid out will allow us to do that while still allowing us to make sure that kids continue to see improvements in the services that they receive. That's been something, it's been hard, without the data, it's been hard to say, what are we getting? For, are we getting what we need to be getting for our children, other than anecdotally? This way it'll allow us to actually say, this is what you're getting, this is what you need, this is what you should be getting that you aren't getting today, and it doesn't have to be the providers who tell you that, it can be us who, or others who tell you what we think you should be getting. So you anticipate a transitioning of the current provider network to be readily available for the insured private network, the insured network, and uh, to that end, um, is there a mechanism for credentialing? Is there a network, is there, is, a, is there a mechanism in place for the measurement of whether a network is adequate? Have, has any consideration been given to the rural areas that are chronically right. underserved? You know, at, those are great questions, and, and measuring the amount, the connectedness of a system is a, a a book of business that has to be done that has not really been done in any set. You know, as we even go to accountable care organizations, we haven't yet managed that because it's a new science. So we are working with providers to make sure that we're asking the right questions and working with parents to make sure they're still getting what, they're, what they need. It's a work in progress. We don't have a list of things that we can show you saying these are the questions we're asking and, and, uh, for answers to today. I'd like to move to health, benefits, uh, health benefit exchanges. And a number of provisions were included in the Article 7, the language portion of the budget proposal by the governor, of uh, things that are needed to come into compliance with the ACA. Uh, do you anticipate any other legislative needs to uh, have compliance, both with, in terms of setting up our, our exchange or, or meeting compliance standards for the ACA? No, we've actually been one of the vanguard states in doing this. So we've been uh, very lucky to have uh, the full attention of the federal government and our partners to make sure that we are doing what we need to do. But they're still in the, they're learning as well what they need to do from the federal government. The latest set of rules related to the exchange just came back uh, in the last month. And so we're revising what we need to do based on those rules. And I anticipate that as further rules are developed, there may be small tweaks and changes needed. But the broad map is there. The, the outlines are there. The major decisions have been made. And, and our current executive order allows us to do what we need to do within the current uh, statutory uh, environment. So other than Article 7, you don't think there's going to be a need for any further legislative support this year on, on this aspect? Not that I'm aware of, okay. according to what we have today. I, I, I understand that Healthy New York is not a health department program, but certainly your responsibility is, as health commissioners to make sure that people in New York State have the best possible access to coverage. And as we transition from Healthy New York, particularly with individuals and sole proprietors, uh, do we have any idea how many individuals will be affected by that transition? I'm sure we do have that data, and we're, we're happy to share that with you. And do we know how it will affect their out-of-pocket costs? Will it increase it? Will it decrease it? Will it be flat? And if so, have we made any provisions for assuring that they continue to receive access to care? It's not shut off by their by their inability to meet uh, out-of-pocket expenses. Yes, we will share all that information with you. And do you anticipate whether Healthy New York uh, is uh, going to be eliminated for small employers in the future? You know, I, I think that employers will want different things. Right now, they have over 1,500 products available to them, 
And, uh, you know, that, that's kind of confusing. What the exchange will allow them to do is to pick among a limited but broad set of options so they actually know what they're getting. Instead of having too many choices that don't necessarily, uh, that they may not necessarily understand, they will have clear understanding of what they're paying for and what they're getting for their employees. And by the way, it'll cost less. So, so it's a win-win. Specifically about Healthy New York, do you see us eliminating Healthy New York as an option for small employers? I, I think it may be, I, I don't know. I, okay. I'll, I'll get back to you. I want to transition to the other subject of, uh, of uh, prescriber prevails. Uh, you made a, a statement that, uh, that, um, that <coughs> the, there are inequities because of a comparison to Medicaid, I'm sorry, between Medicaid, Medicare, and private insurers. Um, do you see a distinction in the population served by those different insurance plans? Uh, Medicaid people are often, Medicaid recipients are oftentimes people with multiple and severe problems that certain, uh, you know, obviously can't be um, provided for in the commercial system. And Medicare is a very specific plan. Is it really apples and apples when you're talking about those two populations and we should have some, per, perhaps some different consideration for the intensity of need that uh, some of our Medicaid recipients have? Oh, you're absolutely right. The populations are very different, but it doesn't mean that we should hold different standards. I'll give you an example. Uh, last year, for the very first time, we finally covered in the Medicaid program the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force Grade A and B recommendations. These are simple things that everyone should be paying for, and for whatever reason, historically, Medicaid did not pay for Grade A and B recommendations across the board. Every other insurer did, Medicare did, Medicaid did not. So we added to the benefit to equalize, based on the evidence, the benefit in important ways to serve the program recipients. In the same way, there are, uh, there are problems with uh, atypical antipsychotic use that are real. And, and the data support that we are treating, way over treating patients who may benefit from other drugs. These are not simple drugs. These are highly psychoactive drugs. And what we're asking is that we level the playing field. We do not need to experiment on Medicaid recipients. We need to keep them treated to the best of the evidence, but we don't need to expand treatment in areas where it isn't proven, it isn't a label indication, and frankly, um, you know, it, it's not right. I, I'm an internist and I prescribe these drugs to Medicaid recipients at Bellevue Hospital. And you wonder sometimes, is this the best option when they haven't necessarily tried some of the other options? It may be easy to prescribe. There's a, a widespread awareness of these drugs because of advertising, but it may not be the first right choice. And, and our, our, what we're proposing is not to eliminate choice, but is to first make sure that the best options are based on the evidence and ultimately, if a patient needs these medications, they certainly have access to them. Well, doctor, I'm going to run out of time, but I, I do think there's some serious concern about the destabilization of patients who have become uh, accustomed to a particular regimen that will now see that regimen disturbed because of a, a, a regulatory change in, in, in how uh, they can or cannot receive those drugs. Also, it seems to be somewhat counter to the direction we talked about going just a few weeks ago when we expanded Kendra's law and we talked about the SAFE Act and, and all of the things we wanted to do to make sure people with uh, mental health issues had direct and immediate access to care and treatment. I want to just go to, go to one last other topic area before we wrap up, and that's uh, regarding fracking. Uh, would it be your opinion that upon the completion of the health study and the publication of the health study that there would be a, a good reason for public comment? and? Would you recommend to the commissioner that he extend the public comment time upon uh, the completion of the health study so that the public can be heard on, on, the, uh, on the content, the quality, the various other information that might be included in the health study? So first, thank you for that question. It's actually not a health study. It's very specifically not a study. It's a review of the uh, existing SGEIS document and comments that have been received to date. And, and my charge was very specific. It was about making sure that uh, anything related to public health had the adequate mitigation uh, in place and if there was adequate surveillance ongoing if a program were to continue uh, to protect the public's health. That's the very narrow charge and we've engaged three outside experts who are widely recognized as the international experts in this to help us in this review of the existing documents. 
Our goal is to complete that evidence review within the next few weeks. And certainly, all of that will be made public, uh, as will all of the uh, suggestions of the experts. So uh, our, our goal is to remain independent, leave the experts alone outside, without outside influence so that they can do their deliberation and make their recommendations, and then certainly open it up. Open it up so that you would recommend an extension of the public comment. I, I don't know about that. I would leave that to Commissioner Martens. I'll give him. So you would not recommend an extension. I'm just. I want to know. What no, your I'm just giving him be. what he needs. I'm not recommending to open up comments or not. I'm just giving him what he's asked me for. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. We've been uh, joined by Senator Montgomery, and uh, the question is now by Senator Savino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. I'm, I'm going to shift gears for a moment and move on to something that is um, certainly a huge concern to many of us, but particularly to myself and some of the representatives of the coastal communities. As you know, we were hit particularly hard by Hurricane Sandy in both Staten Island and in Brooklyn. Um, and one of the things that is a major concern to myself and I know the other representatives of that area is that all of our hospitals and our nursing homes have uh, traditionally been and will be in the current Zone A. And in fact, the new FEMA flood maps have just come out expanding that. Um, all of our health care institutions were at tremendous risk during that storm. And the decision not to evacuate some of those hospitals led to some disastrous results. Two of our hospitals are still offline, um, but they continue to be in that dangerous zone. And I don't see anything in the budget. And I understand there's going to be money from the feds, and we're going to talk about it. But I, don't see, I haven't seen anything in the budget or in your comments about how the Department of Health can help work with some of these institutions that have incurred hundreds of millions of dollars of damage as a result of that storm, and yet and still are required to provide service to these communities. Yes. Uh, you know, I'm very aware of those institutions as I worked in many of them myself, and I've been to them on mu multiple occasions. So the conversation has been ongoing since day one. Uh, I've been there back many times to understand their planning, and we've worked to restore services as quickly as possible. For example, two of those hospitals currently have emergency rooms open, even though the rest of the hospital may not be open, uh, to, uh, as they had been in the past, Coney Island and Bellevue. NYU currently has many of their inpatient services up and running, even though their emergency room is not uh, fully functioning. And the governor has, to his credit, convened the right folks uh, to, on multiple commissions to look at the whole picture of preparedness and response. So that work is ongoing, and I think they're going to come, they definitely include many recommendations for uh, the healthcare sector. Uh, and we're working with our federal partners to make sure that what we, what we learned for, from Katrina and other disasters, we make sure that we apply those lessons here in New York. The, the, the money is real. There is a lot of money. The $51 billion was just approved uh, yesterday, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, in the federal budget on top of uh, the first appropriation. So there is going to be real new dollars in this. Uh, uh, response effort, and NYU has already received a, uh, a billion dollar commitment. Bellevue has received hundreds of millions of dollars in commitment. So it's not that they haven't seen any money, they've actually received money, they're actually rebuilding, and they're rebuilding smarter. Well, that, that's a, a critical point. Are we going to provide assistance? So some of the hospitals that are, on, that are in the area were not hit as hard as others. Uh, many of them, as I said, are along the waterways, and some of our nursing homes are as well. They may not be um, on the front page because they were closed, like Coney Island Hospital was, or like Bellevue or like NYU, which took almost a billion dollars worth of damage. But they took damage nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm curious is, are you guys working together oh, yes. now to identify resources that may come from the federal government Absolutely. to go directly to them so that they can prepare? They're going to have to lift their heating and air conditioning systems. They're going to have to harden their electrical systems. They're going to have to make those changes now. Some of them may not necessarily need to be mm -hmm. repaired but they need to be moved. So the question You're is, absolutely is, right. that, is that part of the discussion? It is. It is part of the discussion. In fact, we've had many calls, and we continue to have many calls with all of these institutions to talk about how to put their FEMA applications in, how to maximize their grants, how to 
uh, how to plan appropriately. What do they need to include? As we see these plans, we share back to them. You may want to include something else here. You may want to mm -hmm. include moving your generator. You may want to. We've done that, and we continue to do that. So we have open lines of communication with all of the institutions and uh, the provider organizations, so the nursing home associations, the hospital associations, who are working with us to make sure that when we rebuild, we rebuild smarter, and we don't just rebuild what we had, um, uh, and then be suspect, you know, subject to the same kind of uh, problems mm -hmm. next year. Hopefully you'll develop a real evacuation plan as well, um, since there was so much confusion in this storm compared to the last one, where we evacuated everybody, and this time we didn't evacuate anybody. And it, it you know, it led to some really um, dangerous scenarios, particularly for the nursing homes. Uh, I'm going to, I don't know how many minutes I have, so let me shift to the next thing. I see in the budget. The usual annual, it shows up every year, elimination of spousal refusal. And every year, we put it back. So why do we continue to go down this road? This would be a tremendous hit on middle-income families who have families, you know, a family member in a nursing home. I don't think that's what we want to do to middle-income families. And certainly, we don't want to destabilize nursing homes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're trying to align with uh, the federal rules to make sure that we are in compliance and so that we don't uh, you know, lose, out, lose out from the federal perspective. Well, let's keep working on that. And finally, as you can see behind you, there are a lot of people here who are interested in hydrofracking. And I know you've answered a couple of questions, but, um, and I'll be brief. I understand that you guys did prepare some sort of an analysis, um, some sort of a study that, that you have. But what I'm curious is, where, what, what documents did you use to analyze it? What, 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 health, what health impacts have you studied? And how were you able to study them? Where did you get the data to study them from? So for example, one of our experts is an author of one of the health impact assessments done in Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, the two other ex experts from UCLA and the dean uh, at the GW uh, served on the national IOM Institute of Medicine panels uh, looking at this. So we, and they also serve on many of the ongoing studies that are going around hydrofracking around the country in places where it's already going on. So we've engaged the best experts in the country, certainly, uh, if not the world, to help us in this review. We're not doing a study. We're doing a review of all of the documents that the SGEIS proposal, all of the comments that were made, uh, and, and trying to understand what has been done, what needs to be done, how can we protect the public's health. In a few weeks, we will be ready to share all of the work products of the experts uh, and the department, in that, and, and it will be a public airing. It will be a public document available along with all the EIS documents. Can't give us a sneak preview? You know, like coming attractions? Well, the point is to be independent. You know, I, I think that that's the, you, you want it independent of, uh, of all debates and to just base it on the science, and that's why we've been very careful to remain independent. So, so and, and finally, so you expect to be ready in a few weeks and then there will be a period of public input and public comment. Will you then share with everyone um, all of the documents, all of the analysis, all the data that went into your I will share all analysis. the documents and the data that I have. I don't want to say study or review. I'm not sure exactly what it is. Report, review. I guess. Yes. OK. So, so we can trust that you will actually share that, and this public conversation will begin anew, I would assume. I will respond and give all that I have to you. <laughs> You heard that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Assemblywoman Barron. Good morning. Thank you. In your testimony, in your presentation, uh, or in response to one of the questions, did I hear you say there was about 30 percent waste in the in the um, healthcare system? Healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Could you expand on that a little? Because sure. I want to follow and lead into the situation with the Brooklyn hospitals. Sure. So unfortunately, the state of affairs in American medicine today, because of the system that we built over time, uh, a fee-for-service system, means that. The more a doctor or a hospital provides, the more they get paid. So the incentives are aligned that more care is better care, as opposed to better care is better care. And over time, uh, according to Don Berwick and other experts, 
between 25 and 45 percent, so on average about a third of all the money we spend on health care in the United States is wasted. Wasted means it's in tests that are done over and over. You go to your doctor, they don't have your blood test results, they'll order the same ones again. There's unnecessary testing. There's, um, you know, related to medical malpractice, something we call defensive medicine, you're ordering extra tests, uh, because a system doesn't actually act as a system. Our goal is to take that 30% that doesn't add value to actually improving how patients do, take that 30% that's wasted, and keep it in the system, but put it back in things that make sense, and put it back in the provider's pockets. We've been able to do that already with the Medicaid redesign team in some very real ways, in very big ways. You know, I'll give you an example. With transportation reform, do you need to take a $400 ambulance ride home from the hospital when you're fine, you're being discharged, versus will a $40 taxi voucher do? That's a lot of difference. And over time, when you multiply it across the Medicaid program, there's a lot of money to be saved while not actually hurting patients. Those are the kinds of big examples, but there are many examples. There's probably a, uh, 78 examples I could come up with right now where we've been able to save money while keeping care better or e equal for patients. In terms of the Brooklyn hospitals, um, two years ago, I believe it was, downstate took over Long Island College Hospital, <laughs> which and the situation is such that we were told at that time, Lich is pretty stable and downstate will be able to uh, manage it. Can you bring us up to date on what the situation is in that relationship between downstate and Lich, and how did it get so terribly wrong that Lich now is again uh, about to fold and that has redounded and impacted what's going on at downstate? Yeah, I would defer to the SUNY chancellor and, and SUNY to answer those, those questions. I, I read what you read in the press, and what I read is that the story we were told about Lich was not the, the, the right, uh, you know, was not an accurate portrayal of how badly Lich has been doing historically. You know, that for the last 17 years, I read yesterday that they've been losing money for 17 years, and, uh, and they've brought down other institutions. Now, I don't know what's true and what's not. I read the same things that you do. But the reality is we need a full accounting of what is actually going on. So there's no responsibility through? Oh, it's my responsibility to make sure that health care in that area is available to patients. And, and so I'm doing that to the best of my ability. So what was your involvement then? If you have that responsibility, what was your knowledge and what was your understanding of what was going on at the time that that was done? And what we were told what you were told. Say again? We were told what you were told. We were told that SUNY and Lich together will be a strong partnership and it will turn around both institutions and make them stronger. Okay. Did you do any independent analysis or inspection of what you were told? Because we're going to be talking about hydrofacking and you're going to be told certain information by people. So we want to know what is your responsibility mm -hmm. going forward so that we don't just act on information that we're given, which Absolutely. two years later creates a very difficult situation right. for us. So what we were told at the time is what you were told at the time by SUNY. We were told the same things that you were in terms of the financial viability of the institutions together. We were told about the, the the complementary services that could be, uh, you know, unified so that it creates savings. We were told that it will strengthen the mission of the medical school. We were told all of the things that, and we hoped, as did you, that this would all come out to be true and it would serve the community better. Now, what we find today is that a lot of what we were told didn't exactly match up with the facts. Okay. And so to the extent that whatever we were able to do with independent advisors, we didn't do a forensic audit of the institutions, you know, that's, that's not my job to do. On the other hand, uh, you know, I, would I, in retrospect, hindsight is twenty twenty. wish that we had done something differently and two years ago not invested the amount of money we did or, or invested it smarter? Absolutely. 
But where does that leave us today? That leaves us today with two institutions that are vital to the community in important ways. And we need to figure out how we can keep this community whole while seeing what is the roadmap for these institutions so that they become actually financially viable. I don't know what the answers to that are, but I do know that today the leadership at SUNY and others are actually asking many of the right questions that we are also asking, and they've engaged the right experts to actually do those financial audits and others to figure out where is the money going, how can we make this viable. Thank you. So what will you do going forward and with the hindsight that we have? What will you do as we get a report from the experts about the status of hydraulic fracturing so that we don't wind up in a similar situation regarding hydrofracking as we are with our hospitals? So we are working very closely with SUNY. In fact, they hired uh, one of the best people we have in our department to run <laughs> that healthcare book of business. And so we're to, very I'm sorry, to do what? I didn't hear you. You've to hired. run the healthcare uh, air arena for the SUNY system. They, they hired our uh, deputy director of our Office of Health Systems Management, who understands the, this probably better than almost everyone in the state, how to do it right, what is available from DASNY, what is available financing-wise. They've hired her away, and we're very close. I spoke with her this morning, uh, and we are trying to work together to figure out what is an actual viable solution uh, going forward. So will you do that in advance of coming up with a decision regarding hydrofracking? Will you hire someone or bring in people or allow the public to have input uh, so that we don't get into a situation that's really very detrimental? For SUNY? That, that no, no, for, for going forward. I understand what you said oh, about SUNY. Okay, for, for hydrofracking, again, I've been given a very specific charge by the governor and by the commissioner, uh, uh, Joe Martens, on what they need. And I am being very responsive, and I think that you will find that at the end of the day, this evidence-based, science-informed review will be made public, will be made uh, public as part of all of the other documents within a few weeks, and, and then, you know, of course people can comment on whatever they want to comment on. I'm very concerned about that because I'm not hearing that there will be some adjustment made so that we don't wind up in that same situation. But I want to move on. Um, there was a hearing held in New York City uh, about managed care system, and those persons who came uh, was held by the um, chair of the health committee, the assembly chair, and persons who came commented on fraud that was being perpetrated as people were being signed up uh, inappropriately for the managed care systems. And I heard you say that there is documentation online and uh, people can go online, but those persons who are in the digital, not in the digital age and don't have the access to, to uh, those resources, what is your department doing to do outreach so they will get a better understanding. It's very, very confusing to me, yes. and I'm looking at it and trying to get a better understanding. It's very convoluted. So what is the average citizen being told? How are you reaching out to them to get the information to them, when especially they don't have computers? That's a great question. So I, I think you're referring to the exchange information that was available online. We're working, one of the uh, big milestones this year that we're going to work on uh, with the exchange is engaging navigators. These are real people to help people enroll and manage and understand what options are available to them. These are people who already do that type of work for small businesses and others. So these are people who are experienced in understanding insurance products and explaining it to others. These are real people. You can go to them. They, they'll come to you. They'll, they'll talk to you in language you understand about if you have this product, this is what you can get. If you have that product, this is what you can get, and these are your co-pays, and so on and so forth. So creating that navigator program is one of the big, pro uh, big projects we have for this year in advance of setting up the exchange. How many navigators do you have? Hundreds or thousands. These are not just, uh, these are existing people who sort through the insurance products out there we are setting up a system that will take the people who are already doing this work and now 
understand the new set of products that are available and be able to explain them. So we're, teach, we're going to be engaging them and teaching them on how to explain this to everyone. So these are not new people necessarily that you're hiring, but people in the health field that you're now going to give some training to? Yes. Okay. So what outreach will be done for those persons who... Oh. I'll come back. I, I imagine Thank a lot. You. I mean, they, they make money based on how effective they are, right? So to the extent that they have a vested interest in getting to faith-based institutions and all sorts of settings to enroll the right eligible people, um, there is a clear alignment of interest to make sure that the, the, the message gets out there. Thank you. If I get an opportunity, I'll come back. Senator Montgomery. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, <clears throat> My comments are uh, um, part of my uh, opportunity to say to you how disappointed I am uh, in terms of what we've done about school-based health clinics and access to health care for so many young people in our state. Um, and as you well know, um, there's a tremendous value in providing school-based health clinics. Um, they promote healthier lifestyles, increase access to health, dental, and mental health services and care for young people, um, and, in, and improve school performance, and uh, uh, on and on. Uh, and your statistics tell us that 33% um, of the students served by school-based health clinics are African American and 44% are Hispanic or Latino young people. Um, so this is one of the best things that we do in terms of health care in our state. Uh, but up until and including this budget, um, we see nothing but uh, cuts to school-based health. Um, it is extremely frustrating and disappointing. Um, because now we're talking about the need for more mental health services for young people, uh, and uh, which I would hope we would replace that conversation uh, or that we would replace the conversation about having uh, guns in the school with having mental health access in schools. Uh, but nonetheless, what this budget proposes is that the, the school-based health clinics be uh, put into a block grant and forced to compete against uh, a number of other services, including family planning services, adolescent pregnancy prevention programs, prenatal care assistance programs, and on and on. Um, we've already lost 15, 15 school-based health clinics have closed throughout the state. So my question to you is, one, is there any real plan to, uh, per, uh, uh, to make school-based health clinic programs part of our uh, uh, health system in a very real sense um, that you will actually provide uh, a stream of funding for them, a place of importance for them uh, in our system, and will they take a priority in terms of your decisions as it relates to this block grant where they are to compete against any number of other important programs. Where will they stand? I, I know that you proposed a 10% cut across the board, but how will that in fact be uh, implemented as it relates to this important program which provides so much in terms of health uh, access to young people in our state. Well, thank you, Senator, for your interest in, in school-based health care, which I believe is one of the shining stars of the Absolutely. health care system that has not been recognized to be a meaningful part of the health care system. Uh, they're kind of the red-headed stepchild uh, until now. Uh, and no, no offense to red-headed stepchildren. But uh, the, the reality is, actually, I, I, I think that you're, you're you're, you're right in that school-based health centers have some of the best data in terms of outcomes. And if you look at what we're seeing across the state, as we get to accountable care organizations, folks like the Montefiore Medical Center have made 
major investments in school-based health yeah. because they know that they can keep asthmatic kids in school as opposed yes. to in the emergency room. Absolutely. And so folks who have the data understand the value, the real value at multiple levels of school-based health centers and are investing. In the governor's state of the state, he mentioned something he called community schools. And for the right areas, that includes school-based health as part of a community school. So there is a real commitment on the part of this administration to strengthen that because we know that it actually does work and it should be very competitive in these new competitive uh, funding uh, pools. My hope is that uh, other people get the message as well and that they try to make these investments and that this model which has worked in underserved areas, in rural areas, in, in poorer areas very well continues to expand. Um, and I, I think that the evidence from the accountable care organizations that have embraced it, from the governor's own message uh, around community schools, all points that we are going in the right direction, perhaps not quickly enough, but certainly in the right direction. Well, thank you, Commissioner. And all due respect to um, what the statements say on paper, I'm not seeing uh, in reality uh, this state um, and, and the administration, uh, I believe, has a, a, a lot of possibilities in terms of being a strong advocate for school-based health care in our state. I'm not seeing that in actuality. And certainly when I look at the budget proposal, which lumps this program as if it's just a little program, that it's not really part of the, 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 the uh, discussion around at building a new and more efficient and effective um, health system, I'm not seeing that support. So um, I hope that we can have a, uh, some indication from you, from your department, from the governor, that this truly is considered to be a significant part of our health delivery system in the state of New York for young people who are so, so often left out of this whole stream until they appear in an emergency room somewhere as a, as a burden that we do not need to have to pay for if it's done right in their schools, in, in, in a school-based health clinic. So I thank you for your, your expressions of interest, and I look forward to working with you and hearing from you, hopefully, uh, a plan that really uh, addresses <coughs> this issue seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblyman Crouch. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, just a quick question. About four years ago, I became aware of a situation. Uh, a number of health care facilities were uh, cited for what was termed as improper disposal of pharmaceuticals. And this is an issue. Uh, since then, there's been some community drop-off, uh, volunteer by pharmacies and so forth. At the time, I was told that DEC as well as DOH and they were working together to uh, basically have common rules because at, at the time, DOH rules on disposal on pharmaceuticals uh, sometimes conflicted with DEC, but also sometimes both organizations' uh, rules conflicted with uh, federal narcotics uh, rules and regula regulations on disposal and handling. Where are we at this point with trying to have a standard set of rules that our health care facilities can comply with and also uh, the public at large feels comfortable that we're properly disposing of pharmaceuticals? Because, uh, you know, even though disposal maybe only represents 10 percent of the problems with pharmaceuticals in our water supply, Human elim elimination is the greatest contributor, uh, but we need to have proper disposal techniques. We want to make sure we go down that road in the right direction and not be conflicting with DEC or DOH or federal narcotics regulations. Thank you for that question. So the question related to disposal of pharmaceuticals that are no longer needed. And the problem is actually very acute with relation to opioids. Um, in, with the passage of the I-STOP bill last year, we've been very aggressive about looking at options for diso disposal. And I'm glad to report that we've, in uh, 
coordination with uh, the state police and local sheriffs. We've distributed uh, dozens of drop boxes at police stations. Uh, in fact, just last month we got another uh, request for that. Uh, my, my hope is that that will become a standard location where folks can drop them off. A as folks know, you can go to your police station and drop off your unwanted uh, opioids and, and pharmaceuticals. That would be part of the solution. Certainly, uh, having pharmacists receive unwanted pharmaceuticals would be a, another uh, big plus if we can get that to work. And, and we're having those conversations with uh, State Education Department and others to make sure that we can we can ultimately get there. Senator Kruger. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Oh, excuse me. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Um, following up, I think um, the last question of my colleague, Senator Velman at Montgomery, she was making an impassioned plea for the value and importance of school-based health clinics. I share her passion for that issue, but. There's all these programs that are blocked together in the Department of Health budget. Each of these groups, I think there are six groups of programs categorized mm -hmm. together, um, take a 10% cut. And then the Department of Health is allowed to make the determination within these six block grants, I'll call them, of how you're going to spend the money. So the school-based health clinics are tied together with funding for emergency food, which I'm a strong advocate for the desperate need for in communities, um, funding for the New York State Supplement to WIC, perhaps the most important program for child nutrition, pregnant women and infants and children, which is capped at the federal level, always leaving New York State in need of providing additional slots, which ensure both basic nutrition and, and entry into health insurance for the poorest pregnant women. Yeah. Um, family planning is tied into it. I could go through each of the lists within the six mm -hmm. categories and make the case for why there are critically important programs in their own right that I would argue are actually underfunded. But now it will shift to you making the decision of who gets what money within the context of, I think on average it's a 10% cut to each of the six categories. How are you going to make that decision? So, so the, the, the realities of the budget are the realities. The 10 percent cut doesn't have to uh, has, have anything to do with my priority setting, saying that I don't think these are worthy programs and I want to cut them all 10 percent. That has nothing to do with it. it. It's just we need to get to a balanced budget, and these are the kinds of numbers we had to look at to reach that balanced budget. But in terms of the priority setting, you're absolutely right. These are all vital programs. But couldn't we do teenage pregnancy prevention better in the schools if they coordinated with the school nurses perhaps? Couldn't we do some of these programs that have historically been funded separately, but then at the end of the day may actually be administered by the same nonprofits better if we allow them to integrate their services in more meaningful ways? And, and this is a, a history of where we've siloed out different things and to meet the requirements of one program, sometimes at odds with another program, I've seen two different rooms where they do counseling of one group in one room and a counseling of another group in another room because the rules specify that they have to have their own room for this type of counseling versus that type of counseling. So it, historically, there's been a lot of uh, problems by siloing things out. The flexibility that we will give to programs by saying we're interested in this book of business, how can you partner with others to best deliver this, will actually, I hope, enhance these programs. Uh, my, uh, we, we're not looking at really programmatic changes in, in any significant di direction. What we're trying to do is to gain efficiencies, as we've seen happen in other areas, when we allow for respondents to be more flexible. And as follow-up, are you going to do an RFP process? How are you going to bring the stakeholders to the table to figure that out? I think we anticipate an RFP process for each of these areas. And it may be more than one RFP. Depending on the, the bucket, there may be several RFPs within a given bucket. Okay. Quite a few people have asked you about the um, fracking health report, and you've answered that answers are coming. Um, but yesterday, the Department of Health put out a statement that involved in this process will be existing and proposed environmental and public health surveillance systems to determine if they are adequate to establish baseline, baseline health indicators and detect and measure potential public health effects. 
what are public health um, surveillance systems? What do we have now and what are you planning and what's that cost in your budget? So, for example, uh, an existing public health surveillance system is something that we have in the emergency rooms across the state to look at flu. Uh, you know, if, if there's an uptick in the flu, we get a signal from the ERs across the state, and that's actually available on our website. So those are uh, areas of importance where we look at real-time data from multiple different settings across the state to see if there's changes. That's, that's a broadly defined a surveillance system. When you look at hydrofracking, there are many potential uh, health-related impacts. Will the current proposed and, uh, well, the current proposed work adequately cover all of those health impacts? That's what a, a surveillance system designed to look at the types of health impacts is what we suggest is part of the, the, the review. Does the report, uh, does the SGEIS currently adequately address it? If not, in what areas do we need to add to the surveillance work? Those are the kinds of questions that we're trying to answer. So you haven't established a new set of protocols of what kind of surveillance you would do specific to hydrofracking? The experts will make their recommendations in that regard, and that would establish what surveillance, if any, is needed. So even though you're not commenting on the review that's coming out, you are saying that within the review there will be specific recommendations for public health surveillance? There's two charges to the review. One is looking at any mitigation of, the, mm -hmm. uh, of, of public health effects, and the second is around surveillance. So both will be addressed in the review. Okay. I've been reading a series of recent reports um, and articles coming out, including out of um, the Ithaca area and Cornell, out of dot with doctors and veterinarians, documenting health problems um, to the agricultural sector in areas where hydrofracking has been taking place. And I have a great concern about um, contaminated food going into our food system. Is that part of the surveillance that the state expects to get involved in going forward? I, you know, no, as far as I understand, no decisions have been made. My review is related to just the public health aspects. That does not include food. So, well, you, I guess you answered the question because I was going to say, do you not think that from that a public health assignment for the state is ensuring um, that our food supply is not contaminated and risking people's health? Because the studies coming out show um, serious cancers and other illnesses in livestock that have um, been exposed to the contaminated water through drinking it and having it on the property. So might we agree that is a public health concern? I would argue that our experts have all of that uh, taken care of and are actually, that's why this is taking as long as it needs to take because the experts will inform us where we're missing anything, if anything, in the literature. I, I'm not, I was not uh, a hydrofracking expert when this started and I don't claim to be today, but I have learned a lot, and I understand that there's a lot of evidence, but there's also places where we don't have as much evidence as we need. And so our, our goal is to engage the experts to help guide us on what is the state of the science, where are there holes, if any, and, and what, what are the next steps. Okay, maybe I'll be quicker. Forget hydrofracking for a second. I carry a bill called the No Downed Animal Bill, which no downed animal, which, was, which if it passed, would mean that if animals were too sick to walk to the um, slaughterhouse on their own, they should not go into our food system because I see it as a public health issue. If you're so sick you can't even walk into the slaughterhouse, I probably shouldn't be eating this. And I've, surprisingly or happily, even though we don't have the law in New York State, most of the fast food companies have that policy for themselves because they recognize the public health risk of contaminated food supply. So right. could we agree that actually contaminated food supply is a public health issue? Oh, absolutely it's a public health issue. Okay. And, I, and I work with the USDA and the FDA to make sure that we adhere to the best evidence and science in, uh, in regulation. We, we are very concerned about making sure the public is safe. I, there's no question in my mind that that's part of the public health. Okay. My one minute left, I'm shifting. Um, I believe Senator Savino brought up a number of the issues around Sandy and hospitals. 
Um, another issue we're seeing in areas badly hit by Sandy is an explosion of mold and the concern about toxic mold and the toxicity of certain kinds of mold for um, granted for particular people. Some people have allergies. Some people are at risk um, in their immune system. Some kinds of mold seem to trigger certain health responses. Um, back in 2006, the legislature passed a bill requiring a toxic mold task force in the Department of Health. In 2010, um, the report was finalized by the Department of Health Toxic Mold Task Force, and I know that was before you were here. But none of the recommendations, as far as I was just reviewing it again today, ever really followed up on as far as recommending legislation or regulations because, in fact, one of the huge problems in dealing with the mold is we don't have any state definitions of what types of mold are toxic. Therefore, it's not something you can get insurance coverage for or remediation from FEMA for. And until so I see the clock, he's zero. telling me I have to stop. Um, but I'm urging Department of Health, because I don't believe you do have any of that, to as immediately as possible confront the situation, because I think all of my colleagues from Sandy areas will tell you mold is the secret exploding crisis. Post. We, we, you, you know, you're right. We've been working since day one when Sandy hit. We had our internal uh, experts on mold make sure that uh, our website was updated, that we were working with the city health department to broadly distribute the materials on how to prevent mold in the first place, what to do if you find mold, uh, when, when to seek help, when to seek professional help, both for removing the mold and for uh, health effects. So it is a, a very important area of, uh, of work that we are actively engaged in. Again, we need regulations and perhaps we need law because right now there's no legal definition, so you can tell people what to try to do, mm -hmm. but there's no mechanism to implement or get insurance or funding for it. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblyman, Assemblywoman Glick. You can just pass a law against mold. Yeah, we can't do that. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Chair. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, first, we had an expansion of the uh, ability for pharmacies to vaccinate. Uh, not all, as far as my staff can tell, follow the full protocol. Do you do, uh, it's a two-part question, do you do any um, checking on whether or not they are fully following um, any of those protocols? And two, um, they are not covered by many health plans. Uh, you have to go to a doctor's office. The whole point was to to expand the access to uh, vaccinations uh, for flu, pneumonia, and now for shingles. Uh, and if they are not paid for by insurance, that's a problem. So in your health exchanges, is this something that you are going to be addressing? So in relation to the unprecedented flu uh, season we had, Governor Cuomo expanded temporarily the uh, ability of pharmacists to administer flu vaccine to children. They usually uh, administer to adults, but not to those under 18. And uh, we've been tracking the data very carefully, and we've seen actually thousands and thousands of kids have received flu shots in pharmacies because we have an immunization registry. And Rite Aid was one of the best uh, providers across the state in making sure that most of their locations were able to provide flu shots to children. All pharmacists, as part of their training, do receive training on how to administer flu shots to children and other shots to children. Now, they may not feel comfortable doing it, but they did receive training to do it, and they are uh, officially licensed and able to do that. Um, this was done in uh, a time of emergency. You know, this, this expansion of the scope of practice of pharmacists was done because of the flu epidemic. We're, we are now starting to engage with the pharmacists and with pediatricians and others about what is the best scope of practice for pharmacists and others. Because what we want to do is make sure these kids have medical homes that they go back to, that they're integrated. That care given in a different location is integrated in the rest of their care. Um, I, I appreciate that. I understand uh, completely um, that they were authorized uh, 
relatively recently for adults and that the uh, governor had an executive order. The question is, as you go forward with uh, health exchanges, mm -hmm. since I believe that's within your purview, uh, and there is this gap where if I go to my doctor, some, maybe some health plans cover it, some don't, um, it would seem that they are linked. Uh, access is a two-pronged thing, availability and ability Payment. to pay. So um, I'm wondering if the department in going through uh, their health exchanges are going to be at least looking at this as a, um, as a factor in ensuring that the broad, broadest number of people can access it since yes. I can go to my doctor and have it covered, but I can't go to a pharmacy and have it covered. Yes, I think that, that conversation has to happen, but it has to happen in that broader context of scope of practice, which has to, uh, you know, we want to expand sp sco scope of practice where it makes sense and with everyone's participation. So that's, they're not, they have to be linked, unfortunately. But absolutely, I'm in, in, very excited to see the uh, advances in public health and prevention that are real opportunities with the exchange. Uh, let me um, move to another, uh, one of your Article 7 uh, changes. Uh, it would allow dental hygienists uh, to uh, operate under a collaborative agreement uh, with a dentist and be able to uh, operate not under direct supervision, as is the current practice, uh, in um, dental clinics uh, or, and would allow them to sign uh, a dental health certificate for school. Um, since they are not, uh, their scope of practice does not include diagnosis, do you think it's appropriate for them to be signing a dental health certificate for the purposes of uh, entering school? Yeah, so the vast majority of uh, the, the th this is again a scope of practice question. And, and what we've seen is that time and again um, we have not optimized use of ancillary providers. Our goal is to get folks practicing at the top of their license, to the top of your training, not spending time. You don't want a doctor doing paperwork. You don't want a doctor doing things that don't add value to the experience when there's another uh, person in the office who can do that. And, and, and that has been a model where in other states we've seen the ability of other providers to work more than they have in New York and, and still achieve the outcomes we want. This is an example where we believe that the scope of practice currently does not achieve the optimum outcomes. We don't have enough dentists in parts of the state to actually meet the needs. We don't have enough of uh, primary care providers. And so to the extent that we can think broadly of what is spoke, s scope of practice while still maintaining quality and guaranteeing that people get the right care they need the right place, at the right time, at the right cost. This is one good example of expansion of scope of practice. Uh, I have two uh, other questions. Um, the first one relates to what you talked about. The state's lab facilities are, um, I think you said, fair to poor, uh, and that you're going to uh, go forward with um, partnerships, for lack of a better word, with universities and perhaps private labs. And I'm wondering uh, what you envision uh, that would be in terms of testing. What kinds of tests would um, you think should be controlled purely by state? Uh, and in what instances, if any, you think um, it's uh, appropriate to simply deal with uh, a private or university lab? I don't see that scope changing much. I, it's not uh, about giving up functions that we used to do to other private parties. It's more about partnering because we have invested in equipment because of our designation uh, in our labs to allow lab tests to grow. It's about unlocking the potential of biotechnology in New York State. When we can work with SUNY Albany or, or others in the area, R uh, RPI and others, to really uh, partner around discovery and translation into real tests that can be used every day. That's the opportunity. It's not about saying we don't want to do newborn screening anymore in the state. We absolutely want to keep these functions in the state, but we want to make sure that the, the assets that currently have been invested in, in the state are also available to other researchers so that we can maximize their use. Um, you referenced uh, more than once in your testimony uh, the destruction around Sandy, and I represent part of Lower Manhattan, and so I, and, and I think 
because we still have buildings standing, it's not as obvious how destructive it was. Uh, but there have been a number of state, upstate uh, floods that have been devastating. Uh, New York City does not, uh, has, does not allow or will not allow uh, the areas around their reservoirs and the buffer lands to be used for hydrofracking, and DEC has concurred. Uh, and I'm wondering how uh, the, you envision the ability of the state to monitor floodwaters uh, that might migrate from, uh, say, Prattsville uh, down into the reservoirs that affect New York City's water? That's a good question. Uh, I haven't given much thought to that, to be honest. But I mean, you know, as part of the plans, as part of the preparedness plans, as part of our review of the new updated maps that have just been released of, of what is flood zones. Uh, th that is a book of business that our uh, preparedness folks engage in, and we will come up with updated recommendations. This also impacts our uh, discussions with the federal government on what is the water supply, how do we best protect the water supply of New York City. So th these are parts of the purview of the Department of Health. Well, I, I would just uh, suggest to you that uh, after the um, storms, uh, both Lee and Irene, uh, the Hudson, which uh, passes by my district uh, in Lower Manhattan, was essentially chocolate brown, uh, evidence that uh, a lot of the Catskills had washed down to, uh, to Lower Manhattan. And between uh, the Catskills and Lower Manhattan are the New York City reservoirs, so I'm, I'm somewhat concerned uh, not that I think that the water for New York City should be uh, of a higher and better, safer quality than the water that people uh, upstate uh, should have. Um, obviously, uh, my friends and neighbors uh, are concerned there, too. But there is this other issue that uh, DEC has said. We're not going to allow the New York City watershed to be uh, damaged, and yet I'm not quite certain how you're going to surveil that. Yeah, we'll work with DEC to make sure that uh, the highest standards are maintained. Uh, the information has changed based on the last year's experience, and, and that is being integrated into our thinking. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doctor. I think it's my turn, but uh, Senator Kathy Young has also joined us. Um, just a couple of questions. You mentioned obesity in passing. Um, there was a report or a speech given by uh, Comptroller DiNapoli that it costs us, obesity costs us $12 billion a year, and it soon may overtake tobacco consumption as America's leading preventable cause of death. Uh, is that close to being accurate? Well, so the $12 billion is uh, including a lot of other costs that... Uh, you can say knee replacements absolutely related to obesity, but then what percentage of heart attacks do you attribute to obesity? Okay, but it's more a to, real. It's a real. But more to the point, is yeah. it is it uh, soon going to overtake tobacco consumption as America's leading preventable? I believe it is. Okay, so what generally, just to give you an opportunity to say what the state is doing in that regard, other than the city of New York taxing sugar drinks. We're, we're working on many parts of the health department to combat ob obesity, and it, it is actually also a minority issue where we're focusing our efforts uh, around the highest risk neighborhoods uh, and, and programs. So there are programs for diabetes prevention, which include greater activity in uh, YMCAs, partnering with YMCAs. We're funding them. We're working uh, across uh, schools. Let me just stop you as you go along. What pot of money is there if I have a YMCA that wants to participate in one of your programs? Sure. So there are about uh, seven or eight different pots of money in the Department of Health, specifically in public health, related to obesity. There's also a new pot of money uh, that is in the waiver uh, that is in front of the federal government that looks at preventing pre-diabetes, which is related directly to obesity. Uh, the investments are on the scale of between, uh, I want to say, up to $100 million if you look at everything together. Certainly, should we have more? Absolutely. Uh, but and, it's... Uh, and can you identify those for yes. me by sending them, sending me a list? We'll or, send you the list. Okay. You started by saying, I interrupted you, YMCAs. 
What other type programs? In schools, we know that um, access to high quality food, uh, when you have a banana and apple on a rotating uh, high lit uh, vending machine in, in front and you put the, the bad snacks in the back, kids will actually choose bananas and apples. And there have been studies done to show that access to high quality food allows folks to make better decisions. So we've been working with the schools and with uh, the uh, healthy hunger, uh, it's a HNAP program, I, I'm forgetting the, uh, the specifics, uh, to increase funding for schools to provide healthy options. Uh, this is a, a model throughout the state and it's working. And we're working with SED, the state education department, to highlight those schools that have been able to successfully bend the curve. You know, it took us many years to get into these bad behaviors. We can't change these behaviors overnight. Our goal is to continue to push from a young age folks in the right direction in making the right choices. The WIC program is a, is a very good example where we've actually seen weight go down, the obesity epidemic go down among WIC recipients because of the types of food choices that we make available as part of the monthly WIC package. It's a multifaceted problem with multifaceted approach to it. Uh, I think we have about uh, 30 pages of uh, detailed, single-spaced work group items on obesity, which I'd be happy to share with you. Thank you. And uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, if you're talking about low-income individuals being most vulnerable, uh, have we yet applied for a waiver of the from the federal government to only allow food stamps to be used only for nutritious foods? So this is a, a highly contentious issue, and you know, New York City did try to apply for that and were rejected in their attempt a few years ago. Since that time, I've spoken with Ken Kincannon of the uh, USDA uh, about this issue, and he suggested that there might be a possibility to do this on a pilot basis, where we also offer uh, not just take away, but also offer good things in, in, instead whether it's access to farmers markets, vouchers for uh, you know, healthy, nutritious things. So that revi revised document is currently working its way through uh, a revision of the SNAP program, is working its way through our agency in terms of how can we best position this for success. Yeah, I just, uh, I think I, the first year you came before us, I asked these same questions. And mm -hmm. uh, what's the downside of applying for a waiver? What's, uh, I understand it's contentious. But if it's soon going to be approaching tobacco that we have advertisements for and against and so forth, what's the downside of the state of New York and the power of this whole state applying to the federal government saying this is the right thing to do? We want you to look at it again. There's no downside, but we want to succeed. And so what we're trying to do is to optimally have those conversations so that when we apply, we'll actually get it. And I think we're getting close in discussions with the OTDA and the city of New York on a waiver that actually adds value to all recipients and not just um, stigmatizes or takes away uh, from that the, the program. And this is your third year here, right? Yes. Will it take another three years before the actual application goes through? Because uh, we've <laughs> talked about this ad nauseum. Uh, it, it's not my application. If it was, I probably would have sent it in. But okay. uh, to the extent that I, I'm happy to encourage others to do it faster. I okay. Will. Well, whenever, whenever you get to the point where you need someone to be a pain in the neck, please let me know who and when and Thank the you. phone numbers. Because I think this is important. Um, that's uh, number one. I've had carried a bill since Governor Pataki, I think, to have a governor's commission on physical fitness, like, the, like when... Uh, the federal government had it years ago, and there was all more ads on the TV. There's more. It was a. There was it, like the tobacco cessation type ads that we have now. Uh, I think before you said you supported something like that. Uh, we're going to try. I'm going to try again this year. It just seems to me the more public knowledge and the more encouragement, uh, the better we're going to have. And I would hope you would support that. Uh, uh, that that. Uh, bill or something that's modified from the bill that I had, okay? I'm not asking Thank for you. a commitment now. Uh, the um, other area, there, there's an issue concerning excess medical uh, uh, malpractice insurance. And uh, do you know, and you may not know this because uh, it's sort of a 
technical question, but it's obviously going to be uh, geared towards, at least that's what the report says, I think it's going to be geared towards uh, high-risk professions. Is that correct? Yes. So that's, there's going to, someone, if it's going to be geared toward one type of profession, are there any other types of physicians than, say, neurologists or the high-risk pro professions that will um, not be uh, able to get the excess insurance? You know, we're, we're waiting for the DFS, uh, Department of Financial Services, actuarial review of that uh, uh, business because what we're looking to do is when the law was originally passed, the intent was to help those high-risk uh, providers in communities that don't necessarily have coverage uh, to, to uh, obtain coverage and maintain coverage. Today, the program has grown exponentially to cover folks who are probably actually employed by hospitals, and hospitals should be covering them. To the extent that it's no longer meeting its original purpose, our goal is to get back to that goal and at the same time, we've created a new medical indemnity fund for uh, high-risk OB. We are continuing to improve quality and safety across the board. So that's, um, again, something where we're trying to right-size the program while increasing options through every available tool. Okay. I, th I think you might want to check that out because when it was originally imp uh, implemented, it was for everybody. It wasn't just for high risk. It was for to maintain lower rates for uh, physicians. Uh, but I think it applied across the board. And, and there's one other thing, and that is with respect to this, and I'm getting down to the own limits that we imposed. Uh, with respect to that, is there a provision in the governor's plan to require physicians to take Medicaid patients to get the excess insurance? I am not aware of that. All right, well, I'll, ch I'll check it out and ask a more intelligent question the next time. Thank you. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Chairman uh, Farrell. Uh, Commissioner, I, 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 uh, I need to ask you a question about an issue that sort of operates under the radar. Uh, it's called sickle cell anemia. I know you, I'm sure you're familiar with the the disease, genetic disease, but it's, it's, it's highly unnoticed. And I have experience in my community with people who have the disease and people who are struggling to help them. And I want to put it on your radar screen publicly because it goes unnoticed. It's the struggle that people should not have to endure. It's a painful issue. I learned about it when I was a PTA lady many, many years ago, because we had one person who we had to take care of, and we did just as her family would. The second one is traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injury in New York State is an out-of-state issue. People who are suffering from traumatic brain injury right now, to my knowledge, we send most of them to other states, which is very detrimental to their well-being because very often their families can't get to them as much as they could and should. It's being managed by the Department of Health, them getting there. But uh, I want to see traumatic brain injury address addressed in New York State as we do most issues that confront many people in New York State. You know, I know you must know all the reasons why people have traumatic brain injury, and they're not all at the same degree of injury. And so they require different treatments and they can be treated in different settings. And, but it's not being addressed in, in the state. Can you give me your response to that? Sure. So we do actually have a TBI waiver that's been very uh, well received by the community and by providers. Both Commissioner Courtney Burke and I have visited uh, provider organizations uh, that provide services for TBI in Long Island. I, I go to their annual conference. I, I think that there's much more to be done. There's always more to be done for patients with TBI, but we're actually doing better than most states, and uh, we have a trajectory of continued improvement. And for sickle cell, again, this is an example of an issue which should be much higher on the radar. It's a disparities issue. Uh, it's uh, an issue that I know very well from my time at Health and Hospitals Corporation, 
where I treated many of these patients. And HHC is an example of a, a group who has a center of excellence for sickle cell, and we are looking uh, at ways to continue to support these centers of excellence, uh, HHC and others, mostly downstate, uh, who use evidence-based protocols to treat patients and keep them out of the hospital. Uh, there's some new pharmaceuticals that hold much great uh, promise for sickle cell. Uh, it has been under the radar for many, but certainly not for me, and certainly not for the health department. Uh, one of our Medicaid redesign work groups has looked at it as well, uh, because it is such a, a, a big issue and it's a disparities issue. It's cross-cutting of many of our priorities. So thank you for, for highlighting that issue, and I agree that it is one where we can continue to make progress. Well, I, I would really like to know uh, exactly who closest to you that uh, you could tell me that I can reach out to, because my, I know that HHC is involved with it at this point, because the organization in my community is, is attached to them. But it, it's all a matter of how much attention and how much money and resources are available for them to to uh, properly Absolutely. address this issue. You know, that, that's exactly right. And some of the tools we now have today, looking at the Medicaid data and understanding how much money is being spent on patients with sickle cell, allow us greater flexibility to make the investments to keep them well. And that's been a conversation we've had internally in our department, but also with Larray Brown and others at HHC on how to optimize the care of these patients in their communities as opposed to in the hospitals, which is where they end up. Well, well are we, could we plan I'd be to happy to speak with you after this uh, offline. Okay, thank you. Could we plan to bring some of our traumatic brain injury patients back into our state? Uh, we have continued, yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Senator Kathy Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi, Dr. Shah, it's great to see you. I, I had a few questions, um, and the first has to do with the Doctors Across New York program. As you know, that's been a very successful program, especially in rural areas, and I noticed in the budget proposal that it's actually folded into a block grant program rather than being lined out as something that is a priority. And so I guess I'd like to ask, what is your proposal and your intention regarding the Doctors Across New York program? So again, the whole block grant, the, the six buckets that we put things in, is not any indication of our deprioritizing these programs. It's really about efficiency. It's really about trying to make it easier for us and for providers. Doctors Across New York remains one of our most successful efforts in improving primary care access in rural regions and underserved regions across the state. Uh, there is a strong commitment to the program. Uh, the, the, the funding cuts are just what they are. They, they have to happen uh, because the, we need to balance our budget. It's no indication of uh, deprioritizing that program. Okay. Well, you know, I just want to point that out because um, it has been successful. And as you also know, we're still faced with a very severe physician shortage in New York State. So I just... Um, and concern that if it's folded in with other things, competing for black grant funding, that it could be watered down to the point where it's not effective. So I just wanted to raise that concern with you. Um, also, um, I wanted to raise the issue of critical access hospitals. As you know, the legislature, both houses, felt it was very important over the past two years to pass for two years in a row legislation that would uh, give increased funding to critical access hospitals. Unfortunately, we weren't fully successful with the governor on that initiative. And um, so I was wondering, do you intend to fund critical access hospitals with the portion of the VAP funding, which is the vital access providers funding that's included in the budget? My, my understanding is that there's a portion of that money that came from the nursing home side, and that going to remain with the nursing home uh, industry, you know, or reinvested in the nursing home industry. But certainly, we are working to expand uh, not just the money, but, but uh, opportunities for critical access hospitals to partner with others to, so that they're not standing alone. I probably spend a day of my week working on um, hosp critical access hospitals and other hospitals that are very precarious. There's a lot of, uh, one of the 
uh, community hospitals that aren't these tiny hospitals, but community hospitals are very shaky in many parts of the state. And we don't want to lose these services. Um, my department has traveled up uh, and down across the state to try to work directly with these hospitals. Part of the problem is that we hear about things too late, after the point of no return uh, for, for the finances. And, and they don't have the expertise necessarily or aren't asking for help early enough to do something about it. I think we've been very clear that the way forward is by partnerships, that the future means not standing alone. And that has been an important message that is starting to get out, and our hope is that with the right targeted, smart, real dollar investments in the right areas for the right service mix, they will continue to have 24-7 coverage in a given community uh, because what, what, what's happening is hospitals are shutting down and then nothing's left behind. That's absolutely what we don't want. But if they can find some way to have a 24-hour urgent center or some other mix of services that keeps access there so they don't have to drive two hours, that's our goal in the very short term, uh, and uh, it is high on our agenda. Right, and, you know, and access to health care is you know, is um, a vital issue in rural areas. And so with the critical access hospitals, our proposal over the past two years has been a very modest increase of funding, but just to make sure that they can continue to provide the services. So I just wanted to point that out because I understand your points, but um, as you know, in rural areas, we really need the help. No, I, I, my, my recollection is that between 84 and $250,000 per hospital is being uh, allocated in the budget for critical access hospitals. Okay. I may be wrong on that. But. Well, thank you. I wanted to switch over now uh, to um, certified home health agencies and long-term um, home health care programs. And I know they're in the process of being integrated into managed long-term care. And um, my question is, what is being done to ensure that we have adequate facilities and delivery of care to rural counties that may not have the exact same representation or the integration of facilities um, that provide managed long-term care, because that, that's a major issue, as you know. You're, you're absolutely right. And I've been to parts of the North Country and other places where I've seen the encroachment of a, a private or, or another group into an area trying to uh, siphon off the, the high-value patients and leaving these vast rural areas uncovered. And so that's why we've been very deliberate in our moving forward of, of granting these licenses and, and understanding the, the side effects and effects. One of the important things that we've done this year is uh, advance regional planning. That way these conversations cannot happen in isolation, but they must happen with all the stakeholders, all the players in healthcare in a given region. And, and my hope is that we've seen successful regional planning in the past. It will look very different from one part of the state to the other, but that at least having that table where everyone must get together and discuss what are the needs of the community can allow us to keep those vital services there. Okay. Thank you. And finally, I wanted to raise telehealth. As you know, the Commission on Rural Resources has been a um, very strong advocate for telehealth services because the impact on rural areas and uh, I guess I think you would agree that it can increase the quality of care for people and also keep them out of more expensive settings. Um, so the question is, do you foresee um, integrating telehealth into the managed long-term care system? So telehealth is one of the areas which can solve many of our problems at once. I was meeting with a group from Rochester two days ago in my office that provides telehealth. And they estimated that 85% of their pediatric visits could have been managed effectively by telehealth. That's uh, incredible. I mean, think of the hours you don't have to travel for your, with your kid if you, can, if you can do that. My goal is to figure out how we can pay for it. Because once you align the incentives, once you actually find a payment stream that's sustainable for telehealth, uh, then we, we'll see it flourish because it, it's the right thing to do. It's lower cost. It works. Uh, and, and that's what we're focusing our energies on right now. I'm glad, Commissioner, that you, know, you said that. And I think one of the trends that we're seeing now is people are getting enrolled into managed long-term care, 
they're being disenrolled from telehealth, which I don't think is necessarily the trend that you would like to see. So I just want to raise it with you because I have strong concerns about it. It can provide great quality of care, as you point out, can save taxpayer dollars and, and really have people in appropriate settings. And, and I know that's what you want. That's what we want, I think, as a legislature. So I just want to point that out to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Assemblyman Levine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Shah, um, going back now nearly half a century to the time when, before your time, uh, to the days when New York State adopted the Medicaid program, New York was one of the only states that required the individual counties, along with the city of New York, to share in the expense of Medicaid. In last year's budget, uh, we uh, began a, a phase-in uh, that will provide for the state to take that enterprise over entirely, which is a good thing from, obviously, the point of view of cost control and containment and efficiency uh, as well. Um, so uh, let me ask you, how, how are we doing in terms of uh, implementing that takeover? So this is a very important uh, book of business that we are taking on, trying to consolidate the functions that have traditionally been spread out in meaningful ways centrally. So that includes not just taking, uh, you know, over some of the financial costs that counties have incurred, but also taking on some of the functions that they have incurred. We've done a very good job in the last year of doing that. Uh, it is one of the high priority areas where, uh, with uh, 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 hiring, we have actually been able to hire people much easier. There, there's variable degrees of how hard it is to hire someone. In this area, it's very easy for us to hire people because everyone understands the priority of getting these functions consolidated centrally, uh, as well as to allow counties uh, the, the administrative relief that they deserve. Um, we have a long way to go. Uh, the governor has made uh, promises he's delivered on. He's actually expanded the amount of relief he's provided to counties even in the last six months. Uh, and my hope is that as we see the finances of New York State improve, we continue to make progress on that, uh, uh, that promise of trying to relieve counties of this duty. So we're doing what we need to do. We're right on schedule in terms of consolidating the functions uh, and administrative simplification. Uh, there's still more work to be done, which we can do uh, hopefully in the next few years. Very good. And uh, finally, uh, along with uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, Assembly Members uh, Sweeney and Gottfried, I await uh, your response to our letter uh, dealing with uh, your experts' uh, study or review on the subject of uh, high volume uh, hydraulic hydrofracturing. Thank you. Sure. Oh. The last questioner for the Senate is Senator Hannon. Um, comments have brought up a whole range of different topics, so we can think of this as the lightning round. And I think that the, the, one of the core th themes has come up is questions in regard to data. And I know that's one of your expertise in the past and when you got confirmed. Um, I know what I'm going to ask about is not all of your doing, it's, it's decades of what the, the department has or has not done. But let me start with an elemental one. There's no annual report of the Department of Health. There are lots of annual reports, but not one annual report. If one wanted to see an organization chart, I don't know where it is. Of course, you have a website that is so, so overwhelming that there could be something in there. But I did Google annual report, New York State Department of Health, and it came up for the 1910 annual report. And I just did. Other data that would be really required would be just upon the, the hospital conditions. Now, each hospital is supposed to be for following, uh, filing annually a, a Form 710 or 770 report. I'm not sure anybody reads it. I'm not so sure we have digitized it. I'm not so sure we have codified it. Um, but we should know that. We should know, and you have mentioned, and I know you're working at hospitals not just in Brooklyn, 
but the troubled hospitals throughout the state. But we should know the percentage of occupancy that that hospital has. And maybe that's an old dated statistic because many hospitals are moving from inpatient to ambulatory. So maybe that's not the baseball statistic we need to know the one thing. But we need to know those statistics. And you rightfully point out that when some things were done in the past, they didn't have all those numbers. But we've had Peninsula Hospital. We've had Wyckoff Heights. We've had Litch. Um, there are others. There's we, bankruptcy. We have interfaith in bankruptcy. We could go on and on, and I don't want to name others that I know about because that may not be public. But that needs to be somehow much more transparent so people are put on notice as to what's happening. Um, so that's the data. But there's other data that I, that I think about is what's needed. The prescriber prevails. We talk about that. I don't know how many uh, prescriber prevail incidents have taken place. It has actually been law for a couple of months now. Maybe that's, that's useful. And we do have some improved reporting uh, information. We don't know the spousal refusal. Now, this has been a, a ping pong match between the executive and the legislature for years. The legislature believes that if you put your proposal in for spousal refusal, it'll cost the system more money than save. And yet you have, and I don't have statistics on that. So those are the types of things where I'd really like to know. Um, it's the hospital data I think begins and ends. Uh, a couple of other things, I'll just go through. These are, as I wrote them down. You talk about rebuilding. Are we gonna make rebuilding and rebuilding according to the recommendations of the department conditions of continuing CON or not? Um, I have heard good suggestions coming out of the department, but I have not heard, no, we're going to withhold approval, we're going to make it conditional, we're going to, before you go forward. Certainly there's been an enormous amount of work that you've done, coordination with FEMA, et cetera. But now that we're looking forward, where are the, where are the standards we're going to have? I think we should really memorialize those. Um, another data thing is the global cap. Now, we've patted ourselves in the back. It has brought discipline, but I think we need to go back and take a retrospective as to what the global cap has really done. What have we added into the global cap? Now, we do that this year by adding some things in so the cap goes up and we don't break the cap. We did that last year. The second part of it is it's one thing to meet the global cap. The second thing is where is the money going? because we have added several hundred millions there. Who's getting it? Why are they getting it? Yes, enrollment has gone way up. Is that accounting for all of it or not? Um, a little more, I think we have to refine and nuance the reporting in regard to that. Um, transition to manage long-term care. For some of the patient populations, there are assessment data, although, by the way, the assessment tool I haven't heard that was coming two years ago, I haven't heard that's finalized. Not that it's easy, but I haven't heard that it's finalized. It's just like the fiscal agent. It's not there yet. Um, but when we go from home health care to managed long-term care, I'm not so sure that existing home care patients have an assessment tool, and therefore I'm not so sure we're going to be able to measure how well the patient is being taken care of when they move to managed long-term care. I just, in all of the people describing it, I think we need to know. Now, in some place there's a, a requirement for a managed long-term care ombudsman, but yes. that's really dealing with problem. That's not a norm for the standard of care. Um, we have another group, but we have a disproportionate share payment system in the state. Feds are taking money away. They already took $100 million at least away. They took a away a lot more in the fiscal cliff legislation. But I was looking at what was our history, and I find out a very prestigious group of hospitals um, were supposed to get money by statute, not even a commissioner's pool that I was complaining about before, but by statute and division of budget has curtailed them by $12 million over the last couple of years. So I think we're going to have to look into that as we go through, the, um, as we go through all of the uh, discussions. The consolidation, Senator Kruger mentioned the consolidation of the different program agencies. You have six different groupings. You have a task 
you've described it well of trying to make it much more goal-oriented and having people doing sim similar things under the same program. But the department can't possibly do that in a year. I think you have to be on notice. I think we're going to have to go through each one of those lines, get an explanation. Some of them are very valuable. All of them, while you cut them 10 percent this year in a group, all of them, as we went through the fiscal crisis to now, have had their, uh, their appropriations cut by 50 percent. So we have had a lot of belt tightening. And I think if this extraordinary type of uh, proposal is going to go forward, it needs a lot more explanation. And my guess is it just can't possibly work for whatever it is, Senator Montgomery's points, Senator DeFrancisco point, um, it just can't work uh, in this whole cycle. And lastly, but not least, the one thing that you, that's going, that's up in the North Country, is the medical home. Um, with all the good things that are happening, you talked about better care for less money and, and the pay providers getting more. We probably ought to think about more medical homes in this state. Yes. At least one more. And I know it's not easy to do. It takes an intensive amount of work, but that would be my suggestion. That was just eight minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just one question about the uh, DISH, the indigent care. How is that formula determined for reimbursing hospitals? And is there a difference between the reimbursement rate for different hospitals and why? Okay, I'm going to ask Jason to come up for this, if that's all right. Mr. Helgerson? <laughs> I want you to get the full answer. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, uh, um, Assemblywoman, the indigent care reform package that uh, the governor included in his budget uh, was developed uh, by a uh, multi-disciplinary uh, group of both providers as well as uh, advocates uh, coming up with and trying to deal with a very complex issue, which is the current way in which indigent care funds are distributed uh, in New York State, uh, roughly about a billion dollars worth of total funds which go into the health care delivery system, are really at risk based on the current methodology. Um, at risk in the sense that uh, under current federal law, part of the Affordable Care Act, um, those funds, DISH funds overall, um, are going to need to be reduced nationwide. And the way our indigent care funds are distributed put those funds in particular at high risk uh, being some of the first DISH funds to be cut, um, which would put um, our, many of our hospitals, many of our safety net hospitals at significant risk, financial risk moving forward. And so to address uh, that issue, to come up with a new distribution system that was more in line with what the federal government was looking for, we put together this group. The challenge is within a fixed pool of money, when you adopt a new methodology for distribution, you inherently redistribute those funds. Uh, which creates challenges for existing institutions who potentially will see less money. So what we attempted to do was to put together a, a compromise package that achieved the intent we needed to achieve in terms of making sure that those funds were going to be distributed in a way that was consistent with uh, federal requirements, uh, but do it in a way that did not uh, majorly disrupt any individual particular institution. Um, the package is, by its nature, a compromise um, amongst the uh, various interests, but we think it does achieve its overall objective of, of making those funds more secure uh, moving forward. Uh, it will redistribute monies uh, in certain institutions, in particular the Health and Hospital Corp of New York City, uh, will over time see increased funding through the engine care uh, program. Uh, so we think at the end of the day it's, it's uh, a good, Im important initiative uh, for the state. The last thing I'll say about engine care is that as part of that work group, it wasn't just about redistributing dollars. It was also about uh, making sure that individuals who are uninsured are not uh, unduly burdened by hospital bills. Uh, and there is state law that unfortunately has not been uh, as uh, um, known about out into the public or maybe as aggressively um, uh, uh, implemented uh, by the uh, Department of Health as it maybe should have been in the past. But there was talk about how we could uh, strengthen the law so that individuals who uh, were uninsured that, that ended up with hospital, uh, hospitalizations did not face um, you know, huge bills that drove them into bankruptcy. And so there are also some important patient protections that are in the governor's proposal as well. Thank you. I'd like to talk to you afterwards. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate your testimony. And we're now on to our, uh, let's see, our, our 1030 uh, uh, speaker, James Cox, the Medicaid Inspector General. Okay, as we leave, can you please keep it down as best you can? We've got to keep it moving. Uh, Mr. Cox? Shh. You're on. Chairman DeFrancisco, Chairman Farrell, and distinguished members of the Senate Finance and Assembly Ways and Means Committee, Senator Hannon, and Assemblyman Gottfried, I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss the proposed 2013 14 executive budget as it relates to the Office of Medicaid Inspector General. My name is James Cox and I am the Medicaid Inspector General. Under Governor Cuomo's leadership, New York has introduced major reforms to its Medicaid program. A significant amount of OMIG's current efforts involve the review of the Medicaid program changes to ensure that we continue to protect and enhance the overall program integrity. Consistent with its mission, OMIG focuses resources on identifying those providers who are committing fraud and taking bad actors out of our health care delivery system. This includes creative new approaches like multidisciplinary business line teams, as well as continuing our work with law enforcement at the federal, state, and local levels. We are also implementing improvements to our audit processes, starting with the basic premise that providers have the right to understand the rules by which they will be audited. That's why OMIG works every day to ensure its audit process is open and providers are well informed. We have worked with other state agencies to strengthen our understanding of the regulations and the application to the Medicaid program. Our staff receives specialized training and expertise in their respective areas and have increased our commitment to compliance and education programs that have proven so successful. All these efforts help prevent overpayments in the Medicaid program before they happen. And the numbers over the past two years illustrate the success of this approach. Last year, OMIG saved taxpayers over $2.5 billion, an increase of about 34% over the prior year. Some of the ways we achieved this included preventing $1.1 billion in payments that are unnecessary because the providers inappropriately billed the state even though individuals have other insurance that should be paying the bill, strengthening internal controls to save $310 million in home health service payments, saving $169 million by refusing to pay for unnecessary services, and, and saving over $61 million by identifying billing errors made by managed care companies. In addition, OMIG conducted over 4,000 investigations of providers last year and took action in more than 900 of those cases. In total, OMIG recovered over $410 million due to fraud and other overpayments. These actions are emblematic of our overall approach, preventing improper payments where possible and recovering overpayments when necessary. This coming year presents new opportunities Protecting program integrity for the state, the taxpayers, and the enrollees is as important now as it ever was. The executive budget provides strong support for our office and will improve OMIG's operations and its abilities to fight fraud and abuse in the Medicaid program. Our results in the 2013-14 fiscal year will only improve upon past efforts. Thank you again, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your concise statement. Are there any questions on the Senate side? Yes. Is that Senator Hannon? Yes. yes okay. Um, good morning, Commissioner. The uh, couple of questions. First is, how are you interacting with the new Affordable Care Act a thing called RACs, regional something auditing committees? And, uh, Recovery. At one, at one point, you were proposing to be the RAC for the state, and I don't know what happened to that whole proposal. 
Right. We, we, uh, we have a specific unit that works uh, with the recovery order contractors. We work very carefully uh, with our partners in the health department, and uh, it's working very well. We are at the forefront uh, across the country in terms of uh, working with the recovery order contractors. How many people would you have in that unit? Uh, we probably have about uh, 15 people that work in that particular side of the house, sir. Part of your, uh, the budget estimate was that you'd recover, but your target was about $300 million in cash recovery for the forthcoming fiscal year and about, I guess, about $800 million in avoided waste and uh, abuse. Have you detailed the, the $800 million in terms of the sectors or even in terms of the entities? Uh, our, when you were speaking about those numbers, Senator, that was the state share. Um, you know, our target is $2.2 billion, $1.1 billion. So just double what I said. Right, so just double the numbers. Um, we have uh, aligned our staff uh, with what we call business line teams, as I mentioned in my opening statement. Uh, it allows us to be better coordinated in our efforts, more efficient in our efforts. But I have not taken uh, it so far as to determine where, how many overpayments are in this particular category of service at this time. Did you, have you looked retrospectively as to the similar – you made a similar projection last year. Have you looked retrospectively as to what you might have avoided in waste and fraud and abuse and all that? Yes, sir. We are working very closely with our partners, whether they be uh, the regulatory agencies from the O agencies or from the Department of Health, in terms of identifying areas of risk. We are conducting uh, risk analysis in each of the program areas. Uh, we established nine business line teams. Those business line teams are uh, assigned by categories of service. Each of those business line teams has conducted a risk analysis to identify the, uh, the program areas that are at most risk in their particular categories of service, and those are the areas that we are targeting. And, and have you, when you talk about targeting is one thing, I'm just wondering is, is there, and I know you do an annual report, Yes, sir. In the annual report, do you detail which of the uh, things you've avoided in terms of waste and abuse? Yet yeah, we, we do identify uh, fraud and waste and abuse, uh, fraud activities, but not by category of service. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. That would be it. Thank you very much. Uh, j just a quick question. I know you were just focused some on some of the recovery issues on the provider side and uh, recipient side. Are there is there anything you are looking at implementing uh, this year uh, on uh, fraud related activities and attempting to recover on on that side? Thank you, Assemblymember Oates. Uh, yes, in fact, uh, one of the statistics that I mentioned was $169 million that was saved last year. That was a result of our recipient, uh, excuse me, restricted recipient program, where that we are actually monitoring the uh, amount of uh, resources that individual enrollees are uh, spending, and we're watching carefully individuals. We're working very closely with the local districts. We have a extremely successful county demonstration program. We have 13 counties involved in, in this particular program. Uh, last year, those counties uh, identified over $12 million in overpayments, and um, we've actually recovered over $4 million of that $12 million so far that was identified. One of the things I know that um, I've just learned that Motor Vehicle is looking to do a new license because of some of the concern with fraud and in, in use with license. Any uh, consideration or move toward uh, picture-based uh, benefit uh, type card to help in some of that fraud uh, restriction? Yeah, that's another great question. Thank you. We have met, uh, myself as well as a number of our staff have met with various companies uh, throughout the past year where they have come up to us and demonstrated their capabilities of their particular smart card, I'll call it. Um, there's some great products out there. We are in the process of evaluating 
which card would, uh, in our opinion, be the best. We're also working with, of course, with our partners at the health department and the local districts since they are so heavily involved in uh, enrolling individuals in the program. Thank you. Uh, I think it was last year sometime there were some complaints from providers that maybe your uh, group was overreaching or there were difficulties that they were having in complying. And uh, I haven't heard any complaints lately. I know the last I heard that you were meeting with these groups and uh, trying to at least talk through some of the issues. And uh, has, is it as, was that as successful as I think it was because no one seems to be complaining anymore? Or at least I'm not hearing it. Chair Chairman, I'm extremely proud of the work that uh, we have accomplished in that regard. As you know, in the governor's veto message, he directed me to establish a working group to discuss those very issues. Uh, it was a, a wonderful experience for me working with about 35 extremely knowledgeable individuals that represented providers as well as uh, the enrollee population. We had some great discussions. Uh, we, of course, don't always agree with one another, but we had some great discussions. But out of those meetings uh, came several recommendations, and one was the, uh, the use of the business line teams to enable us to be more effective and more efficient in the way we conduct our business, more knowledgeable about the way we conduct our business. Because, again, those business lines are lined up by categories of service. So instead of trying to, you know, you heard Dr. Shaw talk for two and a half hours here about all the various programs we could align our staff so they would be more knowledgeable about specific categories of service. So that helped us know what we're doing before we go out into the field. The second thing we've done is establish um, strong protocols, uh, understand what the criteria is that we're going to be using, share those uh, protocols with the provider associations so people have an understanding of what we are going to be looking at. Again, uh, I just saw some people uh, the other day from the associations. We may end up agreeing to disagree, but at least you know what we're looking at. So it's extremely important uh, that we have that transparency when it comes to our protocols and the criteria that we're going to be using. In addition, um, there was uh, another issue uh, had to do with our sampling methodology. And the biggest concern with the ex uh, sampling methodology and therefore the extrapolation was the lack of transparency. So we've now built into our systems where uh, we're, we're very transparent in what we do. What are we going to do? What are we going to look at? How are we going to look at it? What, what's the universe that we're going to be looking at? And, and explaining to the provider community of what, what in error is not really $50, but it may be extrapolated to be $50,000 or whatever the numbers are. And those are some uh, benefits that have come out of that working group. And again, I'm very proud of that. I think the numbers speak for themselves. As you know, life is a balance right. in terms of uh, everything that goes on. So we're able to recover money, but do it in a fair and reasonable way. Excellent. Okay, that's terrific. Thank you. Sessions? None. Everybody, everybody's uh, wiped out from Dr. Shah, so uh, you're, you're, you're the recipient of that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. Next speaker is Daniel Sisto, president of uh, Haney's. Good morning. Good morning. I uh, thought I'd begin with a personal note. Um, I became president of Haney's in 1986. I will be leaving at the end of June to be replaced by Dennis Whalen. And I wanted to mention, he, since he this is for the purpose of this uh, meeting here, my last hurrah, um, I just wanted to say um, how much I appreciate the activity of, of this body, when you come together every year, bicameral, bipartisan, four committees effectively coming together, and the transparency that comes out of it, and the seriousness which you have, have uh, uh, pointed yourselves to here, has always been interesting, and, and, I, and I just appreciate it. So I wanted you to know that, lest I forget later. To the substance. Um, Thank you. The, uh, the last two years, really, um, 
between the Medicaid reform team activity, the budgets you've passed, and the Affordable Care Act, um, those, those activities have set off a revolution in health care. I don't mean reform, I mean dramatic, widespread revolution. We're changing the delivery system, the financing system, patient access, the, the coverage issues, the oversight, the quality improvement, integrating care, scale of care, quality improvement, value-based everything, massive transformation going on. And the complexity is it's happened at the same time as massive state and federal deficits. So in thinking about Dr. Shaw's comments, uh, uh, his notion of the vision and the 30 percent that's unnecessary, there's, there's not a whole lot of providers that don't understand what the promised land is supposed to look like. A world of, you know, integrated and, and patient-centered, population health-oriented systems that focus on, on, on improving the population's health in an efficient and effective way. We get it. <laughs> the problem is getting from here to there the transformation that's, that's necessary within the context of a global budget in New York State and a tidal wave potentially coming out of Washington. So my whole testimony essentially comes down, I think, to three words, um, essentially to empower, which is hope, right, to invest, which is hope, and to get transformation, which is the goal. And, the, and so that's what I would ask as you, as you go into this year, the administration is putting a two-year budget before you on the table. And so much, although you've hit on a lot, but so much can get masked under a global cap. It seems like everything's safe. It's under a global cap. But if you just go blindly forward uh, and buy two more years of same old, same old, what happens over four years is you're not active you're not active participants in that transformation. You're not shaping it to the degree I think a legislature might and, and, and perhaps ought to. So although it seems on the surface, whether you look at the state of the state or, or um, even some of the budget proposals, like, well, this is a relatively benign year in health care, the reality is it's an explosive transformative year out in the field. And, uh, and, and, I, and so the empowerment issues to me come down to regulatory reform. We've had some. Um, but it's slow coming. Thank God you, you, you all passed uh, observation beds, for example, some several months back after years of fighting for them. But they still haven't really been implemented. Um, it took years to get transitional care unit. Over a decade in New York, everybody was afraid it would have this massive effect on nursing homes. There was nothing. In fact, it's so late that most don't even engage in it. The problem in New York is time, the time it takes to get things done. Whether there's inadequate staff at the health department or there's just too much regulation or something in between, we really need to make sure that uh, an environment that calls for as dramatic a transformation as this does provides an environment within which one can be flexible enough and maneuverable enough to adapt to it. The, um, so that, that flexibility comes also in, in just being attentive to cutting off the rainfall of unfunded mandates. I think of things that we volunteered for as associations when the, I, when the issues came up in recent years. This basically filling the hole where public health is, has been um, left, left uh, unable to, to fill a void. And so it's whether it's simple, and, and every one of them we support it, you know. We should do more uh, hearing tests. We should do more sepsis. We should do pertussis. We should do uh, immunization. Fill in a blank. And we're doing it, and we're jumping it, because that's what not-for-profit voluntary institutions and providers do. That's their mission, to improve the community's health. But at some point, everybody wants more, right? Everybody wants more staff. Everybody wants more wages. Everybody wants more benefits. Everybody wants more, more, more. And you cannot continue to bless that, as, as desirable as they may sound, if simultaneously we're saying, OK, um, two years more, no update factors, no trend factor. Two years more, we'll take another 2% off the top. You know, it's been since 19, uh, two, I'm sorry, 2005 since the provider community has had a full trend factor. A trend factor is just the price index, right? The, the price index of the goods and services. So for 10 years, not that we would want it, we didn't say we're going to do a cap 
on wage, we're going to do wage and price controls. No. But we said, we're just going to cap whatever we pay. And after 10 years, you sit and wonder, why is it that your institution or your institution or yours is on the brink of bankruptcy or closing? Well, you can't go for a decade <laughs> pretending that the cost of business hasn't gone up. And there's charts in here that shows you what the realistic cost of doing business has happened, whether it's drugs or food supplies or oil or labor, the things that hospitals and nursing homes and home care providers buy. So we can deal with one or the other, but not both. So that's part of what I mean by empowerment. And empowerment in part is also, hopefully we get a waiver from Washington with the 10 billion the administration has asked for, but that's tied up. But whatever it is finally gets resolved. That needs to be in invested, actually, invested in accelerating the transformation. And some of the, the, the VAP hospitals, some of them are gonna need more than that than others will whether they're isolated, rural, critical access types, or they're, they're sitting in, 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 uh, in, in an urban center. Um, but that has to be spread across the spectrum of provider and consumer interest to create the systems of the future. The testimony will show you activities on the part of all the allied hospital associations in New York, um, Haney's and Greater New York uh, heading it up, but all of them engaged percentage decreases in the double digits in a whole variety of areas where there's been an intense concentration on quality. Um, th that also needs continuous investment if it also is tied increasingly to hundreds of millions of dollars required in information technology. So where's all this to come from if you're struggling as well as a state? In part, the Affordable Care Act um, as much as it may be a burden at times, is also an opportunity because this state has always been, with the support of us in the provider community, um, a supportive of expanding access and expand, expanded insurance for those who needed it. Well, now the Affordable Care Act, the federal government will pick up some of those costs for certain populations. That will save the state money under the cap, if you will, or on top of, as Senator Hannon put it, that money might provide and the years ahead, the opportunity to make the investments we need to reach that, that promised land that uh, Dr. Shaw talked about. But the global cap itself, this year, needs to be looked at. You know, the global cap is not, obviously, that rates go up. It's that the state will spend X dollars more based upon the consumer price index. It really mixes up two things. The price of something goes up, and we use that as an expenditure increase, not a cost increase adjuster, not a rate increase, but an expenditure. And, and as was pointed out, if you add a million people to Medicaid over 12 years or you add 300,000 over two or three, two and a half years, well, that's where the money largely is going. So, so in the midst of, a, let's say, a hurricane or other natural disaster or an epidemic, we really need, need to be clear that this global cap has to be adjusted for things that are so far beyond the control of the provider or the consumer community. Um, we need to stop thinking about a 10-year moving average for it. We're living right now in a time of incredibly low inflation. At some point, God willing, this country goes back to some normal economic cycle, and when it does, inflation will pick up. Interest rates will pick up. If we're living in a 10-year adjustment for our expenditure growth, let alone our rates, you will see a precipitous decline in the viability of any organization that is tied to the Medicaid program. As you will, unfortunately, if the federal government tries to solve its problem by simply cutting, as it is tend want to do, again, provider expenditures, their cost, but doesn't change anything about eligibility or benefits or, you know, in terms of when people come on the program. And that, um, so our best case in Washington is a 2% cut in Medicare across the board as part of sequestration. There's a list on page 5 to 11, basically in the testimony, of what the economic profile looks like now. And I mention it because in the points you've made yourselves this morning, the system has become extremely fragile because it's requiring investment to change at the same time it's expected to absorb cuts. Nursing home, hospital, home care, rehab center, hospice, they're all, they're all in this together. They're all feeling the same pressures. 
If we don't want 30 or 40 more VAP hospitals, then you need to pay attention to the room under the cap, how it's calculated, what should be exempt from it, how to invest some of the savings from either the cap or Medicaid waiver and the savings from Washington. That's our hope, I think, as a collective for how we're going to finish this transformation and not abort it halfway through. Um, and, and lastly, I would just say that um, on access to capital, we list in the page 20 and so on a few different ways that we think we can experiment on how to get access to capital without running up the white flag and turning the system over to for-profits. Um, I, simply, I simply think, well, last, two weeks ago, the article about HCA having to pay the federal government back a couple of hundred million uh, for its uh, inappropriate incentives, uh, if you will, and, and the way it dealt with its billing and, and, and volume is a reminder that they're really, the difference isn't just not-for-profit, for-profit. It's, it's one's mission is the return of equity to stakeholders, and the other's mission is, is the improvement of health in a community and a population's health. One set of hospitals are economic institutions with social implications, but not-for-profit hospitals are social institutions with economic implications. I think we're well served keeping the latter alive. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Um, you can go first. That's right. Let someone else go first. Well, first of all, not so much a question. I just wanted to take this opportunity to, again, thank you for the many years that uh, we have worked together in your capacity at uh, at Haney's. Uh, your thoughtfulness and persistence and innumerable other qualities. Uh, I think have not only served uh, the hospitals of New York well, but have served the legislature and, and, and the public well. Um, one piece in the budget in particular that, I, that I'll be interested in uh, discussing with you and, and your people over the next couple of weeks uh, is the, uh, the pilot proposal for uh, uh, for a for-profit hospital, uh, I don't want to go into the. I don't want to go into all the parameters of that uh, and issues today, but Fine. it is Go certainly ahead. something we're going to need to talk Be about. Be glad to follow up with that. Sure. Okay. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Senator Rivera. Um, I, okay, Senator Hanna. Since I sponsored bills in regard to private equity. And since much of the language is similar to the bills I sponsored, um, and, and I say this with all due respect, because um, in terms of the philosophy of where the health system is going, uh, the hospital system is going, uh, wisdom of all of that, uh, you have been a tremendous resource uh, for me since I became chair of the committee. But I also know we have a philosophical difference, but I, there's no need to say that the proposal in regard to private equity is for publicly traded operations. It's not. I think that would be too much for the body politic of New York State to begin with. But I also sponsored it because the alternatives just don't seem to be there. Uh, we did, uh, Senator uh, Assemblyman Godfrey and I were responsible for the legislation, the Burger Commission, and for the HEAL grants. So as we go through this cycle of the state's economic uh, age, I've asked about other HEAL grants. That doesn't seem to be possible. As we go through rebuilding for Sandy, as we go through building a bridge across the Hudson and the, the Tappan Zee, the entire uh, fight for capital funds in this state is intense. Uh, we already have a high per capita debt structure. And so the thought is that if there is private equity and you're not going to go to publicly traded, you should try this because where are you going to get the pot of money to do all the hospitals that have economic troubles? There is a lot of them and all for the reasons you talk about. Now maybe also there needs to be a longer term you talk about the, the, you haven't gotten the trend factor since 06, 05. Um, the other, all the other built-in CPIs have been cut out. 
Um, well, what is there to do about that? But at the same time, we've gone along and we've switched from DRGs to APGs. We've switched from inpatient to outpatient. There's a lot of changes, and you have a quarter of a million more in the last two years of Medicaid patients. So some CEOs or CFOs are finding money. But the capital component of it, which used to be there in the old days when we had the thing called NIFR, which ended in 1995, isn't there anymore. And whatever was supposed to pick it up, the dormitory authority or whatever have you, hasn't been able to pick it up. So I don't believe that labeling this publicly traded and get everybody's body politic all excited is a productive thing to do. Well, and, uh, and maybe I misread, but I thought the governor's uh, budget language wasn't that, that explicit that it wasn't uh, publicly traded. Yours might have been, but I don't remember. I, I read theirs as being open to either. So I'll go back and reread it. In any event, um, we had, as my former chairman, uh, matter of fact, runs the Ascension Oak Hill Collaborative, and we had him come to our board to present what it is that they would do so that we could figure out, could we do it or do we need to seat it? And, um, and it was interesting. Uh, one of his responses was, look, when you get to the scale of a North Shore or a Presbyterian, there may be not a whole lot that Ascension has with its scale, but there are a lot of hospitals in this state where we think we could make a big difference. Now, what I'm going to be interested in is, are, are they willing to make that difference uh, in an isolated rural community with a hospital that's full of Medicaid and Medicare, or are they willing to do it in an inner city hospital that's predominantly uninsured in Medicaid? Because if they are, then I guess we'd have to take a fresh look. But if all they're interested in is Staten Island or the affluent parts of Long Island, we can take care of those ourselves by taking the money from, uh, some money from a, if it's a waiver that I think we will ultimately get. I think that the Affordable Care Act is going to provide at least a billion or two billion uh, in relief over the years. Um, and, and we can leverage that potentially by going toward, the, and this is, you know, something we, we need to explore more fully. But, you know, Mayor Bloomberg created the, that uh, social impact bond around the prison system. Now, granted, it was backed by Bloomberg dollars, effectively. Um, but the, the thought is if, if we could identify geographic areas or key health incentives that we wanted, as a state, to craft social impact bonds um, with, like, performance contracts tied to them. So you would have to improve the health of the population or you'd have to do X, Y, Z to get a higher return. Um, th there's, a, there's a real possibility, I think, that we could attract dollars. When, when the health department uh, asked us to come in and talk to them about this, we, we, we actually contacted investment bankers to go with us. And in the meeting with the health department, Bill Allison, our, our VP of Finance, was there. Greater New York was there. Um, what, what they heard from the people on Wall Street was, why aren't you doing more business in New York? Shouldn't we bring in the for-profits? And the answer was, look, we're agnostic. We don't care if it's for-profit or not-for-profit. Your problem is it takes you a year and a half to do things that cost us three or four months in other states. Uh, you can expedite activities at the dormitory. You can expedite CON in New York. You can do a whole lot of things to make financing in New York more attractive to us. And we don't care if it's a not-for-profit or for-profit. So I, I, I'm just—I don't want to give up. I don't want to give up yet. Uh, I, I know I, I you just, don't want to give up, but I've heard the same things about the sources of capital ten years ago, and it hasn't happened. It's not happening. And uh, I just don't want to construct a wrong caricature of what's going on and what's being proposed. I've heard what Ascension had proposed. This is not it. They wanted to be for profit, run it. This is not it. They wanted to do, do not the inner city. This is not it. One of the proposals is specifically for Brooklyn. So I think there's a vast difference. And unless New York, I mean, we made an slight effort towards alleviating the CON process, but anybody can read the proposed white paper from PIFIC and comes out of it with their eyes still straight is a miracle worker. Um, 
I have no idea what the CON process will look like after it, but I do know other states have just simply deliberately or not deliberately repealed it, and they're thriving. So, and it's not like some state in another region. One of it is Pennsylvania. So I think there's just need to untie some of these oh, symbol beliefs that we have and, and try to see what is actually going to work. Okay. No more. No more. Thank you. No Thank much. you very much. Thank you. No much. Okay. And the next testifier is Kenneth Rasky from the Greater New York Hospital Association. We, I didn't want to make an uh, ungraceful entrance, <laughs> which has been known to happen. <laughs> Good afternoon to all. I'm Ken Rasky, President of the Greater New York Hospital Association, and uh, uh, to uh, Chairman Godfrey's comments about Dan Sisto, I totally agree with you. He has acquitted himself with a great deal of the style and a plume in his career on behalf of all hospitals in New York State. So uh, I, I feel the same way, Dick. With respect to the, the subject at hand, the impact of the proposed budget on the healthcare community, we have prepared slides, data, and stuff that's in, that, that you all have. I will, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you'd be kind enough to let me just do an oral rendition of it and do a summary and get to the points. And Senator Hannon and I will come back to the question that you, that you had with, with oh, Dan can't as well. Wait. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and try to uh, deal with that. Uh, it, uh, in, in the scheme of things, uh, the Greater New York Hospital Association wants to compliment the executive branch for the efforts on the Medicaid redesign team, redesigning and refitting the New York healthcare industry is a yeoman's task, and it will take a lot of effort and a lot of money and certainly uh, a lot of uh, super intellect in order to accomplish it. We have got a great start. And the idea of introducing major pieces of initiatives that deal with readmissions to hospitals, population management, and all those things that uh, spell better health care for the New York citizenry are embodied in it. And even though there are issues such as with the, the, the cap, as Dan was speaking to, and, and perhaps I think that the goodwill that has existed in this effort transcends uh, all those uh, kinds of problems and we will straighten them out uh, one way or another. Now as a backdrop though, the problem is in every one of you, I'm, I'm not really telling you anything different because either in your district or in an adjacent district, you have institutions which are failing. Some severely, uh, some uh, have failed already, and are now casually. Uh, we tried to, in our, our presentation to put some of the markers there as to those that have gone or are going or headlines that go with them. Uh, none of you, not a single member, is impervious to that statement, either in your district or adjacent to it. And that's a pretty, pretty troubling comment, isn't it? And, uh, and that certainly is the backdrop for our remarks. Dan, in his comments, talked about the U.S. problem. And the U.S. problem is spilling many-fold into the operating rooms of New York hospitals and the emergency rooms and all the other services that we provide. Uh, there are huge cuts that have taken place. There are huge cuts that will take place. There are cuts that will take place on vulnerable communities that is used as a euphemism called DISH, disproportionate share. In fact, yesterday I was uh, in Washington with the SEIU and talking with White House personnel about this very same issue. Those cuts are already in legislation and in the ACA. And, uh, and the amount of damage on the, both the Medicare side, which you don't talk about here, but we do because Medicare is the largest payer for, uh, for New York hospitals. 
and then Medicaid, couple the two together, Mr. Chairman, you're talking about 60-plus percent of the revenue of a New York institution. So those cuts, which are, which are already programmed, programmed degradation, which will occur, are subjects that are extremely important. We supported the, health, the Affordable Health Care Act, and I'm proud of it. Proud of it. But I, I do know that there are problems that need to be corrected. And the idea of having disproportionate share payments reduced was based on the premise that you would have increased insurance coverage on the other side and get the right additional. I mean, that was the idea. Okay. Theory is terrific. Practice is now getting close. Now we have to make sure that it does do that. And that is indeed what we have been talking about. Now, on the impact of the executive budget, which is, of course, the jurisdiction that this uh, joint uh, uh, committee is dealing with today, um, <clears throat> there are a number of issues, but I can crystallize them quite simply as this. The Affordable Health Care Act will provide New York State with additional revenue for coverage of certainly uh, less than full covered individuals today childless adults, as an example. And the amount of money, and we have that in our, in our uh, pictorials here, and the amount of money could be $2 billion over a period of time, uh, or at least wrapping up to that. Certainly, it's going to be something even in the next quarter of next year. And that money is Medicaid money, ladies and gentlemen. That is Medicaid money. That money should not be used for any purposes other than for Medicaid. Now, the institutions, and uh, Senator Rivera, I believe you raised this with Commissioner Shaw, for the last two years, we have seen no trend factor. We have seen a baseline reduction of 2% in payments. That uh, proposal continues in the future for next year and the year thereafter will be under consideration by you. And I submit, ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you today that that money should be used for Medicaid purposes. It should be used for purposes of bolstering the wherewithal of, the, of your institutions and your neighboring institutions. To divert that money for any other purpose to me would be wrong. And I have articulated this position to the administration and will continue to articulate it to the administration. And now I'm presenting it to you for your consideration. I believe that money should be restored and earmarked for Medicaid purposes, including trend factors, baseline reductions, investments in new and better ways to provide efficient and economical care. And, uh, and that message is the message that I bring to you today. Uh, the amount of money is extraordinary. It is $2 billion uh, when fully wrapped up. And in fact, even in next year's budget, the one or the budget that you're considering at this particular time, there is $83 million of that newfound revenue from the ACA, which is being used for purposes of, of, of backfilling the cap on the one hand, and then now diverted to public health programs. See a, a diversion right there. That's why I got my attention. So now the question might be, since it's a smidgen of revenue next year, isn't the issue the year thereafter? And that is the issue that you're, you're going to be dealing with because the program aspects of this are two years as presented by the executive branch. So I want to work with you, Mr. Chairman, in, uh, in any way we possibly can to find ways that can help heal uh, the current trauma that's going on within the healthcare community, the new trauma that will be introduced by the federal cutbacks, as I mentioned, and ways of taking care of that through making sure that the new money that comes in from the federal government is deployed in the way that I am suggesting. Finally, uh, to Senator Hannon's question of Dan on the capital matter, it is a very, very complicated matter, sir, as you well know, and, uh, and one that has arguments that are good and reasonable on every side of the issue. Uh, I, I, for one, I have invited to our next board meeting uh, Stephen Berger, uh, private capital uh, people, people that are involved in social, uh, social bonds, uh, people that are involved in not-for-profit bonds,
people that are involved in taxable bonds, the variety, the menu, uh, ladies and gentlemen, of, of different vehicles that exist today for providing uh, capital uh, financing. We, were, we will uh, examine those options uh, and hopefully come to a conclusion as to what would be the most appropriate approach for the communities that we serve. Thank you. Thank you. What, where are they taking the Medicaid money and putting it elsewhere? I, I'm sorry. To, who, Me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for it. You're hearing things. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, could you ask the question again? I was just sorry. You talked about keeping the money that's going to come to the hospitals via the Medicaid program in Medicaid. Correct. Is there, do you view that some of the monies that are coming in in this year's budget are being diverted to non-Medicaid purposes? Yes, sir. Which, where would that be? That would be in $40 million, which is being used to uh, help uh, offset uh, uh, programmatic cuts that are in public health. Public health is different than Medicaid and deficit will not. To me, that's the opening of the door. Wasn't there a similar thing that was done with the HICRA money that was a tax that was supposedly raised for hospitals and has been over the last decade uh, constantly yeah. diverted? Yeah, we've seen this story before, haven't we, in, in budgets of previous uh, executive branch uh, proposals. But uh, I want to lay stake to that today in public because I believe it's, it's, it is the best thing to do given the situations that we're finding. Thank you. Richard Gottfried, Chairman. First of all, uh, even though as far as I know you're not about to leave Greater New York, I just want to re say we like you too. <laughs> um, it's mutual. <laughs> uh, on the question of trend factors uh, being proposed to be permanently eliminated. Um, I guess two arguments get made, and I'd be interested in your response to them. One is that to the, in, in the Medicaid fee-for-service world, to the extent rates are set based on formulas that are periodically updated and have new data loaded into them, uh, a, a trend factor may be less relevant. And the second argument that is made is that given that almost everyone in Medicaid is now going to be in some form of managed care and the hospital will therefore be negotiating what, you know, each hospital, you know, what, a, what a, a gallbladder or whatever is worth, is worth, whatever it is, is worth negotiating that with the managed care plan, the argument is made that the, the Medicaid fee-for-service rate becomes less and less relevant. Could you just respond to both of those notions? Well, I, I think, uh, uh, Chairman Godfrey, I, I can in relationship to the uh, issue of the managed care plans. In, in, in the, the reality is, is that the managed care uh, rate, rate negotiations used, usually pivot off the fee-for-service rate. And that's uh, and so that, so you have gravitational pull uh, in in that in that respect, and uh, and and I think that that should go on the record. You can you have a bunch of managed care people coming up behind me. Uh, they're very distinguished in their own right, and you can ask them about that, and uh, and you can get an answer that uh, I think uh, will confirm that to large degree. And, uh, and, and, I, and I, I submit that that's, uh, that that's the way it is. With respect to the trend factor, generally speaking, you know, we have input problems just like everybody else does. And uh, whether it's, it's uh, uh, covering pension costs, whether it's covering uh, increased labor costs, uh, whether it's increased regulatory uh, cons uh, constraints that are in increasing costs, whether it's upgrading our facilities like we had to have to do uh, with, uh, with, with respect to uh, the aftermath of Sandy, uh, when FEMA will give us 75 percent 
A lot of money, 75%. What is the other 25% coming from, Senator? Okay? So I don't care what you call it. And in fact, I had this very same argument with some of our staff, actually. You know, I don't care if you call it an actuarial adjustment, uh, a trend factor. Uh, God forbid we ever call it COLA. We don't want to do that. But you have to have some, embrace some way of paying for the same services with, with, with recognizing that inflation is a reality in the world. I can't make inflation go away, nor can you. It's just the way it is. So let's try to figure out how you can, how you can actually pay for something. You've got a, 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 a Pierce Arrow uh, car sitting out there, a Pierce Arrow. Made in 1931 for 20, it was 2,300 bucks. 2,300 bucks. Things probably worth a million bucks. I don't know. I'm making it up. I'll tell you when I when I'm when I'm making it up. We don't know if it runs. But it's worth a lot of money. <laughs> so, so somebody's got to recognize that. And and you can't, you know, you. I don't care how you do it, but just recognize that it has to be done. I'm just making a common sense argument here. Nothing sophisticated. Just a common sense argument. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator Kruger. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ken. Good afternoon. So I think you, not in your written testimony, but in one of your answers, you raised the issues of post Sandy. Now, my district um, had three hospitals close um, NYU, Bellevue, and the VA, and they are still all in stages of rebuild. And so the other hospitals, of course, and particularly their emergency rooms were overwhelmed. Is there a better, uh, we can debate whether there are enough emergency rooms geographically distributed or not, um, but is there a way to, during and post crises, have a system perhaps through your organization, working with at least in New York City, city government to make sure that you know, if you know, as I do, for example, that um, New York Cornell had 45 ER beds and 165 to 200 people in them, that you know, and then you had, of course, the flu at the same time, is there a better way to centrally redistribute direction of ambulances throughout the hospital system? Or is there a system already and it just didn't seem to be working? And is that realistic? Uh, those are really, uh, really important questions, uh, Senator. Uh, with respect to Sandy, our team was down at OEM the night that it hit, and our team did the evacuation, not the physical one. We directed uh, the resources of government to do it, including the places that were going to accept them. That includes hospitals and nursing homes, because we, we've had to do both. It was, uh, it was a, a night of heroes by everybody. It's a night of heroes. And I compliment all those that were involved in it, hospital staffs, nursing home staffs, and, and all the others uh, in doing it. Okay, so now they're redeployed. They're out of the, those institutions, and, and, and you have a, a dual problem. First, you have had to surge capacity in the other institutions that took them. And then all of a sudden, two, three, you know, you add, in your district is true, is NYU and Bellevue went down. The VA tends to be unto itself in, in terms of the system. But then farther out, we had Coney Island and Long Beach uh, go down as well. Now you've had four institutions, three of which are really major institutions in terms of size, uh, go offline. So now you have no, no, no way of taking patients that would have gone there to be treated. So you have the surge on the one hand and the lack of uh, resources on the other. I, I think that the hospital community rose to, as, to, to its, the best occasion it possibly can in trying to handle that. However, along comes the flu. And all of a sudden, now a very strained resource community is now burdened with the influx of very sick people that have the flu. And, uh, and in fact, how about this? The Greater New York Hospital Association and 1199 SEIU spent a half a million bucks on ads that was kind enough that the commissioner recorded, saying don't go to the emergency room. I'm paying people not to come to hospitals. 
I mean, is that, I mean, if you have the symptoms, treat them with your local physician. And that, those ran all over the state. So the answer is, I would get worried that when we constrain our resources the way we had under Sandy, that uh, another crisis could, could cripple. The good news, ladies and gentlemen, is that NYU and Bellevue and Coney Island are expected to be back online shortly. And that's the great news for the people of this state. So I did not mean any criticism. In fact, you were absolutely right. The hospitals did an amazing job under incredibly difficult circumstances. But my question was more, two months, two months after the storm, you would find incredible, it seemed, both over-demand in the ERs and perhaps maldistribution of where patients were being taken. So I was wondering, is there an ongoing system where the hospitals and or the city of New York can keep tabs on where the overflow is and is there a way to redirect, not away from hospitals that people need, obviously urgent care, but a way to somehow um, track and distribute from most crowded to lesser crowded. Is that realistic the, Yes, at the all? answer, I, I'm sorry, forgive me for giving that other long-winded answer, <laughs> but I thought it was important to do that anyway. But the, the truth of the matter is we do work with the fire department and EMS uh, closely in monitoring uh, what is going on in the emergency rooms. But at the height of the flu, everybody was on diversion. So I mean, if everybody's on diversion, nobody's on diversion. I mean, it, it's kind of like a non sequitur, but it's, that's what you end up with. And uh, so we've tried to figure out what, uh, what situations uh, are, are, are best met. I, I know I coordinated directly with the commissioner, and then we, our staff would coordinate with Fidney to see if, in <coughs> fact, uh, we can divert uh, ambulances instead of, say, to Beth Israel to St. Luke's Roosevelt, just as a, an example. And because uh, uh, Beth Israel picked up a lot of that uh, uh, cl the activity that from the closed institutions. So we do do that. Is it the best way of doing it? We're going to be sitting down with all the authorities, I believe it's next week, and they do they call, call it, I think it's a hot wash. I don't know what, where the expression comes from. But what they do is they debrief everybody that was involved in Sandy, uh, from, from the EMS to uh, uh, DOH, state and city health, uh, and, and all those people that were down there to figure out what, way, what things we could do better. And this will be one of them, too. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Nope. I, I, excuse me. I just have a couple. A couple of years ago, in February of 2011, AJOG, in their February 2011 edition, had a very complimentary article for New York Presbyterian Hospital uh, showing the claims or payments for medical malpractice claims against that uh, uh, hospital uh, dropped from two thousand in the year 2003 in the amount of close to 51 uh, million dollars to 2009 250 thousand dollars on the because of a very significant coordination of obstet obstetric patient care. You're, you're familiar with that. Correct? I am. Actually, you know, uh, Senator, you were the one that pointed that article out to me at that time. I remember that. And I did read it subsequent to that. Okay. That being the case, uh, have those, has that success rate continued? Well, you know, the, 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 it turns out that the hospitals uh, th throughout, I mean, beyond New York Presbyterian, are, are doing a lot on risk management, and the OB area is indeed one of the most important, in large part because of the financial exposure that is associated with it, uh, if in fact something untoward were to occur. And, uh, and a, a lot of important activity uh, is going on in a, in a constant fashion. We're doing, for example, beyond OB, we're, we have run a, a number of uh, major uh, activities, including sepsis, which we did yesterday. As Excuse an me, can I just stop you because we've got a lot of witnesses. The question was simply, is that success rate on your obstetric patient? <laughs> at New York safety? Presbyterian? At New York, your New York Presbyterian. You know, I think that if I'm not empowered to say what has actually occurred in New, at New York Presbyterian, I am not. But I believe 
that if you were to ask them, they would say that those results have not been replicated. Not been replicated. Not been replicated. Well, if, if, uh, I, if you have access to the chart, I would appreciate if they're willing to provide it to me. I will ask them, sir, because it it's a fair question. I, I absolutely think that's a fair question. Okay, but my point is, uh, if you can continue the chart to the present day numbers, whatever the present day was, that would be helpful. Secondly, uh, you represent more than that hospital in New York City. Oh, you represent yeah. all of them. Uh -huh. Uh, because of this success rate as published in a national publication, actually a world publication, has this program, this protocol, been replicated in other hospitals, the, the member hospitals that you represent? Uh, there have been attempts of the protocol that you're referring to at the time that I did the, invest, I, I did the questioning, when I, uh, of some of our institutions when I got an answer that they tried it and they don't have the same results. In other words, from a scientific replication point of view, to the extent that you could use that here, and I'm not even sure you can, uh, that we found different kinds of results. But I can get all of that information back to you uh, and to every member. Um, forgive me, I would never, uh, if I were to give it to, uh, to one, I would give it to all, naturally of what kind of experience we've seen in that area given okay. those protocols. So the, qu the question is basically twofold. The chart uh, being carried through for, uh, mm -hmm. for uh, New York Presbyterian and also with the other hospitals, the question is not only what their, their rates were in obstetrics, but also whether they replicated this program that was so successful in your hospitals. And the I whole purpose of this, I know we have discussions about high cost of medical malpractice uh, until we're blue in the face, but the clearest way to cut down rates is to have success like New York Presbyterian did so that uh, patients don't get hurt in the first place. We, uh, we totally agree with you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much. And thank you. It's, okay. al it's always a pleasure to, to come before you. Thank you very much. Uh, the, next, the next speaker is Richard Herrick, as, as well as Stephen Hans, both represented New York State Health Facilities Association. Thank you very much. I'm Dick Herrick, the president of the New York State Health Facilities Association. <clears throat> we represent 250 skilled nursing facilities and 50 assisted living across the state of New York, 90 percent of which are for-profit facilities, and Senator Hannon's comments are of special interest with, to me with regard to capitalization in the future. But without delay, I'd like to have the opportunity to uh, introduce Stephen Hans. Our Vice President of Government Relations, I might add, our new Vice President of Government Relations, as well as Mark Olson, our Chairman of our Legislative Committee, as well as the Administrator of Kingsway Arms in Schenectady. Stephen? Thank you, Dick. As it was Dan's last hurrah, as Dick noticed, this is my first hurrah. So, good afternoon. Uh, Chairman DeFrancisco, Chairman Farrell, Chairman Hannon, Chairman Gottfried, members of the Legislature. As, as Dick indicated, my name is Stephen Hans, and I'm with the New York State Health Facilities Association and the New York Center for Assisted Living. NISHPA and NISCAL members and their 57,000 employees provide essential long-term care to over 44,000 elderly, frail, and physically challenged women, men, and children at over 270,000, or 270, excuse me, skilled nursing and assisted living facilities throughout our state. As we sit here today, New York's long-term care providers face significant obstacles as a result of Superstorm Sandy, Super Storm Sandy, recent state budget constraints, and certain initiatives proposed in the 2013-2014 executive budget. And as we are well aware, and as Senator Savino expressed earlier with Dr. Shah, Sandy devastated numerous communities, resulting in an unprecedented disruption of service to residents at long-term care facilities, assisted living facilities, and adult homes. Overall, Sandy forced the displacement of 3,000 patients from nursing homes and another 1,800 from adult homes and assisted living facilities. 
Fortunately, through the dedicated efforts of providers working in collaboration with the Department of Health, there were no occurrences of serious consequences suffered by these displaced residents. What has occurred, however, are significant financial hardships jeopardizing the immediate and future operation of many long-term care facilities as a result of the disruption of the payment stream for the patients displaced and the capital costs of restoring the facilities to operating condition. NISHPA is working with the Department of Health to reconcile these payment issues as we did with Hurricane Irene. We now wait results from the federal government as it relates to the $51 billion in relief funds. And with regard to these funds, it's a little known fact that FEMA funds are not available to assist recovery efforts for for-profit institutions. Federal assistance is crucial to both help offset the significant capital expenditures that have been incurred and implement measures to bolster facilities to resist future events. The financial implications of Sandy only add to the difficult fiscal circumstances faced by New York's long-term care providers as a consequence of the state's recent budget constraints. Over the past five years, funding cuts to New York's long-term health care sector have exceeded $1.2 billion. The, the Medicaid redesign team initiatives have resulted in approximately $400 million in additional cuts over the past two fiscal years and the potential for additional federal Medicare cuts over the next few months would only exacerbate New York's already fragile long-term care finances. For example, at $46.39 per patient per day, New York unfortunately leads the nation with the largest per day shortfall between Medicaid payment rates and costs of providing services. New York's long-term care facilities have worked hard to endure these past budget cuts, and this is clearly demonstrated by the fact that nursing home spending is presently below the Medicaid global spending cap enacted under the MRT. As New York's long-term care providers enter into year two of the state's new pricing methodology for reimbursement and transition to a managed care environment, it is crucial that the 2013-2014 enacted budget provide long-term financial stability to ensure the continued delivery of high-quality long-term health care services. With these past budget constraints and the impacts of Sandy serving as a backdrop, I would like to briefly highlight several proposals included in the 2013-2014 executive budget, which negatively impact New York's long-term care and assisted living facilities, as well as those that could benefit such facilities. <clears throat> the executive proposes to extend the 2% across the board reduction in Medicaid payments through March 31, 2015, resulting in $357 million in cuts. We oppose this proposal on the basis that the most recent data from the Department of Health shows that nursing home spending is below the Medicaid global cap by approximately $4 million. We believe that it is inappropriate to automatically apply an extension of the 2% cut for the nursing home sector when target savings have already been achieved and exceeded. The executive also proposes the elimination of the ability to set a trend factor adjustments for nursing homes, assisted living program beds, and other Medicaid sectors, as, as we've discussed throughout this hearing. We oppose this provision for the reason that it has been five years since the state afforded a trend factor. Costs have increased above the CPI, as, the, as uh, we have discussed earlier, and facilities continue to provide salary increases to ensure the retention of well-trained and qualified staff. Should the state's Medicaid expenditures fall below the Medicaid global spending cap for state fiscal year 2013-2014, the state may have the financial ability to provide a trend factor adjustment. However, the executive budget as presented would unnecessarily preclude the ability to do so. In addition, a trend factor adjustment would greatly benefit those facilities directly impacted by Hurricane Sandy. The executive proposes that managed care contracts with nursing homes must provide standard rates of compensation to, quote, ensure the retention of a qualified workforce capable of providing high quality care. By requiring a standard wage rate in a health care environment where the state has imposed a strict Medicaid global spending cap that is increasingly threatened as enrollment increases and has eliminated any trend factor, this unfunded mandate 
could negatively impact quality of care by forcing providers to reduce staff to meet the wage mandate to stay below the global spending cap requirements. Moreover, this provision would limit patient access to care given its requirement that a provider that is deemed out of compliance could be prohibited from accepting new admissions. The executive also proposes to continue the Medicaid global spending cap until March 15, 2015. We oppose this extension on the basis, as I mentioned earlier, that the recent data indicates that New York's nursing home sector is below the, the global spending cap by roughly $4 million. The executive proposes to, turn, uh, to sunset $30 million in payments for financially disadvantaged nursing homes, effective December 31, 2012, and redirect this funding to nursing homes through the Vital Access Provider Program, or the VAP program. We strongly advocate that this funding remain committed to the nursing home sector. We support the executive's proposal to extend the 6% reimbursable cash receipt assessment and strongly advocate for its continuation in order, max in order to maximize the federal funds match. We support the executive's proposal to authorize the Department of Health to establish capital reimbursement methodologies for nursing homes through regulations promulgated in consultation with the nursing home industry. We also support the executive's proposal for the inclusion of capital construction costs into the assisted living program rate. However, we believe this provision should be expanded for all ALP uh, providers, regardless of the date of operation, and not limited to those facilities with 100% ALP beds. Additionally, this capital assessment should be integrated into the ALP rate for future years and not be time limited with no cap imposed. Finally, we support the inclusion of 4,500 additional ALP beds targeted only for the newly identified 49 transitional adult home providers affected by the recent regulations published by the Department of Health. We further support, support the process being simplified for providers by streamlining the competitive process to secure those ALP beds. However, the application process for those 4,500 beds must also be completed in an equally expedited manner so as to ensure that these additional ALP beds are in operation as soon as possible. To conclude, the impacts of past budget constraints, Superstorm Sandy, coupled with several proposals included in with the 2013-2014 executive budget, impose material burdens on New York's long-term care providers and ultimately to the women, men, and children we serve. The New York State Health Facilities Association and the New York State Center for Assisted Living will continue to work together with the governor, the legislature, and all affected constituencies to ensure the continued delivery of high quality, cost effective long term health care services throughout New York. Thank you. Thank you very much. You are almost to the second. Excellent. Excellent. It was pretty impressive. Unbelievable. Chairman, I, I'm used to that from appellate courts. <laughs> uh, despite, that comp <laughs> despite that compliment, we prefer lower than the uh, debt. Uh, any questions on the Senate side? Assembly? I'd like to chime in with one additional uh, comment. You, okay. If you want to chime in, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I think it's important to note that Nursing homes in, in our own uh, spending budgets are about 70% on labor. The majority of our cost is directly spent on labor, and in a world with a cap on, on spending throughout the state's budget and not having a trend factor over the years make it very difficult for nursing homes to stay competitive with our partners that don't have these kind of constraints. Uh, I, I operate a facility locally in the area. We gave raises this year and last year, uh, and that came out of our, our budget. We had to increase our base rates for our CDs right, and LPS to stay the competitive. Computer. Again, a cost that's not really recognized. It's a cost of doing business. We understand that. But in a world where we're forced to stay competitive with other market forces that don't have the same constraints, and very often we're, we're, we're fighting for the same labor market. So again, the, the concept of standard rates of compensation uh, based on us without the ability to have a trend factor and the imposition of the cap make it very difficult. Thank you. There was a question there? Yeah. Uh, question about the, uh, the, the, the reference to FEMA money not being available for a, to a for-profit <coughs> entity. Uh, 
I mean, I certainly am always hearing about, you know, businesses, small, yes. you know, hardware stores applying to FEMA or being told to register with FEMA, et cetera, and they're all for-profit entities. Is it some particular part of the FEMA program that is not available to your for-profit members? Some of them, Godfrey, uh, this is a long-standing misunderstood element of the FEMA program that we have reemphasized to all the parties involved, most recently with the Department of Health when they were representing that the facilities that are impacted, so just in the Senator's area, could reach out to, to FEMA, SBA, and other elements. Mm -hmm. uh, we've actually taken at the national level through our national affiliate, the American Healthcare Association, a position to modify what's called the Stafford Act at the federal level, which prohibits the expenditure of money on for-profit entities. I can't speak about convenience stores and other things, but there are real live examples of where it cannot be expended. Just yesterday, with the Department of Health, we had someone from FEMA on, and I asked for an absolute clarification for the benefit of those in the Department of Health to basically speak to that particular issue, and he said, you're absolutely right. We cannot provide that. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. I'd be happy to send some information, uh, some of Godfrey, to you on that particular issue, if you'd like. Yeah. I'd, I'd be interested. Mr. Herrick, I'm just a little bit puzzled because at exactly that point that Assemblyman Gottfried's raised, I was having a conversation with the owner of several for-profit nursing homes who is telling me that on the day Hurricane Sandy arrived, he had received an email from uh, FEMA saying that his Hurricane Irene monies had been approved in terms of the delay. So I'll give you his name, and I don't know how I only remember the anecdote because of the delay, not because he, obviously he was eligible. So I, I hope we could straighten this out and pinpoint exactly where it lays. Well, Senator, uh, you're, you're exactly right. Unfortunately, the Irene money came 14 months from the date of the event, which is actually two months, I believe, by the time they got the cash uh, from when actually Sandy hit. We're working with the department to try and resolve that but issue. But you got FEMA money for Irene, but not no, for Sandy? no, that was that was not, uh, Senator. Because first of all, Irene was, even though everyone thought it was, it truly was not uh, a declared a national disaster by the president. He declared a state of emergency on behalf of the state of New York, but ultimately he did not declare for Irene uh, it as a. Uh, national disaster, and therefore the Secretary of Health and Human Services could not implement what's called the 1135 waiver without getting into all the details, and therefore federal program and regulatory relief was not available for Irene. Different from Sandy, which in very short order, he did declare that, the Secretary did put in the 1135 waiver. But to your point, the Irene money that we're referring to right now was not federal money. It was Medicaid money that was due to the providers that received those patients during that period of time. But I would point out to you, Sandy, I don't need to point out to you, Sandy, we're now in the 91 days. We were four to five days with Irene, and the numbers are building substantially. Thanks. Assembly member. Yeah, just to, to stick on what was probably a throwaway line, Steve, on your first page about the, about FEMA reimbursement. Um, your, your member um, organizations, how much have they been um, harmed financially by Sandy, Irene, Lee, other storms, and not been reimbursed? How much, what, how much in the hole are you because of it, part one, part two? Uh, is there, are there, are there other sources of Recompense for these for these uh, um, occurrences. I, I was in a nursing home last year after after uh, Irene and Lee, um, where they were doing the kind of massive recovery you see taking place down on Long Island right now. And this was in the Hudson Valley. Uh, it was terrifically expensive. They had to move everybody from one end of the facility to the other. They had to 
evacuate the, the, the areas, remove mold and, and uh, put in huge air uh, devices to keep the mold from regrowing and it was all sealed off and uh, it, was, it was a mess and uh, the entire facility had been encircled by water and parts of it were underwater. How much of this is, is, uh, is ongoing and for which you're getting no coverage at all? Assemblyman, there's a kind of two parts to the question. One is the ongoing, which is the, op the incurred operating cost. Very simplistically, the out-of-pocket cost that is not being uh, cash flowed right now, reimbursed, if you will. And, we're, and, and I would, would, to the department's credit, we're working very actively with them to quantify what that is. Um, the second part of it is the actual property damage and uh, capital costs that has been incurred and I would suggest to you needs to be incurred in the future to harden these properties for future operations. Uh, it has been very, very important to get this capacity online because as you heard from certainly Ken Rasky and Dan Sisto in the, in the past, there is an, it's, there's an integral linkage between this delivery system. If the, if the long-term care facilities are not up and running, there is going to be a backup into the, there is a backup into the hospital if the hospitals are inhibited from operating and you can see the cascading effect. To answer your question directly with regard to what is the number, and I have to answer it's undetermined at this time, but I, in order to quantify some of these things, in order to support the governor's request to the federal government for relief, if you will, we supplied a number of, a, a number of examples and data to them with regard to what the current needs are and the future needs. To replace one of those buildings, and one of them may have to be replaced, if not a, a few of them, one of them is over $100 million to replace them. That's without any hardening or extraordinary efforts or so forth. The daily operating cost, the simple math, one building that has 40 patients still in their buildings today as a result of an evacuation of another facility. 40 patients were in the 90 some days, 3,600 patient days, $200. That one building has $750,000 that's owed to them for taking care of those patients. But I would also suggest to you, it goes beyond the dollars and cents. You probably are a little surprised to hear me say that, but it does. Because the next event that's going to occur the good faith, the good will that's been there that made the miracle happen of no bad outcome from over 4,800 people being evacuated may not happen as freely and willingly as it happened. You cannot sustain $750,000 worth of cash for this extraordinary effort. And I will, will say that we're working very, very hard to try and come up with interim support, if you will, in that area. Thank you for your question. Senator Savino. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm glad you actually brought that up because I, you know, I guess there was a period of time when it made perfect sense to build most of our nursing homes and hospitals along the beach areas because of, you know, the beautiful weather and the open air and the, um, but as we've seen, it's placed many of them in tremendous risk. I visited a few of them in my district and some just outside the district and at the, shortly after the storm and then again in December. One of the things that continues to um, happen there is a lot of the patients were displaced and now they're somewhere else. Uh, are you experiencing still that level of displacement of, of um, residents of some of the nursing homes where they've been forced to go somewhere else and the impact it has on, on I guess, the, the entire system? Well, as we speak, I, I'm pleased that not all, but most have been returned. Good. There are some facilities that hope to open in March, hope to open in April, mm -hmm. that are sizable facilities and will hopefully uh, reoccupy everyone to uh, their place of choice, if you will, moving mm -hmm. forward. Um, but it, there has been a huge displacement of people and in, although it can be measured certainly in dollars and cents, it can also be measured in many other ways. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, I asked Dr. Shaw, as you heard, if there's been any discussions with the nursing home industry and the hospital industry about what to do in the future. We have all this money coming from Washington, ostensibly from Hurricane Sandy Relief. From Hurricane Sandy Relief. Has there been a conversation with any of your institutions about what to do with that money, how to you know, prevent this kind of wholesale damage in the future? Obviously, you can't lift the buildings. You, know, you can't change the height of them. But there has to be some precautions that they're suggesting. I'm assuming you guys don't carry flood insurance, do you? Well, uh, that is a little that is undetermined right now. Mm -hmm. Although it is another source, if you will, there is flood insurance on some of those facilities that have been uh, provided under federal sponsorship. Mm -hmm. There's business interrupting insurance, um, and frankly, we're trying to source some insurance expertise to help the members right now as they work their way through some very difficult questions that, frankly, they've never had to deal with before. Mm -hmm. So that piece of it is a very large puzzle. Uh, any kind of relief, uh, that would have to be identified in order to ensure there was not double payment for things in that nature. But I would also come back with all due respect to the issue of that money. We don't know what that money is as we speak. Although there's been approval at the federal level, we do not know what the line items actually contain and, in fact, what might be available to our members. Senator. Neither do we, so don't feel bad. Um, <laughs> finally, there was a huge difference in the way we approached Hurricane Irene last year and this year with respect to orders of evacuation. Uh, so, and I, I, quite frankly, I've not yet gotten an answer at, to, to explain it because Hurricane Sandy was being tracked as a far more dangerous storm, and yet and still the Department of Health made the decision that we didn't need to evacuate. And then at the last minute, they said go ahead and evacuate, potentially placing people in you know, tremendous harm and danger. Has there been any discussions about a future plan on evacuation or, or what would trigger an evacuation order for nursing homes and hospitals? Well, as you point out, I, I believe we, we have a tremendous amount yet to learn. Uh, I would suggest to you that we, we can learn many of those things for our neighboring states or from states that experience disasters on a regular basis. Florida is probably the classic example. There, They seem to have it refined fairly well because they test it three times a year with various hurricanes that they have. Uh, the, the issue with regard to evacuation has haunted my members and operators, and I'm sure Mark would, would elaborate on that. In my prior life, I was an operator for 20 years. And the issue when you have a major event to run the risk of evacuation versus run the risk of shelter in place has dogged us forever. Mm -hmm. I would suggest to you that your commissioner, our commissioner, did a yeoman's job in providing leadership in, the, in that particular area. That particular question will always be second-guessed always be second-guessed. In Irene, you're correct, the order was to evacuate immediately based on the knowledge that they had at the time that it was going to be such of such intensity that ultimately, thankfully, didn't prove true. In the discussions we had as the hurricane was happening, the knowledge they had at the time that perhaps Sandy would not be as bad, and especially in the slosh areas or the beach areas, as you pointed out. And certainly from our particular perspective and our past experience, whether that served us well or not will remain to be seen, we were relieved that initially that the order was not to evacuate. Mm -hmm. Typically, and thank God we didn't experience that, evacuations predictably have a loss of life in institutions. And as an administrator, I'm sure Mark will tell you that's his worst fear. Some things are absolute. When the building cuts, catches fire, you evacuate. Some things are less clear. And I would suggest that the commissioner did a yeoman's job in providing leadership and guidance. Always to be second-guessed, but that's what happens to leaders. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want you to know as you're starting to leave that despite a lot of questions about Sandy, your points of getting a double whammy of a 2% across the board cut with no uh, increases in the trend factor over several years has not gone unheard. And hopefully there's something we can do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh,
Uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Christine Johnston, President of the New York Association of Healthcare Providers. Hello. Get that clock. Good afternoon, Senators and Assembly members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm Christy Johnston, President of the New York State Association of Healthcare Providers. We represent licensed home care services agencies, certified home health agencies, long-term home health care programs throughout New York State. You have the written testimony, um, which has a fair amount of detail, but I think it's important for me to use my few minutes to give you a snapshot, complicated though it may be, of what home care looks like. Could you move that mic closer to you? Okay, great. What home care looks like, let me get that there. After the first two year Medicaid budget cycle and the transitions that have been taking place. I've had the opportunity to listen to the commissioner today and hear a presentation by the, on the budget by the Medicaid director yesterday. And while it's acknowledged that change is difficult based solely on that information, things look pretty good. Um, it appears we've remained under the cap, it, the systems are transitioning, satisfaction is high, and the industry are important stakeholders in this process. So it all makes sense. But these presentations are very difficult for me to reconcile with the reality of what home care providers who are in the midst of massive programmatic reimbursement and environmental changes, the likes of which have never been concurrently experienced before, are facing. The calls and conversations I have are with hardworking, dedicated business people who are trying to make things work despite the challenges of a decade of reimbursement cuts, new reimbursement systems, unfunded wage mandates, hundreds of millions in Medicaid recoupments this past year, costly regulatory mandates, a hurricane, and a rapid push to managed care for a majority of home care services. They are fearful for their workers, their patients, and their businesses. In thinking about how to give you a snapshot of what issues are the most troubling in the budget and how best to ensure ongoing access to care, it became difficult. Because as this transition to managed care evolves and as cuts are implemented, it creates a different reality depending on where you are in the state and the changes which have hit you. Are your patients now in Medicaid managed care? Are they in mandatory managed long-term care? Or are they voluntarily enrolling in managed care? Are you following fee-for-service regulations, managed care guidance, or your managed care contract? Do you have Medicaid reimbursement cuts hitting you, trend factors, 2% cuts? Or are you just working with negotiations with dozens of payers? Or are you doing both? Does wage parity go into effect in March for you or increase in March? And what about all the local living wage laws? You thought home care was complicated before. It is mind boggling now. And if that's confusing for association staff and for <laughs> providers, just think about what this means for the patients and the families out there. But one of the transition realities for providers that is an overwhelming consistency is, is that there is overwhelming inconsistency and there's massive change to manage. And they're doing all of this with no additional resources and in fact shrinking resources. So here's a regional small snapshot. If you have constituents north of Westchester, really all of upstate, they are dealing with changing markets in anticipation of managed care while they are simultaneously being devastated by the relentless reimbursement cuts um, and in the fee-for-service system. These cuts are shutting them down before change can get to them. New York City is well into the managed care transition and providers are still trying to weed through the regulations and the policies. Some are still guaranteed access to business, some are not. Timely payments for managed care is a growing concern there and there is grave concern about paying for the wage parity increase that happens on March 1st. Nassau, Suffolk and Westchester well, right now they're living in both worlds of fee-for-service and managed care, which is transitioning in the next few months. Um, they have local living wage laws, and they have a wage parity law that begins on March 1st. The biggest issue we hear from these providers in these areas is cash flow. Medicaid may not pay adequately to the provider's um, you know, liking, but it pays timely. And right now, managed care does not, and they're trying to figure out how to get from here to there with cash flow. 
The calls coming into our office regarding cash flow and meeting payroll are increasing. The calls regarding how to develop closure plans to transition their patients if they just can't make payroll are growing. The providers ask what's left for us to cut, and they puzzle as to how anyone expects home care to remain a viable option. They note all of the new costs incurred in such a massive transition and how do they make it work, and there really aren't a lot of good answers right now. So what does this budget propose to do and what do we need from the legislature? There are additional cuts and we implore you to figure out how to reinstate the trend factor and eliminate that 2% cut. Wage parity, this budget continues to ignore the costs associated with the home care wage parity mandates and we need to ensure that the increases are funded somehow by someone, whether it's the state, whether it's managed care, it's just ensuring that it happens and it gets to the employers who uh, employ these workers. Cash flow, ideally the state should be investing in home care in this transition and support them through the transition with grant funding, no interest loans, or perhaps even including them in the federal waiver for some funds that may or may not come through that process. But short of that, we are going to need interventions to ensure timely and adequate payments from managed care. Cash flow for this industry is about paying workers and it's about jobs. Also, coordinated efforts to streamline regulations. There are more changes that are occurring daily, but nothing is taken away or modified. So you have the old set of regs, you have new set of regs, you have guidance that supersedes regulations, and it's confusing and it's resource intensive to manage. So we need to relook at regulations and make changes in a timely manner, not years from now. In the end, maybe these Medicaid program changes will make sense. Um, we all try to remain hopeful as we go through this process, but we want to make sure that community-based providers that have been delivering high-quality, cost-effective care in the home for decades survive this change. Home care providers are amazingly resilient, and they're committed to their caregiving mission, but they aren't immune to the barrage of recent years. So we need your help to protect access to care, to protect jobs, and to protect home care. Thank you. Questions? Go ahead. Uh, Senator Rivera. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Ms. Johnson. Um, I'm, I'm reading your, uh, obviously, your, your the, the spoken testimony was much shorter than the much, a lot of detail that we have here, and I'm going over some of it. And I need you to clarify a few things for me, because there's one thing in particular that was not, I don't really understand. The, on the second page, uh, it says the financial impact of recoupment of over $250 million in Medicaid funds over the past year and the harsh penalties imposed by the Department of Health as you're breaking down the challenges uh, that, you, that your industry faces. Could you explain that to me, please? Sure. Um, there was, um, over the course of the past few years, there have been many changes to the fee-for-service Medicaid program where trend factors have been um, eliminated, Familiar. there have been the 1.1 percent reduction. There are all sorts of different things that have affected the fee-for-service Medicaid program. And the uh, calculation of those into real-time rates were delayed because of state, federal, um, state plan amendments. Uh, so providers were being paid incorrectly um, their Medicaid rates for many years. Last year, uh, we had a 2% reduction that happened that had to be caught up. We had all of those rate modifications that were transacted um, at, all at the same time, pretty much. And providers were given the um, requirement to pay back all that was in arrears, the accounts payable on the Medicaid program, within 10 weeks, um, or interest penalties begin to occur as they I'm sorry. pay it. Let, yep. me, let me stop you for a second. So they were there were new, new fees or, or new uh, reimbursement rates that the Department of Health figured out at one point that they needed to recoup. So the recoupment was because it went retroactively? Yep. And this was money that had already been spent on care? Yes. Okay. And it was, and actually the legislature, both houses passed, um, and we appreciated that process, the ability to pay the 
um, to eliminate the interest penalties. Um, that bill ultimately was vetoed last year. And providers have been paying those down. It comes out of their Medicaid checks on a weekly basis. And if they don't pay it back within the 10 weeks, there are additional penalties that they will pay on the tail end of it. So it has really created additional cash flow flow problems um, for these providers while they're going through all these other transition and cost increases. So that's what that reference is. And so as a larger, as the larger point that is made here is obviously that the, that although it seems that your, that your industry agrees that these are changes that need to happen, the, that the speed at which it's happening is having a, a very serious impact on, on whether you're, in, in your case, cash flow. So obviously we're talking about whether you have enough cash on hand mm -hmm. to be able to pay your employees, to be able to provide care, to be able to do all the things that you need to do to continue to function and provide the services. What would you, uh, if, if you had any suggestions about how we might be able to, uh, you know, correctly time some of these things, what would you suggest? Well, I think on the managed long-term care program transition, we have urged it to slow down. Um, we are certainly not trying to stand in the way of the system moving forward, but we're learning what has just happened in New York City. We're still in the middle of that initial transition, so why not slow down a little bit and figure out what is happening and how to give providers enough time to transition to this entirely new way of doing business whereby they are now negotiating contracts with managed care organizations and every single organization is a different type of organization as opposed to working with the counties. Slow it down, give people time to adjust and to work through the process. Um, in terms of cash flow, you know, that becomes very difficult as different mandates are imposed. And in the downstate region, the wage parity law is in effect for home care in New York City. It expands to Nassau, Suffolk, and Westchester on March 1st. Um, there are also local living wage laws, and the providers need to have the reimbursement to be able to make those payments and make sure that those workers are protected. There are other complications with local living wage laws, and I think, you know, we're just trying to figure out how to make sure that the employees are taken care of and the patients are taken care of. So some of it's slowing down. Upstate is being pummeled by the and downstate still, but upstate in particular, have talked about the fact that managed care isn't here yet. You're doing another 2% payment reduction. We have the trend factor elimination. We are still living under that system. So, you know, it's not even a bifurcated system anymore. It's a, you know, it depends on where you sit, what business you do, what patients you serve, how many different Medicaid programs you're operating under, and it becomes very labor intensive. Um, you know, so there's no one-size-fits-all fix, but I think to see additional proposed cuts in this environment is, is devastating. Um, and really also the fact that we have um, a Department of Health that's working very, very hard. You know, we work closely with them and they're working hard to ensure that this works for patients. Um, but then we have a waiver to the federal government that talks about transition to managed long-term care and making it work, and there's nothing invested in home care in there and home care is the underpinnings of, of this new system. So. I'm, sure, I'm sure that you have members in, uh, in, in the city, in the five boroughs, and in the Bronx as well. Mm -hmm. So I would appreciate after, afterwards, let's speak, because I'd like to know the members of your organization that are actually Absolutely. based in my district and happy learn a little bit more about the specific impact that it has on their operations. Absolutely, happy Thank to you. do that. Thank you. That's all, Mr. Chairman. None? Uh, I just, just relax one second. <laughs> How many years have you testified before this committee? would you say? Three or four. Three or four. And I've, I uh, got to know you from some follow-up meetings on some of these issues, and I remember in other years that you were concerned. Uh, I, can, I can feel right now in your voice that you're not concerned, you're distressed, that this is really a critical point. Is that, uh, am I reading you correctly? No, that I this is just not the normal... And the question I, I guess the question I have for you to try to follow this thing up, is there, uh, you mentioned closure of some, some uh, organizations because they just can't keep up with this, and uh, it seems to me if that starts happening, then the cost is going to be astronomically more expensive. Uh, do you have any uh, knowledge of any of the closures that are taking place or are soon to take place? I have some. We've actually talked about that internally. It's, 
it's tough to do a survey of a membership that's so negative, but I think it's time to do that. We learn of um, mergers and acquisitions. They go before the Public Health and Health Planning Council. Um, management agreements are taking place where you have larger organizations. Um, it's the mid-sized organizations that have been around for decades that are problematic. Um, I've had um, half a dozen phone calls um, around the Christmas time where people who have established their businesses and they've been there for 40 some years really frantic. What do we do? Who do we call? How do we fix this? Um, upstate, we um, received a letter that one of our members wrote to Senator Little talking about, we've already shut down one of our branches. We're in a rural area. With these cuts, we get to make the decision, which branch do we now shut down? Do we not serve Saranac Lake or Tupper Lake? What do we do next? And just, um, so we it, can work on trying to hone a bit more data on that. Okay, but as far as uh, assuming a group closes and there's no other home care providers in that area, where do they go? Nursing right. homes? Is well, and to the point up in the North Country, this administrator's point was we have nursing homes that are downsizing and shutting beds over the course of time. And if home care's not there and nursing homes aren't there, where do they go? And that ultimately is, is the big question. Now, you, last question. You mentioned managed care. There aren't any upstate. Is there a time frame? Are the groups starting to form to become management care organization, and what's the timeline on that? There are groups that have already expanded statewide and into the upstate region, and I think markets are beginning to transition. Um, there are target dates, 2014, I believe, um, for the capital region and western New York. I don't have them right off the top of my head, but I think the other piece of the unknown is the department has already said, or it may be sooner if we can establish capacity. So providers can't entirely plan on when their transition is going to happen because here's the target date, but oh wait, we have capacity now, let's flip the switch sooner or later. But so. are, there, are there providers in upstate that are starting to form, rather than having statewide organizations come from other areas, that are, are starting to organize to be part of the managed care system? Yeah, I think that is happening. I think in, in the central New York region it certainly has been talked about um, bringing organizations together to try and establish and keep the community-based providers there rather than having areas from other parts of the state step in. Thank you very much. Let me, let me just make a comment. Thanks. A comment by Senator Hayes. Senator Hanna. DeFrancisco, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically you've got to see the underlying structure of the change that was promulgated by the MRT to home care, which is they shall no longer be freestanding, but must make a contract with the managed long-term care plan so that all of the obligations are looked at by a managed care organization. Basically, what they're saying, and this has been the administration, and it's been something we've had to go along with, um, fundamentally changing home care as it's now known. And uh, it just won't be the same in 12 months, and you're, the stress that the senator picks up in your voice is mirrored by the stress of all of your members throughout the state. It's also what led to my asking the commissioner say we don't have a type of assessment tool that gives us rise to measure the needs of each patient now in home care. So if the transition occurs, we don't know whether they're well served or poorly served right. when the transition occurs. That's fair. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Yep. Uh, Gary Fitzgerald, President Iroquois Healthcare. Is uh, Gary here? Okay, well, we'll put him at the end of the list in case he comes back. Uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, Beverly Grossman for Community Health Care Association of New York State. And if anybody sees Gary, have him wave when he shows up. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today about the governor's budget proposal. My name is Beverly Grossman, and I am the director of policy for Chicanies, the state associations of community, migrant, and homeless health centers. 
As New York's primary care association, Chikini's works closely with more than 60 federally qualified health centers that operate approximately 600 sites across the state. Serving 1.5 million New Yorkers, these FQHCs are central to New York's health care safety net. FQHCs operate in underserved communities across the state and provide health care services to the neediest patients, including homeless persons, migratory and seasonal agricultural workers, and public housing residents. Governor Cuomo has championed the value of community health centers in providing access to high-quality primary care to underserved communities, not only in his previous budgets, but in the state's 1115 waiver to the federal government, which made improved access to primary care the first bucket of initiatives. New York State must continue to for the vision laid out in the MRT waiver, regardless of approval from CMS. While we understand that not all aspects of the MRT waiver can be implemented without federal resources, the state must make every effort to ensure that access to community health centers is retained and expanded. We recognize and support our state leadership in making fundamental health system reforms to reduce costs, improve health status, and quality of care in New York but we are concerned about uncertainties in the executive budget appropriations. The executive budget includes undefined buckets of funding and broadens the authority of the Commissioner of the Department of Health to review, allocate, and change funding after the passage of the budget, leaving decisions regarding the expenditures to, these, to the discretion of the Commissioner without clear timelines or guidance creates significant uncertainty for community providers. Chicanes and FQHC strive to advance the triple aim of better care, improved health, and reduced cost. FQHCs provide high quality and cost effective primary care to anyone seeking care, regardless of insurance status. With this in mind, New York's FQHCs and Chicanes support the following proposals. The executive budget clearly proposes to continue funding at $54.4 million for the DNTC indigent care pool. The DNTC indigent care pool provides funding to health services for services provided to uninsured patients. Though they try hard to ensure that eligible people are enrolled in health insurance, 26% of health center patients are uninsured, and at some centers, more than 50%. Overall, uninsured visits comprise a quarter of the state's FQHC's patients. Successful implementation of health care reform, the Affordable Care Act, and implementation of Medicaid design requires expanded primary care capacity to both care for the influx of newly insured people and ensure a strong safety net for those who remain uninsured. A sufficient and appropriately trained workforce is essential to this transformation. Chikaney supports the portions of the budget that address seven of the MRT workforce scope of practice recommendations, including those aimed at assuring this, that staff are able to work at the top of their license. Community health, center capacity, community health centers' capacity to deliver high quality care to their local communities is closely tied to the health care workforce they employ. As we strive to create a health care system that is more integrated and focused on team-based care, we must move away from solely relying on physicians to deliver care and instead assign roles and responsibilities among health professionals and staff, including physician assistants, nurse practitioners, dental hygienists, and social workers. Although Chikani supports the following items, the governor's budget proposal leaves outstanding questions about the next few items I'm going to discuss. Chikaney strongly supports continued funding at previous fiscal level years for the migrant health care program across New York State. The governor's budget proposal, however, does not clearly fund this program, instead lumping it into a block funding for various programs which the commissioner can decide whether and when such funding becomes available for this purpose. New York State's recruitment and retention programs, Doctors Across New York and Primary Care Service Corps are and have been crucial mechanisms helping underserved communities and facilities with shortages of health care providers to recruit and retain clinical providers. Again, the executive budget proposal does not explicitly provide funding for these programs but seems to leave it up to the commissioner's discretion. 
Cheney strongly supports New York State's efforts towards certificate of need reform. As part of these activities, the executive budget includes the proposal to eliminate CON for primary care where construction does not include substantial changes. However, the executive budget does not include any proposals towards enhancing health planning. The state should work concurrently on CON reform and activities to enhance its support of local health planning initiatives. Collaborations that support combined regional and state level planning efforts will help focus the building of sustainable primary care capacity where it does not currently exist. Finally, FQHCs through New York State experienced significant financial losses due to Hurricane Sandy. An estimate by Chicane showed that 45 New York FQHCs had 168 sites they experienced disruption of operations due to the storm. These disruptions produce substantial losses of revenue and are compounded by repair and replacement costs. According to Chicane's Fiscal Impact Survey, New York State FQHCs experienced over 2.5 million in infrastructure damage, 3.6 in operational losses, and 12.5 million in revenue loss due to site closures, totaling approximately 19 million in financial losses due to Hurricane Sandy. FQHCs need assistance to rebuild from the devastation of Sandy. The absence of recovery funding to FQHCs jeopardizes essential primary care providers in already underserved communities. As we look toward ways of strengthening New York State's emergency response, we must at the same time preserve and support access to comprehensive primary care, particularly in underserved areas. You must ensure adequate funding to cover losses sustained by FQHCs during the hurricane. In closing, primary care and FQHCs are the cornerstone of reform and improved health care for New Yorkers. FQHCs keep people healthy, prevent unnecessary hospitalizations, reduce ER visits, and avoid other high-cost care that drain New York State's Medicaid budget. We proudly serve as the voice for the primary care safety net and federally qualified health centers. We stand ready to work in partnership with other sectors of our complex health care delivery system to do a better job of coordinating care, meeting the needs of New Yorkers while reducing and containing health care costs. I thank you for letting me share our perspective with you. Any questions? Richard Crosby. Oh, I got three. Excuse me while I Not do him again. It, it rhymes. <laughs> um, it's only 2.30. Um, has, has Chicanies examined and taken a position on the, um, the question of phasing out Family Health Plus and not instituting a behavioral, a, a basic health plan? We have not um, taken a position on that. I mean, clearly we've been engaged on conversations around ex the exchange and how to continue um, access, um, but we have not taken a position. Yeah, I, would, I would urge that you check into that, because I, I think it I think it will affect a great many of your patients mm -hmm. and may well uh, create gaps in your in the revenue of uh, uh, of centers. Um, you may want to touch base with uh, with the community service society for some of their research on the subject. We will do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I've just been given word that uh, Gary uh, Fitzgerald uh, had intended to just submit his testimony, so we won't go be going back to him. Now our 12 o'clock speaker is James Klein on behalf of Leading Age New York. And on deck, so you can start moving downward, is uh, Joanne Cunningham. Thank you. Yes. And I know when Senator DeFrancisco starts putting people on deck that the time is uh, short. 
Uh, my testimony uh, is long, but my comments will be, uh, will be brief. Uh, I represent Leading Age New York, which are the not-for-profit long-term care providers in New York State, uh, manage long-term care plans, nursing homes, housing, home care, uh, assisted living, um, the full range of long-term care services. Uh, the first area I want to touch on is uh, the wage parity proposal. Um, as had been previously uh, testified to, there's already a home care wage parity mandate um, that's unfunded. Um, there's language in the governor's uh, proposal dealing with a nursing home uh, wage parity or wage floor proposal. Um, my staff has been briefed on it, and the language that's in the uh, budget does not appear to be what the intent was. Um, uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of time to go through this and have more discussions with, uh, with the department. Um, uh, we're willing to talk about um, funding for workers. That always helps us and stabilizes the workforce. But the pay for workers is not the only thing that affects quality and stability in the uh, in the nursing homes. Um, so uh, we're going to work with the department and the other associations to look at that language, but we clearly cannot support an unfunded uh, mandate. Um, things are already tough enough on the nursing home uh, side. As other people have testified, um, the global cap uh, is becoming a major problem. Um, for example, this year, um, the case mix index, or how sick the people are in nursing homes, has gone up, but the department was concerned that it would drive too much money. So they're talking about holding some of that money back, even though uh, people are uh, sicker and even though nursing homes are under the cap. We think we need to adapt the cap to, to give it a little bit more flexibility so that in each service line, you can make the changes that are necessary to continue to provide care. Uh, they made a good step on the nursing home side in putting in 10 million in new dollars for a quality pool. The problem is the other $50 million that's in there for the quality pool is just out of the base. It's no new money. Um, that's one way you could get new money into nursing homes and actually pay um, for performance, and we're willing to work with the department on that idea. Um, we represent both managed long-term care plans and uh, the providers that contract with them, so you can imagine we have lots of interesting conversations at our association, but there's two things that everybody uh, agrees on. Uh, one is that the rates for the mandatory uh, managed care plans has to be adequate. If there aren't adequate payments made to the managed care plans, the money won't flow down to the providers. And if the uh, things get too tight on the managed care side, and lots of changes are happening, as you've heard, um, when managed care plans go down, the people left holding the bags are the providers. And it's happened in the acute care side where some plans went down. Providers have already provided the care and when there's no reserves left, it's the providers that are left um, having already provided services but receiving no payment. The, the next is the transition issue. Um, we think that the timeline uh, should not necessarily be slowed down, but we think we should stick to the timeline that DOH has laid out. This idea that in some ways if you get two plans upstate, we should go mandatory is really going to divert resources away from downstate, which is just going through the transition right now. Uh, the department has uh, not been able to get the waiver approved for the long-term home health cares to figure out how they're going to be able to participate in it. They haven't had the opportunity to get the regs done to allow the medical model adult day health programs um, to have the hybrid option to participate. So there's lots of work that still has to be done. There's no reason we should be rushing to go mandatory um, upstate. We should just stick to the existing plan and allow downstate to uh, go through and more people to be put in, and it shouldn't affect the, uh, the uh, fiscal assumptions that have been made uh, by the department. On uh, infrastructure in investments, we support the expansion of uh, the ALP program, but it should be for all ALPs and the capital component that they've put forward. Um, we would also support, but not just for the transitional homes. All ALPs should have some capital reimbursement. Now, we strongly support the administration's effort on affordable housing. I know that's another hearing that we'll testify at, but the key component here is to have some services that can be brought into senior housing to allow people to be maintained in affordable subsidized housing. Um, there's money in the budget that's available for that. It just has to be directed to that population. 
Uh, finally, like everybody else who's testified, other than the commissioner, we do not support the lumping of all the programs. Um, it's been tried before. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I tried it before, and um, <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't work then, and hopefully it won't work now. Um, and finally, um, on the issue of the equity investments in health care, um, we think there might be some models to, um, to look at with equity investment in health care but an open-ended idea that we could allow publicly traded uh, corporations to come in and operate um, is not something that we could support. So we believe the lang language on that has to be much tighter so that we could allow maybe some new capital in here, but we do not uh, move to allow publicly traded, uh, the history of publicly traded, um, uh, at least nursing home operations nationally um, is not positive. Um, and there's no reason we would want to go down that road in the long-term care side. Uh, in the acute care side, I'm sure there's some interesting things that people could come up with without having to make the language so broad. And with that, that is my testimony. Um, I appreciate the opportunity and just want to thank Senator DeFrancisco for all your help from last year on the uh, sprinkler funding. Um, we testified last year on that worked with the department and, and got that through, and it's been very helpful to our members. So thank you. Any questions? I just, yes. Senator Hannon. Do you have a um, framework for this uh, proposed transition to managed care for nursing homes? Have you, I know that it's not there yet, but have you come up with a profile as to how you'd like to see it happen, if you have to have it happen? No, we believe that there are too many questions, right? Right now, we understand that they want to move to managed care, but a lot of the questions that we ask about how nursing homes are going to be in, how are they going to do spend down, how are they going to handle the myriad of issues that are special um, to nursing homes, um, we just don't have the answers with the department. Again, we're, we're like many other people, we're not looking to stop um, the managed care necessarily from going forward, but it has to go forward at a pace that allows these questions uh, to be answered. Thank you. Mr. Godfrey. Uh, yeah, on the question of uh, managed long-term care programs, uh, two questions. The governor's budget would lift the cap on the number of MLTCs that can be licensed. Uh, do you have thoughts on that? It, we think that that would be a mistake. The, the biggest problem that happened on the acute care side was there were too many small plans. Um, size actually matters when you're doing uh, an insurance model and uh, bigger plans, there has to be enough choice, but bigger plans tend to be more stable. It was the small plans that ended up going bankrupt on the acute care side. So why we would need more, plus we're not even close to the number that's, that's in right now. And until very recently, all of the MLTCs in the state were provider organized entities. Uh, we are now, I think we now have one insurer sponsored MLTC and there are applications for a lot more. Uh, does that development concern you? Obviously we prefer the provider sponsored model. Uh, they are the dominant players in the field right now. They understand the populations. They have um, the experience in dealing with these populations. Um, I mean, I personally think a lot of insurers are going to be surprised when they pick up this population and, and see who they're dealing with. These, these aren't people who contact the healthcare system, you know, six times a year. These are people who are contacting the healthcare system six times a week, at least, um, and receiving services every day. Um, it's very different than dealing with the acute care uh, mm -hmm. population. So having providers that really have a background in it, uh, I, I, we think is preferable. Again, we're not opposing anybody else coming into the market, but we think people should really think twice about getting into the business. Thank you. You had mentioned the wage parity language doesn't seem to meet its intent. Can you please tell me first what you think the intent is, and secondly, what you think the language says? The, the department had briefed my staff and talked about it being as uh, an attempt to prevent a, a race to the bottom on, on wages and more okay. like a, um, you know, uh, hold harmless, I guess, or, you know, keep wages where they are. Clearly the language does not do that. The language gives the um, Department of Labor the ability to um, set a wage that's related to um, 
you know, some language in the bill talking about uh, the stability of the workforce. Um, and then sanctioned facilities, um, if they don't meet that level, you know, there are some facilities that aren't even going to participate in managed long-term care uh, because that's just not the mix of the population that they have. Um, why would, this seems to be saying everybody has to be involved in managed long-term care, whether they want you or not. Um, but the department, again, in the briefing that I'm getting secondhand, was much more no, we're not. And they also assured us that this was not going to drive any new money. So if it's not driving any new money, then it, maybe it's either not doing anything or it's an unfunded mandate on either us or on the managed long-term care plans. And in either case, that's just something that's not, not helpful in this environment of, you know, five years with, with no increases. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, Joanne Cunningham, Home Care Association on deck, James Lytle, and uh, Anthony Fiore. Okay. You're on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee, for inviting me to testify today. I'm Joanne Cunningham. I'm the president of the Home Care Association of New York State, and we represent home care providers from every corner of New York State, urban, rural, suburban communities, uh, from Long Island to Buffalo to the North Country. Um, today, um, I thought I would give you my written testimony, which includes actually two reports that HCA recently um, conducted. One is actually a plan of three ideas that are very simple that we would offer to you and that will, I will describe that talk about really what home care needs right now and um, ask for your engagement in helping us to accomplish that. That is called our three-point plan um, to help home care providers um, make the transition to the mandatory managed care enrollment. The other report is actually a document that we've been doing for about four years, which is a uh, report on the financial condition of the home care sector, which is also very telling right now, and I'll also dis uh, describe to you some of the highlights. Um, as far as my verbal comments, uh, what I thought I would do first is tell you what's happening right now. And I would associate some of my comments to some of the points made earlier by Christy Johnston, by Jim Klein, as well as Dan Sisto. But right now, home care is undergoing a massive transition. I think that many would argue, and, and some of you on the podium would agree with me, that home care was perhaps the single most affected sector by the MRT uh, redesign efforts. And just ticking off sort of the list of what home care has encountered uh, as a result of the MRT in the past couple of years, about a billion dollars in cuts and reimbursement. Uh, new mandates, including the wage parity law that you've heard, new OMIG mandates, uh, which you've also heard described earlier, a new episodic payment system for the home care sector for shorter term cases, the mandatory enrollment for pretty much everybody else, the elimination of the personal care program, a global cap, the closure of the long-term home health care program and the intent to move those patients into managed long-term care, which hasn't happened yet because CMS has not yet granted the state the authority to close that program. And um, sort of the cream on the cake was uh, lifting the certificate of need process and dramatically changing uh, the landscape with respect to who can participate in the market. So in any one year, one of those things would probably have been a big deal. Um, in one uh, MRT process, we got all of those things. So what has happened as a result? Home care uh, agencies, and this is all documented in the financial condition report, have, um, are struggling fiscally. Many are in fiscal jeopardy. About 80 percent of home care providers have negative operating margins, operating in the red. We've seen a dip from last year to this year of about 12 percent in just one year. We've also seen massive change and a lot of uh, what I would call lack of understanding about how to participate in a new market. Um, since the, the MRT action a couple years ago, there's not really been that much attention to and focus on really the details and the roadmap for how you get a largely, almost exclusively, uh, fee-for-service system into managed care. 
There's been little discussion about the continuity of care for patients and how you're going to map that out for the entire home care population. And really, there's been um, very, very little discussion of the need for regulatory relief that would essentially match a new regulatory structure to our new environment. Um, there's also been a lack of focus on appropriate, what we call transition supports that would help home care move into um, a new system. So all of this has caused confusion, um, as well as closures. We've had long-term home health care programs close. We've had CHAWs close. Um, one of you had asked uh, Senator DeFrancisco, I think, about county CHAWs. I just wrote down the ones I could think of off the top of my head. Herkimer, Ontario, Livingston, Chenango, Madison County, all closed. That's the public health home care safety net in those regions. Another, you know, half dozen are considering closure. Um, this budget puts us in an additional precarious position because we have yet another $200 million in new cuts on the home care sector, which uh, my colleagues from other organizations have talked about. We also have this global cap, which puts the health care sector and home care in particular in a, in a real uh, position of uncertainty and jeopardy. Um, that all spells a lot of chaos in, in the home care delivery system. So for my remainder of time, I guess I would talk about, well, what do we need you to do and how can you help? Well, I think three things you can do would be, would be very welcome and very much urgently needed this year. One is we need fiscal stability in the home care system. We need an end to the pylon of cuts. Um, we need an end to that fiscal uncertainty that is causing agencies to really not even have a, a planning, a strategic planning um, effort in their own agencies because they don't know what tomorrow brings. Um, we also need um, some support, as Jim Klein indicated, for adequate rates for managed long-term care plans. If they don't get the rates they need, there's no way that the, the providers they contract with can also get what they need out of the reimbursement structure in their negotiations with plans. So we need there to be adequate payment for services. And remember, this is a very chronically ill, very vulnerable, daily consumer of health care services population. So these are folks that um, are using health care services on a daily basis, and, and we need to assure that there are rates that are competitive enough to assure that folks can participate in this marketplace. The two other things we need are transition support. So how do we help agencies, which are uh, care coordination experts? These home care agencies have been dealing with chronic populations for decades. They know how to take care of very sick people in their homes. How do we enable them to transition to um, a managed care environment? And we've given you some ideas in our, in our document, but these are things like matching, and, and Senator Hannon, you alluded to this, matching the assessment to, for uh, the home care system, which is from a fee-for-service system to the managed care system. We have a very uneven system right now. How do we assure um, other transitions to make sure that the eligibility standards, the operating standards of these two systems that are now working together, how do we make sure that they can work together to the best of their capacity? And finally, and I guess I would put this in all capital letters, regulatory relief. Uh, Dan Sisto talked about the fact that we have made a massive change in the Medicaid program in New York State. We need a likewise massive change in the regulatory structure in our state. Without it, providers are hamstrung. They cannot effectively, effectively compete in this marketplace unless we get rid of a regulatory structure that matches an old world. Otherwise, it's an anchor. It's a ball and chain that providers have to drag around with them that if your health plan is not very attractive for you to, to, to contract with because you don't want to pay for that. Um, and providers are paying for it because they have no choice, because they are locked into the regs from a prior decade. So we need those three things, and we would ask for the legislature's active engagement in helping us get them quickly. As Dan said, we've got to be nimble. We've got to be quicker than we ever have been if we are going to make this new Medicaid program work effectively and actually save the system dollars. Otherwise, 
Otherwise, we won't be successful in this redesign of our Medicaid program. Um, and finally, and I'm just going to touch on these issues at, um, in my final minute here because you have all raised them at different points during the hearing. One is telehealth. The telehealth program was a priority of this legislature a few years ago. We have the nation's first Medicaid telehealth program. I get calls every day from other states saying, how did you do it? And I talk about the cost savings and readmission rates and others that have been yielded from our telehealth program. Without a transition for telehealth into a managed care environment, we face a cliff because what we're doing is transitioning patients into managed long-term care and their telehealth program through the old system goes away because MLTCs are not getting paid to provide that service. We need to do something about that. Um, we also need to do something about the access issue and the fact that access in certain pockets of the state is drying up. As I mentioned, some of those county agencies are, were the lifeblood, were the, the safety net under the whole system in small communities and rural areas, and that's going away, and we've got we to gotta do something about preserving that. And, and again, we also have to think very consciously about the pace of the transition for many areas of upstate New York because it's not the same as in New York City. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Right on the dot. <laughs> Cam, I'm not so sure if he's a chair or a referee. Have a both, both. Maybe Syracuse needs a better referee. Um, <laughs> A couple of homework assignments. Um, someone from St. John's. Uh, I think we really got to distinguish about the different parts of the long-term care system that you're dealing with. Because you're people, first of all, Senator Rivera is new and we to the health ranker and he's already complaining about the acronyms. And we haven't even hit him with LICSs and CHAs and whatever. But the CHA, the Lombardi, the home care, each have different transition needs, transition monies, rate things. And I think, and you're capable, because you have a very <clears throat> uh, expert organization, of identifying what the costs would be for those types of things, and maybe with uh, Ms. Johnson's organization. But we don't have it as a budget item right now. And we would have to be developing this anew to understand the better parts of what the transition requires mm -hmm. and the transition standards. I did it about the assessment tool because I realized, I said, what are you using for quality report? There, I don't know if home care has had that. And some of the best home care people seem to do it intuitively. They do it well, but I don't see the objective standard. So to the extent you can assist and pinpoint what could be added in, that would be useful. In a similar fashion, uh, as Mr. Klein mentioned, what's the adequacy of the managed long-term care rates? Mm -hmm. Part of the difficulty we have is that, well, because managed long-term care program remain relatively dormant for over a decade, we haven't been watching the rate things, but both the managed long-term care and managed care rates, two different programs, have been assumed by the department entirely, and the legislature is not part of that. Mm -hmm. It's not a good thing because we don't know where the cuts are being made, where quality is being made, and it needs a transparency. So there's, there's a need here in partnership on behalf of the patients to try to do this. Yes, I agree with you. I think that um, we have a lot of ideas on the regulatory side of, of kind of how you unlock the doors for the, the home care programs, whether it's the CHA or the Lombardi. Um, it, we have very specific examples and, and given those ideas to the department. Um, and I would say on the rates, um, you know, one of the issues is you're now taking prior, the MLTC program was a voluntary program. Well, now it's mandatory, so they're going to get all the risk. So when you get everybody in there, you've got to make sure that they are getting the rates they need. Otherwise, um, you're, you're setting them up to fail. Um, and, and we need to, you know, put the smart people in the room and make sure that we do that with, you know, all the actuarial evidence and so forth. Um, and we would love to work with the legislature in doing that. That's it. Yeah. Could you just 
say again to the point you were making about telehealth? Sure. Um, the telehealth program is right now a Medicaid reimbursed telehealth program, which the legislature, in fact, you and Senator Hannon championed um, a few years back, and it really has been a landmark uh, national model for how to use innovation uh, using telehealth with a chronic Medicaid population. We actually sent you a report a couple of months ago um, that, that identifies actual dollar, millions of dollars in cost savings in avoided readmissions related to the use of telehealth. Well, what happens when a patient who is transitioning into an MLTC from a fee-for-service structure where they had telehealth into an MLTC? The MLTC is getting a rate that, um, that you know, presumably covers all the cost of their care. They may not decide to because they're not getting reimbursement for it to even use telehealth, or they may not be convinced that telehealth is a good um, is a good opportunity area and a good clinical tool to use. Which you know we're seeing kind of a mixed reaction um, in managed care generally's embracement of telehealth. Some think it's wonderful, and some say, you know, I'm not convinced of the evidence. So what happens is um, without some sort of mechanism to encourage and, and promote the use of telehealth, you know, providers are going to face a cliff where the patient will actually be disenrolled from the telehealth on the fee-for-service side when they get to manage long-term care. While I still have you, I just want to also publicly thank you, Chairman Gottfried, for your leadership. Um, in your hearing in December in New York City that focused on the transition to manage long-term care. I think that was a wonderful discussion about some of the issues that I've raised and others have raised about this transition, and I, I really applaud you for, for jumping on that back um, at the close of last year, so thank you. Well, th thank you, but just back on the telehealth sure. question, is there something in particular that you would urge us or suggest to us that we do to try to encourage MLTCs to use telehealth? Well, I think ideally you would want to keep telehealth as a, um, as a reimbursable um, service under the Medicaid program. That would be the easiest way to make sure that you don't see a drop off in the use of it. Um, at some point, I'm mean, going to Senator Hannon's point about, um, you know, the rates, you would want to make sure that you build in um, a rate that, that could support the provision of telehealth. But I think the, the urgency Meaning is... Meaning the rate that the state pays to the MLTC? Yes. Okay. Uh, but I think we have to be very purposeful about um, doing that. Otherwise, I think we're going to waste three years or four years or it's probably been five years of the experience of growing the use of the telehealth program in New York State in the Medicaid population, which I don't think we want to do. Thank you. Hi. Um, Senator Krieger, I'm announcing myself because Senator DeFrancisco had to leave for a second. So a few years ago, much of the discussion about where New York State was going um, with all these different categories of home care, and I admit I don't understand all the letters either. <laughs> Apparently Kim Hannon's the only one, and perhaps Dick Gottfried. Um, but a lot of the discussion was that there was incredible variables in what providers ended up paying for the direct service workers as a percentage of the overall fees they were getting from yes. government. So I was looking through the survey materials that you have on your providers, and I, I don't see anything that reflects that. I no, think. no. Um, I mean, that was, you know, a, sort of an artifact of, you know, being billed as a fee-for-service system. Um, but, yeah, there was variation, and that had to do with, you know, the acuity level of patients and, you know, basically how the fee-for-service structure was created. And, you know, I'm not sure what has happened in the transition to that variability. I will say that um, home care has been constricting generally and, and really in New York City, and I think someone needs to 
um, you know, the health department or others probably really look at what's been happening because utilization of home care has changed. Now maybe it's been a good change and maybe we needed that uh, and maybe we've become more efficient, uh, but maybe there are patient populations out there not getting services and I think the personal care program is one area where, um, you know, I'd like to know more about what has happened in the transition. Um, we went from a program that New York State created very purposefully to um, assigning personal care as a benefit under under a, a managed care structure. Well, you know, what difference has that made? Um, have we seen spikes in other services? Are patients um, seeking care in other levels um, as a result? You know, is emergency room use up in that patient population? You know, what's really happened? And in following up on your list of the counties where the CHAWS closed, mm -hmm. what do we know? What has substituted for that function? Um, in some of the counties, we've seen other sort of larger players go in. Um, you know, I think some of the anecdotal evidence is or discussion is that um, some of those larger players are not really fulfilling the same kind of safety net role that um, those county agencies have provided. On, in some instances, when the county agency has closed, the health department has actually stepped in and said, somebody's got to fill this void. We need, you know, an agency in a neighboring <coughs> community to come in, um, you know, which has, has, you know, tried to fill some of that gap. But I also think that more needs to be learned about where are those patients is everybody getting services or are we uh, seeing, you know, spikes in other service levels, nursing home beds, um, our patients, um, you know, where are they going? Where are they getting services? And, you know, I'm not sure that that data is available yet, but I think it would paint an interesting uh, story. And when you say Department of Health slides in, is that county DOHs or the state? No, no, I would say uh, DOH here, which, you know, of course has, you know, all the data um, that they could, you know, take a, a look at that. I mean, mm -hmm. I know they're very stretched and have a lot, uh, you know, to juggle on their plate, and I'm sure they would love to, you know, slice and dice all this data all day long and, and don't really have the resources to do that. Um, so, I mean, part of the struggle here is that we're dealing with so much change um, and yet, you know, the agencies, including the Department of Health, have, have been downsizing, um, you know, in reflection of, you know, the economic issues as well. And that's really probably hurt their capacity to fully understand some of these changes. Thank you. Uh, yes, just the telehealth. Senator Young and uh, Assemblywoman Gunther, rural resource chairs, uh, we had a whole hearing on this mm -hmm. last year. The revelation was that we, even without the transition, we have the structure for the Medicaid rate for telehealth. We actually have some provisions for telemedicine, mm -hmm. and we're underutilizing it to an incredible degree. I think there was less than 20,000 claims under the Medicaid telehealth, um, mm -hmm. the, the prior, whatever the last reporting period was. So there's a, there's a whole need to emphasize this and figure out how we use this as mm -hmm. part of our non-hospital long-term care structure. And then we could start better doing it for putting into rates and things like that. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think that we've seen sort of a nice steady uptick, but I think there are certainly regions of the state that probably could use more telehealth that, you know, haven't ramped up to that capacity. I mean, one of the struggles is all of that um, innovation for an agency to start a telehealth program, that's all sort of their internal capital expense and planning that, you know, they kind of layer on top of everything else. So a lot of agencies have uh, been limited in their capacity to do innovations like, um, you know, starting a telehealth program. I mean, HCA actually does a, a lot of training um, bringing kind of best practices into our members to encourage uh, the proliferation of more telehealth, but you know it's a struggle, and pe people are really strapped, and you know it's a tough time. So, um, you know we need to do the best we can and keep pushing it out there. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> the next speakers are James L uh, Lytle and uh, Anthony Anthony Fiore, New York State Managed Long Term Care. Uh, and PACE Coalition. 
You're not. You're one or the other. I just. Uh, it's just going to be uh, Jim Lytle at okay. this point. Mr. Fiore is going to be uh, testifying on behalf of another client in a few moments. Okay. Great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I will be very brief. I do represent uh, the 18 provider-sponsored, not-for-profit, managed long-term care and PACE plans that um, we helped convene a number of years ago. Um, uh, these plans, 18 of them now, uh, enroll approximately 91 percent of the nearly 75,000 individuals now in New York State who are enrolled in managed long-term care. Uh, Senator Hannon and Assemblyman Gottfried are the parents of this program um, that are, is now celebrating roughly its 15th birthday in that troubled adolescent period, I guess. But I am proud to report that a report card was issued, as any good parent would be interested in, uh, by the Department of Health. This is one report, Senator, that the uh, Department of Health actually has um, produced. Um, <laughs> The report indicates that 90 percent of the enrollees who have enrolled in managed long-term care plans uh, have actually seen their functional abilities in areas of uh, activities of daily living like bathing and dressing and ambulatory ability uh, either stabilized or improved during the course of their enrollment in the plan. Um, Eighty-seven percent are now able to manage their own medication. Only 2 percent uh, in this most recent report had been admitted to a nursing home in the last period that was studied. Only 8 percent were admitted to hospitals. And of that 2 percent admitted to nursing homes, the, the, uh, two-thirds of them were uh, discharged back to home after a rehabilitation stay. Um, uh, the rest of the numbers I've indicated um, in, in the written testimony. So we're very proud of the record that the managed long-term care uh, plans have undertaken. We also understand there was a time, uh, as the Senator just put it, as Senator Hannon just put it, uh, in which it seemed as if the program was in limbo, not being, uh, not very much attention paid to it, it quietly existing without much scrutiny. We may at times have thought it would be a good thing to be a little bit more in the, uh, under the spotlight. There were times during the last year where maybe that didn't seem like such a good idea. Um, but in any event, uh, we understand the very serious concerns that provider, uh, providers uh, consumers, their family members, and others have uh, had about this mandatory transition. The plans themselves have faced uh, a huge challenge in the course of the last several months as this mandatory enrollment process has taken place. We believe, and I thought um, from at least uh, what I gathered from uh, Assemblyman Gottfried's hearing, uh, that while there are still some very serious concerns about how well this is going, that for the most part we believe that process of moving to a mandatory enrollment um, uh, system in New York City uh, has, notwithstanding a hurricane, notwithstanding a lot of confusion and difficulty throughout all of it, has actually proceeded um, successfully. Um, very gratified to hear Mr. Klein, Ms. Johnson, and Ms. Cunningham speak about the need for adequate rates for managed long-term care plans, and we obviously uh, appreciate and, and share that concern. Um, we're particularly concerned that the rate-making process that the department has implemented has been very slow. Um, there were supposed to be new rates established last April in 2012. They weren't actually issued until uh, December. There were supposed to be adjustments to those rates uh, that were to be issued in July to deal with the mandatory population that was being enrolled, um, and those still have not been issued. Um, so the timeliness of the rate-making process, almost as much as the adequacy, is, um, is extremely important. The budget proposes a quality incentive plan for managed long-term care plans, uh, which is appreciated, certainly, since it's at least uh, ostensibly uh, going to be new money and not uh, taken from um, some other pocket. Um, the, we're very concerned, however, that we develop appropriate metrics for this quality incentive. Um, as has been observed uh, by Senator Hannon, because this rate-making process, including this quality incentive uh, program, is not something for which the administration is looking for any legislative authorization. Uh, your help in either uh, engaging with the department on what the parameters of that quality program might be um, and helping to implement it successfully would be very much appreciated. Uh, there are a number of issues uh, that I think could also improve the program. Uh, we've heard uh, just now about telehealth and telemedicine, and I think it's certainly something we'd be prepared to um, work with the department and you on addressing whether uh, there's some approach that could be taken. As I understand it, certainly on the Medicaid managed care side, 
um, on the acute care side, but uh, to some extent on the managed long-term care side. I believe there are plans that have, in fact, uh, encouraged and utilized telehealth uh, where appropriate. Part of the issue on the managed long-term care side, however, is that some of the services that might be rendered are, are, are to supplant services that aren't actually in our benefit package. And we'd have to think through how and in what areas telehealth would, would make the most sense on the managed long-term care side. Uh, likewise, hospice services has been something that has been a somewhat of a disconnect between managed long-term care and hospice, where someone who may be in a managed long-term care plan who uh, uh, opted to seek hospice services has been forced to disenroll from the managed long-term care plan. I think the department is agreeable to the notion that that shouldn't be necessary. Um, I've seen language and policy and contract that would reflect that change in policy, but I, I'm not sure that's been implemented yet, and we would uh, certainly encourage that to be done. Um, just the last couple of points. There's a proposal also not in le legislative language, but uh, administratively the department wishes to uh, implement a, an ombudsman program for managed long-term care. Um, we welcome any approach that's going to make it easier for uh, enrollees and their families to navigate through this system and to understand better um, what managed long-term care offers and to address any issues that may arise. The only concern we have is that we have uh, elaborate set of other rules and procedures that govern uh, the relationship between plans and enrollees, including grievance procedures, internal appeals processes, external appeals processes, fair hearing proceedings. And it's important that how, whatever the role of the ombudsman is, that it be consistent with and uh, work effectively with and not uh, duplicate those other um, avenues for appeal. Finally, we are um, very interested and eager to work with the department on the implementation of, just to add one more acronym for Senator Rivera, the, the new FIDA program, uh, fully integrated duals advantage program. Um, and uh, this is a program which the department has uh, advanced which would unite Medicaid and Medicare and uh, provide the full array of services for uh, persons uh, who are duly eligible in a coordinated care environment. Um, there are a lot of details to be worked out in that regard and we, we certainly welcome uh, the legislature's involvement in helping us work those through. I should make one final comment about the proposal to lift the numbers of managed long-term care plans uh, uh, and, and to get rid of what is now a 75 plan cap. Um, as Senate, as uh, not Senator Klein, but Mr. Klein observed, um, I, I don't, I'm not sure we need um, uh, an unlimited number of plans. Uh, I, we don't necessarily object to limiting, uh, to lifting the cap. I think in the end of the day, um, there is going to be a lot fewer than um, uh, 75 plans that will be in operation in New York providing managed long-term care services to what might be estimated to be at most around 200,000 uh, enrollees who might be eligible throughout the state. What we are concerned about, and, and, and we obviously, because our coalition represents only not-for-profit, provider-sponsored plans in this arena, we are um, strongly committed to the notion that provider sponsorship is helpful in addressing the unique needs of this population. And, and we would be concerned uh, if this field became dominated by for-profit um, plans, and, uh, and we're hoping that that will not be the case. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Senator Kruger. Thank you. We heard earlier today from people who said there's, um, there's no model for this upstate New York. And I guess, do you know, A, is that true and why? Well, there are quite a number of plans that were already operating in New York, in, in upstate New York, and, and, and over the last six months or so, uh, substantially more expanding into upstate New York. So there, and there have, they, it's traditionally been PACE programs upstate New York, which is a, a variant on the model, but that's part of the same idea. Uh, relatively s small numbers of enrollees. Um, you know, we uh, believe that the model works uh, upstate and downstate, and there's an, and some of the larger uh, plans within our coalition are expanding to upstate New York. Um, we believe it can work. Uh, we understand there's concern about the timetable um, and certainly appreciate and would be happy to have further conversations about how it should be implemented. I, I think uh, Mr. Klein's point was let's just have the timetable that has been announced 
which I think we would agree with, rather than uh, trying to move it uh, any more quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker, Antonia Lazicki, Association for Community Living, to be followed by Elizabeth Deers. Good afternoon. And thank you so much for your stamina. Um, my testimony today will be so simple that it will really give you a rest, number one. Uh, there won't be one acronym. The bad news is that it will be so short that it won't give you much of a rest. So um, I represent the Association for Community Living, 115 not-for-profit providers that provide services to people with serious and persistent mental illnesses. They do rehabilitation services, housing, um, rehabilitation ser services in housing programs. Um, they do unlicensed housing, supported housing, and a lot of other services specifically for that population. Normally I testify at the Mental Hygiene Committee, which I will do again this year, and many of the provider issues that you've heard today are also concerns of ours, but I'm going to reserve all of that for the Mental Hygiene Committee, and that's why it'll be so simple here. I really come today just to represent the housing community to ask you to support the supportive housing proposal in the health budget. That's the 90 plus million dollars that is reserved for um, new supportive housing in the state of New York. As you probably all know, people with um, special needs and particularly people who are high users of Medicaid often cannot afford housing in New York State. New York State has very high housing costs. Um, they often use emergency rooms, hospitalizations um, as, a, as a way to stay warm in the winter. Uh, many people are stuck in hospitals and other institutions because there's no place for them to go. There's no place that they can afford to go. So we're just, we just think that it's a very good use of some of the savings to put it into housing. This housing will be specifically reserved for people who are high users of Medicaid. Hopefully that will reduce readmissions, emergency room use, get people out of hospitals sooner. And uh, we just ask for your support. Many of my housing colleagues will be testifying at the Housing Committee and special needs colleagues will be at the Mental Hygiene Committee, and so they're not able to be here today because we're often asked to only testify at one committee hearing. So um, that's it. I told you it'd be simple. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Elizabeth Deers, Medical Society of the State of New York, followed by Gwen Lancaster and Sally Dreslin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm joined by my colleague, Mo Morris Oster. Um, on behalf of our president, Robert Hughes, uh, and the almost 25,000 physicians, residents, and students statewide that we represent, I'd like to thank you for providing us with the opportunity to present to you today. Uh, from uh, the onset, uh, we must state our um, serious concerns about the economic and patient care consequences regarding some of the proposals in the governor's proposed budget, as well as one that's not included in the document. Independent private practice physician practices are ranked second in the number of total business establishes in New York State, employing well over 700,000 people statewide. And yet their businesses are threatened by rising overhead expenses and shrinking revenue. The proposed budget fails to take action to address one of our largest non-salary expenses, the cost of medical liability premium, and actually operates to threaten the extent of coverage many physicians currently maintain. Additionally, as it relates to quality of care, the budget includes a proposal which will operate to negate system-wide changes now being implemented to enhance integrated care coordination among primary care physicians and their specialist colleagues. So I'm going to just touch on three issues. First, our disappointment with regard to um, the inclusion of no medical liability premium relief um, proposals. While liability premium for most physicians in New York have increased by as much as 80 percent since 2003, um, premium for physicians in other states have significantly decreased. Two years ago, the governor proposed a budget that included meaningful tort reform. Uh, which included a cap on pain and suffering and a MIF at the Medical Indemnity Fund. The final budget had the MIF only. The MIF resulted in a reduction by as much as 20 percent of hospital premiums, but nothing for physicians. Now, I'm not calling for a cap on pain and suffering, not because that wouldn't provide meaningful relief, but because it's politically imprudent to do so. 
What I'm asking for is your consideration for modest incremental reforms to lessen the cost burden shouldered by physicians and enhance quality of care. Now, exacerbating the medical liability cost burden for physicians is the proposed uh, changes to the excess liability insurance program. Uh, the governor proposes to reduce the appropriation for an already underfunded program by $12.7 million and severely limits eligibility for physicians by requiring emergency room care provided in emergency departments and participation in the Medicaid program. For anyone who needs who wants the site, it's located on page 201, line 10. While the proposal is um, intended to assure eligibility for high-risk physicians, um, it actually op will operate, we fear, to deter uh, the provision of on-call services. Um, we've spoken to many physicians who currently provide on-call care um, in safety net hospitals and downstate communities, and they provide care um, to Medica the Medicaid beneficiary population. They simply don't bill for the services. So now to make a, a conditional requirement for uh, eligibility for the excess, participation in the Medicaid program, um, it's not, it's not, they just don't feel that they can, they can do that. So this coverage um, is particularly, though, important for physicians, the 25,000 or so physicians who have traditionally received that coverage, as well as physicians who are new to practice. So we look forward to hopefully working with you to make some changes to the proposed language in the Article 7. The last issue that I'd like to discuss today um, concerns language which would allow um, uh, publicly <coughs> traded corporations to operate limited service uh, clinics in big box stores such as Target or retail pharmacies such as CVS or Walgreens. It, frankly, all of medicine finds this proposal counterintuitive to the direction the state has taken to integrate health care providers uh, so to facilitate coordinated care delivery, whether it's patient-centered medical homes, which we've invested a large amount of mo our money in, in uh, achieving, or uh, ACOs. Now, there, I have a couple of studies uh, cited in the uh, testimony which demonstrate that um, retail clinics have less continuity of care for their patients and that they have found it noteworthy that a large fraction of patients at retail clinics continue to report that they have no primary care physician. Retail clinics um, are not the most appropriate venue to provide care for the chronically ill, the elderly, or the pediatric population who all need the type of care coordination found in physician practice, not in a retail clinic. Um, we think that there's a potential conflict of interest posed by for-profit chain ownership of retail clinics. We have in place self-referral prohibitions, anti-kickback protections, which apply to physicians, but no similar protections would exist uh, and apply to retail clinics. I, I guess to summarize, we feel very strongly that the retail clinic diverge model diverges from the integrated care coordinated delivery model a health uh, policymakers believe will rein in costs and improve outcome. Rather than bending the cost continuum, retail clinics will increase cost and negatively impact on the quality of care. We're happy to entertain questions. Questions? No? Any? Uh, there we go. So you're answering a question I asked one other speaker, and that is, it would, the plan that the governor has in the budget would exclude certain physicians from getting excess coverage, even though in the past they've always had it. Yes, sir. And unless, unless you participate in Medicaid uh, and provide uh, emergency, emergency care. room care, you wouldn't be uh, covered. So that's one bad part. And the other part, as we talked about uh, before, it would encourage physicians who are doing emergency room care not to do it. Correct. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah. That's okay. a fair assessment. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I just, I just wanted to make sure you know that I understood what you told me before. Thank you. I appreciate right. it. And following up on what you said, Senator, the proposal for having the excess on the high risk really is, to my mind, the beginning of a death spiral mm -hmm. because you'd start to focus on the worst risks, which would have the highest payout, which would start to eat into whatever is left in the pool. 
So it, the whole concept of insurance is spreading the risk, not just limiting it to the worst risks. So I don't think it's conceived with a good idea. Great. We agree. Thank you very much. Next speaker are the, is the New York State Nurses Association, Gwen Lancaster and Sally Dreslin. On deck is Craig Burridge. Good afternoon. My name is Gwen Lancaster. I'm a nurse at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital Center in New York City. I am also a member of the New York State Nurses Association Board of Directors. Joining me today is Bernie Mulligan, the Director of Political and Community Organizing, and Sally Dreslin, Associate Director of Policy at the Nurses Association. On behalf of our members and the patients that we serve, we appreciate the opportunity to address the governor's 2013-2014 executive budget proposal as it relates to our health and Medicaid. The written testimony we've provided is more detailed than the remarks that I will make today. I encourage you to review the full testimony for a comprehensive presentation of our positions. Our members are concerned as we see healthcare across the state and country becoming more corporate with profits put before patients. The closings, downsizing, and service consolidations for all of, are all a reflection of this. The loss of healthcare services and jobs in economically string, struggling areas of the state were worsened by Sandy, as we all know. The task before us is to advocate for a budget that meets the needs of the communities and the patients we serve, that protects the public sector and safety net hospitals. The proposed changes in the certificate of need process are presented in full in our written testimony, will have profound long-term effects on health care in our state. Our working bedside nurses see these issues every day in human terms as they fight for patients and fight for safe nursing uh, ratios. In 1989, in fact, uh, St. Luke's Roosevelt went on strike for safe staffing ratios. I was one of those nurses that was on the line, so I remember firsthand. The same fight for our patients continues today. Safe staffing is an imperative because research shows that safe nursing staffing saves lives, improves patient outcomes, and saves hospitals and nursing homes money by decreasing staff turnover and by decreasing facility acquired infections, avoidable hospital readmissions, and avoidable adverse events, including death and malpractice suits. Nurse staffing should no longer be thought of only as an expense on the balance sheet, but as a revenue generator that can help facilities avoid penalties and earn reimbursements, reimbursement bonuses. We urge you in your one house budget legislation to include language that requires minimum nurse to, to patient ratios in hospitals and minimum hours of care in nursing homes. In recent years, federal, state, and health care reforms have focused on advancing the triple aim of better care, better health, and lower costs. But provisions that the governor has proposed sacrifice better care and better health for the possibility of lowering short-term costs and the probability of increasing long-term costs. The provisions that I'm referring to are those related to certificate of need, the health care business corporation pilot program, home health aides, the tobacco control program, and the indigent care pool and disproportionate share hospital payments. In New York, New York State is in the midst of redesigning the certificate of need process. When taken in their totality, are gravely concerning to the nurses. We believe the redesign will make it easier for large private hospitals and hospital chains or systems to cut health services in the already underserved communities 
and shift the burden to caring for patients who rely on these services to our state's already extended public and community hospitals. We are also concerned that a reduction in the scope of certificate of need review and oversight of large segments of the healthcare industry will have three principal effects. They will weaken the accountability of hospitals and providers to the communities they serve, will limit access to quality health care services, and will effectively silence community and patient voices. The Nurses Association urges you to reject the provisions that exempt primary care from public need review during the certificate of need process that will re reduce the, the look back, excuse me, look back and the extent and character of the competence review. The Nurses Association is deeply concerned about another one of the governor's budget proposals that we believe is a dramatic negative impact on the delivery of health care in Brooklyn and across New York. The proposal allows for the establishment of a pilot program to assist in restructuring of health care delivery systems by allowing for increased capital investment in health care facilities. This will be accomplished through the establishment of two business corporations, one in Brooklyn and one in another part of the state. Experience has shown that profit maximizing models of health care delivery does not work for patients or communities. This model has a well established track record of sacrificing quality patient care for profit. We strongly encourage the legislature to reject this dangerous proposal. The governor has proposed allowing health care, health, home health aids, excuse me, administer medications and perform functions that are within the scope of practice of nurses. NISNA cannot support proposals that circumvent the Nurse Practice Act and allow unlicensed assisted personnel to administer medications or would permit them to provide nursing level services to patients in the home setting. We ask the legislature to reject the governor's proposals that expand the range of services provided by home health aides. In line with our mission to protect patients and the public's health, we urge the legislature to directly and fully fund the tobacco control program at $85 million, the level that maximized its ability to accomplish its, its mission. As an organization deeply committed to the underserved and to public hospitals, Neisner urges the legislature to include language to address the indigent care and disproportionate share hospitals fund, language that will maximize the amount of fun, fed funding to the state received to support care for the uninsured and Medicaid patients. We also, in, we also ask that you include provisions to ensure that the most funding goes to the hospitals that actually provide that care to the uninsured and Medicaid patients. And finally, we urge you to increase the pace of transition of the state's disbursement methodology. Despite our serious concerns regarding many of the governor's budget proposals, there are some provisions that we do support. The temporary operator provi provision incorporated in the certificate of need amends its amendments is supported by the Nurses Association. We view, this we view this provision as a safety line to protect our patients from ineffective, unscrupulous operators who jeopardize our, our ability as nurses to provide safe patient care, a scenario we are unfortunately too familiar with. We urge you to maintain that proposal. We applaud the governor for supporting education to registered nurses. Healthcare reform creates more demand for RNs. We urge the legislature to accept those proposals and continue to support essential work of educating registered nurses in New York. The governor's bu budget also includes language that would eliminate the written collaborative practice agreement and practice protocol requirements for primary care nurse practitioners. We urge the legislature to extend this sound judgment to all nurse practitioners. The executive budget proposal has recognized the importance of well-educated and well-trained nurse workforce in another provision. It includes language that would require contracts with nursing homes to make certain that resources are available in the contracts to provide sufficient compensation to workforce 
and ensure the retention of a qualified workforce. We encourage the legislature to accept the government's proposal, the governor, excuse me. In conclusion, as you continue your deliberations, we urge you to pass the budget that will ensure access to quality health care of New York's residents, putting patients before profits by protecting and supporting safety net providers, careful community supported growth and adjustments in services, and the trained and qualified health care workforce these patients need. Nurses are determined to achieve the adoption of minimum nurse to patient staffing ratios in New York's hospitals and minimum hours of care in nursing homes because we know from documented research that our lived experience have shown us the investments will save lives, reduce adverse outcomes, and save health care facilities in New York State money. We're going to continue our work to fix New York's health care crisis and to build back a better system that provides quality care to all, and we look forward to working with the legislature. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Kruger. Uh, thank you very much. You covered many, many topics, um, but one that you raised that I don't think came up yet today, in fact, just the opposite, you urged um, putting the money into patient care over profits. I think we would all agree. But if you sat here and listened to all the other trade groups who came representing organizations, one would believe we have cut so much money out of the systems that there can't possibly be any profit. So I'm wondering, do you have any research or any specific data around the, um, the examples that you raised there? About? I believe we provided you some with the, the full written about the staffing. About um, the what, I'm sorry? Maybe I, I misunderstood the question. Um, so you, make, you urge that um, the funds be used for services, not for profit. Right. Leading one to believe we think, you think that there is a significant profit margin being taken out of government funds through some types of services, and I'm wondering what you, where you think that is. Um, I, all I can do is give you an example of what happened at St. Luke's where I personally work. When Sandy hit, okay, we all knew that there was a crisis and things needed to be done and needed to be done quickly. All right, so New York Hospital closed and Bellevue Hospital. So we were in a, a crisis. We had to close beds for uh, behavioral health. Certain behavioral health beds were closed. The pediatric services were closed in an effort to take those patients in. However, when the crisis was over, they never returned those beds. To this day, the pediatric beds are still closed with the intent of either Mount Sinai Hospital coming in and taking over the whole hospital or for them to rent out the space to other, other facilities, which means that the whole side, west side of uh, Manhattan, up where I am, from Presbyterian down to St. Luke, uh, Saint, not St. Luke's, Roosevelt on 57th Street, I'm sorry, there are no pediatric services there except for the emergency room at St. Luke's. To this day, the peds stays closed, and they do not give us a reason as to why, except for the fact that they say it was not profitable. And some of the other examples that we're considering, when you look at the, um, some of the certificate of need proposals as well as the pilot project in Brooklyn, the um, concept of what Mr. Sisto referred to as an economic model over a social model and having those as sort of the primary driving uh, factors in decision making. If you review the language for the pilot project, there are a certain set of criteria that those business corporations um, are to follow when they decide on what actions to take. And the top one is the survival of the corporation, the second is the shareholders, and then moves on down and patients are well down that list. So there's a sense that there's a different focus on how we want to deliver the care and that's where our concern is. And Senator, I'd like to add that um, we checked. Thank you. Um, after the commissioner mentioned this morning that Ascension and um, Vanguard were two models that he was looking at, we had a preliminary discussion with our colleagues in Boston and Detroit, the two cities that the commissioner mentioned. And uh, 
the nurses in those communities and the community forces feel that those were not positive experiences for those communities. So I think some of the companies that we're looking at coming into New York State are potentially problematic. And just for me to understand, so a, a CON process must be gone through both for expanding services and reducing services in a hospital changes. setting? Right. Significant changes has to go through the certif certificate of need. The community needs to be uh, brought into to up to speed, so to speak. In this case with St. Luke's Roosevelt, there was none. Nothing was said to the community. It was done in the dark of night. So St. Luke's hasn't officially said they're not reopening. They're just they not have told, those. I'll be honest with you, they haven't given us anything in writing. However, the, to this day, the, the unit remains closed. One unit or two, I think you mentioned? There are two units. Um, actually, one was moved from St. Luke's to Roosevelt, and now that, that unit is vacant so that they can take patients from another facility. The other unit is the PEDS unit that was closed. Pediatric patients are being moved to other facilities like Presbyterian or other, other places. If they come in, they're not being admitted. They're going down to Roosevelt, but there's no space at Roosevelt. There is no actual pediatric unit at Roosevelt. These patients are getting shifted all over the place, and the unit is still closed. Because at least it was my recollection that when we closed St. Vincent's, I mean, not we personally, but when St. Vincent's closed in the village, that there was the expectation of certain services being available at St. Luke's Roosevelt since there's nothing really south of St. Vincent and mm -hmm. you're the only thing north until you hit Morningside yeah. Heights. There is no trauma center south of uh, Presbyterian if St. Luke's doesn't maintain its, uh, its status as a trauma center. But moving, the cent the, moving things around, I believe the pediatrics was essential to that status. I can't be sure, I can't give you that as a, as a fact. It's only my personal uh, opinion. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot my question, I'm sorry. That's all right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. From the woman, Deborah Glick. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions about the issue of home health aides uh, administering medications. Have you had any conversations with the executive about whether or not um, who does the training, who would do uh, the oversight? Uh, since you are licensed professionals, uh, if there is an error, what is your liability? What's your, uh, are, are you actually the supervisor? Can you, uh, would you be able to say, I don't think this person is capable? Those are all really good questions. Our main concern with it is the way that it's worded. It circumvents the Nurse Practice Act, and which could jeopardize patient safety. Medications require more than just handing out a pill. You need to assess the patients appropriately. I think your questions are right on, and they're the same questions that we had through the MRT process, which is how, how is this going to be managed it, it, exactly as Ms. Lane You have to move the microphone closer. You're sort Sorry. of. Your questions are right on, <laughs> um, and they are the same questions that we asked during the, the MRT process. It's our understanding that in some fashion the, the commissioner would craft the regulations. Um, who would be responsible? To what extent would nurses be responsible for what's going on in the home when the nurses aren't there? As you'll remember in the last couple of years, the time period between pre-pours was expanded from seven days to ten days, and these are medications that wouldn't even be pre-poured. These are, as, according to the language in here, these would be medications that are um, reasonably easy to assess the dose or something to that extent. I don't have the exact words. So there's a hugely broad range, particularly the fact that we're potentially considering directing and non-self-directing patients who would not be able to assist. So these could be people who are on things like blood thinners. Absolutely. Yes. They're considered routine medications with what was in the statute, so people take it daily at 5 o'clock. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone on this side? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pharmacy Society of New York State, Craig Burridge followed by Pat Wang of the Coalition of Public Health Plans.
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. And, um, I thank the committee for allowing us to speak again, I think my 19th time <laughs> in a row. Um, this is probably the smallest uh, written report I've ever turned in, but we will have, we've only have five uh, subjects we're gonna, I'm going to touch on this afternoon. Uh, we will follow up with additional information um, as we uh, come to you during our, our two lobby days here in Albany. Uh, as far as the governor's budget goes, uh, we did find uh, something that, uh, again, another cut for pharmacy. Um, they're moving on brand drugs. They're cutting another 0.6% from AWP minus 17, AWP minus 16. And I'm just saying this, uh, this is something we've been used to. It's been happening uh, frequently over the last 14 years. But I want to just do one little math issue with you. We were told from Mr. Helgerson that the reason they did this was because they looked at, um, they looked at the private sector or Medicaid managed care average contracts for their pharmacy networks and it came out to 17.6%. And once again, uh, they use fuzzy math because the issue is you and I in the private sector have to pay our co-pays. If it's $20 for a generic drug, we have to pay the $20. Medicaid does not and often does not. It's typically almost zero collection rate in New York City. And our pharmacists, I mean, they know they're dealing with uh, the poorest of the poor. They don't have it. If you're on multiple drugs, a 350 for a brand drug times eight drugs, it's, it's, un, it's, they just can't handle it. So what happens is if you take a $200 drug, a pharmacy in New York averages about a 19.6% average. If they pay their bills to their wholesaler on time, pay cash within 15 days, they average 19.6% average off that AWP. So a $200 drug, they'll purchase at about $160.80. AWP minus 17.6 is $164 reimbursement and 80 cent reimbursement. That leaves $4 gross margin. From that $4, before you get paid, Medicaid removes the $3.50 copay. So your gross margin is 50 cents. Doesn't pay for the label they put on the, on the container. If they do not pay it, and it's approximately a little greater than 80% of the time, they do not receive the copay. So just to kind of bring this to your attention as to, you know, anybody who runs a small business, you can't work on a 50% gross profit. Now, we had a 2007 uh, survey done, cost of dispensing done by uh, a couple national uh, groups. Of, and in 2007, it cost $10.80 for a pharmacist to hand you the bag. Nothing to do with the drug cost inside, just to hand you the bag. That was their cost of dispensing. Medicaid just finished the cost of dispensing um, last, uh, late uh, last year, as well as an average acquisition cost, which took our pharmacists about 80 hours to fill out, to upload this information on 12,000 drugs. They had to give them all their discounts per drug and everything. We're expecting that that cost of dispensing, and we hope you will put their feet to the fire to publish this, because they, they're kind of wishy-washy on where they're going to, it's going to be around $15. Uh, and if they drop us down to acquisi actual acquisition costs, that $160.80, and they don't get anywhere near that, um, doors will be slamming. All they're already closing. Pharmacies are closing now. More than 40% of our independents are more than 60 days behind paying their wholesalers, and we have dozens of them who are being sued by their wholesalers because they can't pay them. Moving on, uh, another thing that, another initiative, I always thought of initiative as something positive, but in this case it's not, is they have in the budget to save money by having a single uh, supplier of incontinence products, adult diapers, stuff like that. We tried this before. I've been around long enough. We did this during the Pataki administration. It failed miserably. If you look at uh, an average adult, uh, you know, if they have an extra large 60, that's a 10-day supply, 60 uh, diapers. Uh, they're about the size of a small refrigerator. Now, typically how they're delivered today is the pharmacy provides free delivery. They're bringing their medications, and if they, and they need incontinence products, they bring it with them. Shipping costs on this is just ridiculous. To have a single vendor try to ship these incontinence supplies all over the state of New York, it's not cost effective. And if they put them on auto, uh, auto shipping like we've seen with mail order drugs, you're going to have absolute waste where people really don't need them. And, uh, they end up. The other thing, too, is they don't stay long outside. If you're in an apartment building, you drop off drugs or diapers and the person isn't there to sign for it, like our pharmacists are required by the LMA to get their signature, they're gone. They're, they disappear. Uh, we've had this ha issue happen uh, with Medicaid managed care, and I'll go into that uh, uh, on the next subject. But that's where we are in those two initiatives. 
One of the biggest things that has really caused us concern, and certainly uh, our patients, is that pharmacy benefit managers who, who pharmacies process your claims through, there's two large ones left. They have about 80 percent of the prescriptions they, they process. They decided to, you passed the AMO law, anti-mandatory mail order law and insurance law about two years ago. You also put a no mandatory mail order in Medicaid managed care. As of October 1st, when Medicaid managed care and three million people shifted over, the letters were in the mail. You know, we had 23,000 letters go out to HIV patients who were supposed to not even be included. Hep C patients. We had an issue with a patient who showed up, you know, they box them in, you have five days to get your drugs filled at your local pharmacy, or else it's too soon filled, and it can't, the pharmacy can't process the claim. Patient shows up, hepatitis C, two day supply. Absolutely cannot miss the dosage. The person who's been keeping um, safe and healthy, they were told at the counter by the pharmacy up on the screen, you must get this by mail. It's a Medicaid managed care. He called up, they shipped it out, it was delivered to his house, no coordination, no phone calls like they get from the local pharmacy to make sure they're there. It was left at his door and it was stolen, a $23,000 drug, stolen because it was leaning against his door. His neighbor knew it was delivered, he never signed for it. He went 30 days without his medications. He came back to his local pharmacy because he didn't get another shipment, took that local pharmacist four days to get them to do an override so that he can give this patient his hep C drugs. Well, the outcome of this didn't turn out too good. This patient had his test done, his drugs are no longer working. And his physician has actually filed uh, a, he's in a lawsuit with us against the state on this issue. Um, he's got to tell this patient if you don't get a transplant, you're going to die. This is happening. We have dozens and dozens coming in every single week because PBMs decided to call regular maintenance medications that our pharmacists have been providing to these patients, private sector and in and, and Medicaid, for decades. They've been providing them, keeping them healthy. And because PBMs come in and decide to call it specialty drugs, which, by the way, is not defined in state law or federal law, it, there's no such thing as specialty drugs. It was the special services provided by the local pharmacists where they trained their, their staffs in disease states such as we've had this happen now with transplant patients. Can you imagine you paid a million dollars to have someone get a liver transplant and now they can't get their meds because they have to get them by mail. So this is what's going on. This is what's on the streets. And this is why we went to court last October. We got to stay. And that's when we found out that they've been doing this since last October came out in court, uh, the Department of Health officials. This is not going to be cost effective. Uh, in the long run, it's going to drive up costs for the managed care. Now, I don't blame the managed care companies. They, they feel like they're just as much a hostage to PBMs as we are, pharmacy benefit managers, because they're so large they say, look at, you know, they determine our, you know, what our, um, uh, you know, what our list, drug lists are going to be. They're the ones that make the determinations. We really don't have a say, and they're probably correct. Um, and so, an issue we need to look at, I, I'm, unfortunately, um, Assembly and Gofford isn't here, but one of the things we're looking at is transparency. Um, uh, you know, Senator DeFrancisco, and Sir, we had an issue in upstate New York with the school district uh, in which they were in mandatory mail order. Again, PBM, bad behavior, as we refer to it. And he, here's why you have to have transparency. We, we got it passed, I think, five years in a row in the Assembly, but not in the Senate. But here's why you need it. This school district was paying for four years contract, $333.81 for 90 simvastatin. That's a statin drug, generic, and a $16 copay by the teacher. $350 every quarter. Simvastatin costs $7 for a bottle of 100. One of our, our pharmacists in the area managed to get into that contract because he knew people on the school board for the last year of that contract and almost fell off his chair when he saw the spreads on the generics. This is where the money is. Rebates, brand drugs are going off patent by the end of 2016. Every innovator drug would have lost its patent. So they looked at this and said, you've got to follow the money, folks. Can you imagine a drug costs $7 for 100 They're charging 350 bucks every quarter. We moved them into a transparent PBM. Now the, the copay is 
whether 90-day mail or 90-day retail, it's a $20 copay. And guess what? The school pays zero for those 90 cents then. The copay covers it. And I can give you a list, list after all these different generics. What they're doing is they only do these spreads on the top 20% of generics. And the reason they do that is because that 20% are 80% of all generics dispensed in the country. So they can go into court and say, look, Your Honor, 80% of these drugs, we have no spreads. That's not where the money is. They're not ones being dispensed. So we really need to look at transparency. You can save, probably just on generics alone, in excess of a billion dollars a year in New York State. It's about a 25% average spread that we have found. And in some cases, um, Part D program, a generic drug being billed at $400. The pharmacy was paid $12. PBM kept the rest. So moving on, from, we also had the other issue, too, is privacy of our patients. Uh, you're not only going to move on, you're going to move out, I think. So if you quickly go through the last couple points, I'd appreciate it. Oh, last thing, then, I'll get off the PBMs. We can talk about them uh, more privately. The other thing is uh, expansion of uh, vaccines to pharmacists that uh, Chairman Glick had spoke about earlier. Um, it was very, I think it was very successful. We did about a million uh, flu vaccines last year. We think we're going to hit about two million this year. We have 8,600 pharmacists certified to immunize in the state, and they have to continue to be certified in their CPR every three years, bloodborne, and uh, every three years they get updated training on that. So that is expanding. We hope to have about 8,700 by the end of this year, or we should have had about 8,700 by the end of this year. The other thing is expanding role, and this goes to other areas of savings and what the physicians were talking about, losing their, um, their um, highly regarded employees. I've had doctors call me all the time. You know, they say, Craig, I can give pharmacists 100 of my patients because they know they can read, they can manage their disease state. Eighty-three percent of our expenditures are on chronic diseases, chronic drugs. Di doctors diagnose, that's their expertise, and they could set up the treatment, and they should turn the patients over to the pharmacist, and then there could be reporting back and forth. The issue there is it allows, because doctors are capitated. He said, you know, I could take on 100 patients at $65 a month capitation, and then turn them over as I get them situated and, and you know, set up and titrate every, turn them over to the pharmacy. I know they can read those clinical lab reports and stuff, and then they can work back and forth on the collaborative thing. This is where the money's going to be saved. And I'm going to just finish up by saying the reason we need to do this, with the ACA kicking in in 2014, you're going to be adding about a million and a half people. Here's what we are facing. Going forward, we're facing a crisis of opposites. By 2020, we're going to have 30% less general practitioners, yet we're going to have about six, an increase of about 60% of people over the age of 65. What are we going to do with them? Who's going to care for them? Who's going to manage their chronic diseases? And we think having 4,200 4, retail pharmacies out there working with the physicians hand in hand to allow them to see more patients, to diagnose, to get them out there, let the pharmacists work with them to manage the disease through drug therapy. And if we can do that, I think we can save a whole lot of money because there's incentives built in for the docs as well. If they keep these patients healthy and out of nursing homes and hospitals, they get higher reimbursements. Questions? Senator Kruger. Thank you. I think I'm a little confused about the difference between a PBM and a mail order house. Because in your testimony on page four, you're actually talking about the PBMs steering to their wholly owned mail order facility. So are they different? Yeah, pharmacy role? benefit managers own their own um, mail order facilities uh, out of state. Typically, Missouri, Arizona, Texas, Arizona, Florida have the largest facilities. We used to have them years ago. Um, and what they do is, uh, you know, a pharmacist has to get paid through the PBM. Well, the PBM is looking for anybody with a maintenance medication that they can do 90-day supplies, and they call up the doctors, they try to get them to, th you know, they tell them they're the patient's pharmacist, even high school kids working for them say they're the patient's pharmacist, and they get them to send the prescription to them. Or they have them call an 800 number. You know, you fill eight prescriptions and the, you go to get paid, and the patient's told to call the 800 number, they go home and they're trying to talk them into going to mail order. Or they do what they did with Medicaid Managed Care. They sent them a letter and saying, you take this drug, this drug, and this drug. Now, how is that for privacy? Uh, if someone in your household opened up that letter and Mr. you're... Mr. Burns, uh, the basic question, though, is while some PBMs own mail order, 
and use them, they started out being different. They're not, yes, they one is not identical being to the other. Processors, claims processors, yes. And then as they grew, they compete with their own networks. And there's still probably 100 PBMs in the world, and maybe two of them are the biggest, but the other, and 80 percent, and the other 20 percent are about 98 different PBMs. Yeah, that, I, I would say correct? that uh, CVS Caremark and with the Medco merger with ESI, they're about 80 percent of yeah, pharmacies. But there's a number of others that unions will use or other ent companies will use. <clears throat> there are those that do try to be transparent, and we do um, list those because I do a training program for HR people. and. Uh, unions, I've worked with trust, union trust, to help them save money. Um, one particular union in the city, we took them out of mandatory mail order in 08 and saved them over $45 million net. Savings. And so if I can, Senator Hannon helped clarify the question. Mm -hmm. So for me, when you're talking about the Simvastatin example, um, that so if you're a managed care provider or NYSHIP for, for state workers, um, going into contract deals, you're saying that, or a school district, they can't know what the wholesale versus retail markup on this is for the people participating? No, um, when they ask what the pharmacy is being paid, reimbursed, they're told it's proprietary information. And that, you know, so the PBM won't give them that information, that's why we want transparency, because the pharmacy knows it gets paid. But there's gag orders, for example, in a pharmacy's contract, the fact that this pharmacist went to the school district risked being thrown out of one of the largest PBM's networks, which would have put him out of business, he and his 50 employees. So uh, it, it's a, it was a very gutsy thing for him to do that, but we got some really good information on that. And you talk about New York State doesn't regulate any of this. Are there other states with model regulations that you would like us to look at? There are some national model regulations that we've, we've passed around uh, uh, out of Washington that have, other states have adopted. Um, you know, it also has to do with fair, fair audits uh, instead of just sending a letter saying, you know, we overpaid you four years ago, $360,000, you know, cut us a check. I mean, this is with no paperwork, nothing. Uh, I mean, so there, there are things you can do, but the big thing is transparency. And I think it's getting the payers to know um, that, you know, these are some of the tricks of the trade that they do. The uh, generics, again, follow the money. That's where the market's going. They saw that back in 03 when it started with all the brands coming off patent. And I actually got an inside look at some of the books on one of the big PBMs and, and saw that their net profits from retained rebates actually matched their net profits from spreads and generics. So that kind of caused us to look into the Part D program when that came up and we found huge spreads. Uh, without taking up more of our time today, I would certainly love for you to follow up with me on model legislation that is out there. We'll absolutely do that for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, one question. You obviously would uh, be happy with an, a continuing expansion of uh, vaccinations uh, at pharmacies, uh, but as I had mentioned um, earlier, there is, the, when I spoke with the commissioner, there is this issue that many health plans do not cover vaccinations and you only can get coverage in um, at a doctor or a nurse practitioner. Has the society uh, made any effort to uh, talk to health plans regarding the issue of reimbursement for patients? Mm -hmm. Uh, we have, and we, we've had some great success, mostly in upstate, uh, certainly with uh, IHA out in Buffalo and Blue Cross Blue Shield Western New York. Um, we've had, uh, with MVP, I think a lot of it was switching over their systems to allow a pharmacy to bill for a vaccine, which is typically in their medical bucket, I guess you would call it. Uh, the issue with the herpes, her, herpes uh, zoster, uh, which is a huge issue, um, with Medicare Part D pays for it, but only pharmacies can bill for it because physicians can't bill Medicare Part D. And so that was an issue, um, and we're still getting plans. I know in the New York City area, it's, it's a lot tougher where they're saying, no, that, that's a medical expense and we're not going to let you bill us. So, you know, you, what we do is the, the pharmacy pr pretty much makes arrangements with their local physicians to deliver under dry ice. I mean, it has to be kept... Um, very, very cold because it dissolves very quickly and uh, it has to be administered within 30 minutes. So it really, they have to find a local pharmacy to provide them. It's not an inexpensive drug to have, uh, you know, and I think a single dose costs 
$165. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's it. Ex oh, go ahead. My, there? Uh, thank you for that. There's very little that I disagree with that you just testified to. Um, can you expand upon, we were talking, you were talking about how the PBMs will go to the doctors, the patient's doctors, and convince them to have their patients switch to the PBM. Are there any restrictions within that, the doctor-PBM relationship? And if, if not, how would you, uh, do you have any recommendations? Well, I think in the beginning, they, they, that was one of the methods they used right in the beginning. They fooled doctors by sending fax faxes saying you need to approve this like a prior authorization when in fact the prior authorization when they faxed it back turned out to be a 90-day supply of the drug and then once you get somebody in Medicaid you know in, in um, mail order try to stop it we have horror stories where people have to cancel their credit cards because they keep sending um, drugs uh, you know even though they stopped that therapy so you know I don't again doctors are very upset about that um, uh, and but to have someone call them up and say that they're the farm you know they're pharmacists now they just use letters. They basically tell patients, you have no choice. Uh, in fact, we have a tape recorder. We're going to uh, provide um, committee members with a couple of recordings that we have of patients trying to get their coverage from a um, PBM uh, and being told that you have no rights. We, are, we just have to get the, we're bleep, beeping out names and so that we can keep the patient's uh, health records private. But you'll hear the entire conversations between them and, and the arrogance is just, in fact, we have a letter from uh, one of the large PBMs. They basically said they don't, they are not regulated by New York State insurance laws or social services law, which have the no mandatory mail order clauses. Okay. And we'll and, give you a copy of that as well. And just an observation, uh, you testified that, you know, we have to keep the pa patient healthy through drug therapy, which I do agree with, but I think that conversation should also include uh, fail first policies of the pharmaceutical com of the insurance companies. Uh, yeah, step-up therapy is, is sure. being used. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, you said the assembly did a bill on transparency. Assembly um, in Godfrey has placed a bill in. I think four or five years in a row. Still has. He's he's got it back in again. Do you remember the? Well, can you get to my office the bill number, please? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Again. Just so you know, we did have a roundtable uh, this past September with, uh, with uh, Chairman Gottfried as well as former uh, Chairman uh, Morelli uh, on this uh, very issue, and uh, we're Great. hoping to push it forward. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Pat Wang, Coalition of Public Health Plans. The following speaker is just submitting that Scott uh, Armin, Armin, so he will not be testifying. Anthony Caputo will be next after this gentleman. Go I, right ahead. I, I am not Pat Wong, as you likely know. I am Anthony well, you Fiore. Could have been. You could have been. <laughs> I could have been. Yeah. Um, but I am here testifying on behalf of the Coalition of New York State Public Health Plans. Um, and who might you be so she could get your name on the record? Pardon me? Did you mention your name? Sure, Anthony Fiore. Thank you. Um, the coalition represents uh, 10 plans throughout the state, about 2.8 million uh, Medicaid, Family Health Plus, and Child Health Plus beneficiaries. Uh, these 10 plans are the nonprofit provider sponsored plans in the state. Um, most of them have been serving this population for 20 plus years, and so they're deeply rooted here in New York and New York's provider community. Um, uh, today, we just have a couple points, and I, I promise to be quick, that we want to uh, comment on the budget and a couple other initiatives that are going on with respect to the Medicaid redesign team. As has been mentioned by a number of speakers, uh, the healthcare dynamic here in New York right now is incredible. Uh, the change of pace is remarkable, and the plans are doing their best um, to work with the provider community and the Department of Health through all these transitions. Um, over the past year, we've moved a number of um, difficult to serve populations into the Medicaid managed care program. Uh, this includes the homeless, low birth weight babies, uh, people in the CDPAP program, uh, among others. Um, and these transitions are not easy. Um, they require a lot of planning and coordination among the plans, uh, consumers, the Department of Health, um, and the providers. Um, but I have to tell you, um, despite all these transitions, both populations and benefits, um, and despite the aggressive timelines, uh, the intensive logistical and technical uh, preparations, and 
a whole slew of administrative hurdles that these plans have to jump through. Um, the implementation has been fairly smooth, and there haven't been any widespread disruptions uh, in New York's Medicaid managed care program. So despite all these transitions, um, you know, there's still some work that we can be doing with you and with the state to ensure that folks on Medicaid are getting the, the benefits they need in the right care in the right setting. Um, to that end, the coalition is quite supportive um, of the executive's proposal to eliminate, eliminate the prescriber prevails policy on the atypical antipsychotic drug class. Um, prior to implementation of this policy, which is, is just fairly recent, um, there really wasn't much evidence of any interference by plans to prevent people with mental illness from obtaining their appropriate medications. Now, recognizing that, the plans in the coalition are very committed to working with the prescribers, the consumers, providers, and advocates to make sure that any policies that are implemented um, around, making, that around this population um, make sure that they have access to the appropriate medications um, and that they have access to them in a very timely manner. Um, we, as my colleague Jim Lytle mentioned earlier, we would also very much encourage you to support the adoption of the FIDA program, uh, not to be uh, confused with the FIDO program. Um, and uh, we do believe that the integration of the Medicare and Medicaid benefits for, for some of New York's uh, most frail uh, will provide um, some significant uh, advantages and outcomes for the population. <coughs> the plans in our coalition currently actually serve 77,000 people um, in these dual plans. So there are many beneficiaries in the state that are already benefiting from an integrated Medicaid and Medicare product. Um, and that includes, you know, robust provider networks, member services support, quality oversight, and other advantages. Um, so we believe that the experience that these plans have in serving that population, we can build on that in the FIDA program uh, and to, and to um, improve the outcomes for the beneficiaries that are served. Um, and the final thing I'll mention on the Medicaid redesign is we're, we're now entering a new frontier of also integrating the behavioral health benefit. Um, and cooperation with all of you and the state will be critical as we move this benefit and the population into Medicaid managed care. This is a new frontier for these plans. Um, and they recognize that the complexity and cost of covering these individuals is difficult and are prepared, though, to develop these models to appropriately uh, provide access to care and um, hopefully in a cost-efficient manner. And this means um, access to social services, affordable housing, um, you know, making sure that they have access to the right mental health, behavioral health, substance abuse benefits, making sure the benefit packages are right, network requirements and the coordination with health homes and other sorts of care managers are in place so that this population um, is appropriately served. Now, with respect to the health benefit exchange and the Medicaid expansion, it hasn't been mentioned a, a lot today, but it is an important priority for these plans. Um, we are very supportive of the state's efforts to, to um, advance and implement a health benefit exchange. We're equally supportive of the Medicaid expansion. Uh, our rough estimates are about 76,000 childless adults between incomes of 100 and 133 percent. We will now get access to care as a result of the Medicaid expansion. Um, but uh, Chairman Godfrey mentioned this earlier. We are uh, somewhat concerned about the Family Health Plus phase out that the governor has proposed. Um, as you probably are aware, the governor has proposed um, ending Family Health Plus enrollment in December 2013 and transitioning those current beneficiaries over 133 percent to um, subsidized coverage in the exchange. Um, now, for those beneficiaries um, that are from uh, that are. Uh, that, Excuse me. So for the executive further proposes um, that they provide a wraparound financial assistance to those current beneficiaries between 133 and 150. So that essentially means we'll use some state dollars to help them purchase coverage um, in the exchange. And so we, we like that proposal. We commend the governor for that proposal. The problem with that proposal, frankly, um, is that there will be Medicaid beneficiaries that will exceed that 133 percent cap, and they won't get that same access to the financial assistance. Or there may be beneficiaries that lose a job, they may be making over 150 percent now, but are now at 145, and they won't get access to that, to that financial assistance. And so what we would propose that you do is actually have that RAP coverage cover all people between 133 and 150 percent of the federal poverty level, not just people who are enrolled today. Um, an alternative to this um, actually is the creation of a basic health program, something I know that's been mentioned earlier. We think that's a natural progression of the Family Health Plus program um, and would provide affordable and comprehensive coverage to many individuals who fall below the 200 percent of the federal poverty level. 
Um, New York could also save some money, we believe, there and also improves the continuity of coverage between our Medicaid, the basic health program, and the exchange. So we look forward to working with you, working with the Department and the Governor as this budget proposes, uh, proposal moves forward, and I'm welcome, uh, happy to answer any questions. I have some. Uh, Senator Hannon. Um, for the record, you support the, th the proposals of the administration, but I'd also just want to point out that each of your plans depends on rates set by the administration. Is that they correct? are. Yeah, okay. I mean, they're, I did That's not right. speak to. You're some of my best friends. <laughs> I just want to put it in the record. <laughs> I, I figured a number of uh, my colleagues here mentioned adequate rate setting already, so I didn't need to talk about it today. So, um, But it's one of the things that used to be in the legislative statute, and now it's we gave it over to the department, so we lose sight of it. Prescriber prevails. Um, to the extent I asked the commissioner, to the extent that I ask also you, each of the plans, for data you have on that, if we are to listen to your conclusions that everybody's treating well and it's a complicated subject and it's a complicated treatment um, and no one's really suffering, I'd like to see what data you have. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, may well, not have enough. The FIDA program, mm -hmm. I know you endorse it, but it's not final yet. It's not. And it's very hard to start endorsing and ratifying things that are not final, as is the behavioral mental health. We don't have final and I think we're now two years past the MRT. Uh, we should really be looking for a lot more uh, definite type of shape to these pr these programs. And um, and in the wraparound, let me just ask you one thing about sure. the, the, the transition to Family Health Plus. And I may be mistaken on this, but this is why I ask you to correct. You're talking about make available to all between 133 and 150, not just those currently enrolled. Correct. That's correct. But as I understand, anybody at 133 and above would be eligible for insurance through the exchange that would be federally subsidized. That's correct. So if, if above 133 up to 400, there are subsidies and tax credits that individuals can access through the exchange. What we're saying is that people between 133 and 150, those subsidies and tax credits are not going to be enough. And we believe that those people will just not going to be enough for what? For them to purchase coverage on the exchange. Thank so you. The, the wrap would allow them to now bridge I that get, gap. Now I get your point. Yeah, exactly. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Anthony Caputo, Consumer Directed Personal Assistance, followed by Renee uh, Nagels. Timothy, Timmy Courier. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman DeFrancisco and all the other members of the Senate and Assembly. My name is Anthony Caputo, President of the Consumer Directed Personal Assistance Association of New York State, and I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, the Consumer Directed Personal Assistance Program has seen tremendous growth over the number uh, of years uh, because of its programmatic advantages. CDPA is different from traditional community-based long-term care in that it gives primary control of the everyday operation of the service to the consumer or their designated representative instead of an agency. The consumer is responsible to recruit, hire, fire, train, schedule, and supervise, and if necessary, terminate the worker of their choice. This level of control provides the consumer with a degree of independence that more traditional models can match. Excuse me. The stenographer is really, really good, but she can't get it this fast, I don't think. Oh. So slow down. You don't have to read it all. You know your topic. We got it here. We can read. Okay. If you wouldn't mind just kind of summarizing it in your 10 minutes. Okay. 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 I'm going to summarize it. Um, the consumer takes responsibility for understanding how tasks should be completed as well as scheduling their workers and maintaining a backup plan. In a traditional medical model, these responsibilities would be performed by an agency, RN, caseworker, or administrator at a much higher cost to Medicaid. We, as fiscal intermediaries, are uh, present in order to handle the paperwork, process the payroll, remit payroll taxes, and secure insurances, including workers' comp, unemployment, disability, and it's, uh, for some of us, uh, providing health insurance and even pension plans and maintaining uh, records for audit purposes. In November, the state moved CDPA from fee-for-service Medicaid to managed care and began the transition of dual eligible recipients, those in both Medicaid and Medicare, to managed long-term care. CDPAN has embraced this transition. However, as the shift becomes reality, some changes are proving more difficult than others. 
We must commend the department and specifically Mr. Helgerson and his staff for having worked diligently to help ensure that the plans implement CDPA in a manner that honors the model's unique nature and allows for consumers to remain independent. However, concerns remain. This is particularly true when we discuss fiscal intermediary's ability to continue to provide reimbursement to workers at a level that allows consumers to attract and retain their workers. I refer to our program as a win-win-win-win program. Um, consumers remain independent. Unskilled workers are employed that otherwise may not be employed. Many of the fiscal intermediaries provide health benefits to these workers. Uh, eliminating the requirement for these workers to obtain uh, health insurance through state-sponsored health insurance programs, and all of this at a lower cost to Medicaid. Um, in his budget, the governor proposes to require a living wage for all nursing home workers in the state. We strongly endorse provisions that require services to be reimbursed by the health plans to be sufficient to attract and retain a high quality and qualified workforce, and we propose that this provision be expanded to the CDPA program. CDPA consumers are concerned about their ability to continue to attract and retain a high quality workforce. While the home care industry historically has a high turnover rate, with home health aides in New York City experiencing an annual turnover of 40 to 60 percent, our consumer-directed personal assistance program has much different results. Once our consumers identify a worker they work well with, relationships will last often 20 to 30 years. At my fiscal intermediary concepts of independence, which served as a model for the state law, we provide health insurance and retirement benefits. This consistency accounts for the high level of care that consumers can receive in the consumer-directed personal assistance program and the high success of the model. However, as managed care is introduced, Downward pressure will be, exert, uh, will be exerted on salaries. Workers in the living wage counties such as Nassau, New York City, Suffolk, and Westchester stand to be most affected. When the legislature first implemented mandatory managed care and managed long-term care, it took the step of enacting wage parity provisions for home care and personal care workers in these counties. However, personal assistance and CDPA were not included in these wage parity provisions. However, because fiscal intermediaries contracted with these counties, workers have historically benefited from the local living wage statutes. For example, without any protections in place, workers in Nassau County who have been receiving wages and benefits of over $14 an hour may see their wages reduced by almost $5. This reduction in salaries will come as the remainder of the long-term care workforce in these counties see their wages protected or increased because of the wage parity laws. Our workforce will see that they can work for a traditional agency included in the law and earn significantly more money, often for doing less since skill tasks will not be involved. Consumers will face increased difficulty attracting high quality workers. This will seriously disrupt the care that our consumers receive and their ability to use the model to stay out of institutions. The viability of CDPA as an option for consumers will be threatened since, the model that cannot, <laughs> since a model that cannot attract workers cannot sustain itself. Therefore, I stand before you today asking you to extend the wage parity provisions in the living wage law counties to CDPA, ensuring workers have the basic salary protections as the rest of the industry and protecting consumers and their workers. Furthermore, CDPA strongly recommends that language requiring compensation from plans be sufficient to guarantee a high quality workforce be incorporated in the wage parity law as well. While adequate reimbursement is critical to the ongoing su success of consumer-directed personal assistance, timely reimbursement is also critical. Over the years, the legislature has seen fit to protect providers from unnecessary delays in insurance company reimbursement through the passage of prompt pay laws that set clear requirements not only, uh, not only regarding submissions but the length of time that insurance companies have to pay for these claims. Because CDPA has always been solely a Medicaid fee-for-service program, fiscal intermediaries were never considered when prompt pay laws were discussed. It is now necessary for us to request such inclusion. We cannot exist in managed care and managed long-term care without standing on the same legal ground that every other entity does. Without legal protections, we face tremendous liabilities in the event that a health plan is forced to declare bankruptcy or when reserves are low, chooses to pay a provider included in the prompt pay law rather than a CDPA agency that is not included. For the shift to Medicaid managed care and managed long-term care to be successful, all organizations must exist on an equal playing field in, in front of the managed care companies. Therefore, we, in order to guarantee the success of this initiative, we strongly request that FIs operating a consumer-directed program be afforded the same legal protections as all others in 3224A and 3224B of the insurance law. 
Next, the governor proposes to eliminate the cap of, 70, uh, the cap of 75 uh, for a number of managed care plans around the state. Uh, the burden of this growth on both consumers and providers is difficult. Consumers are trying to make decisions about which plan to choose when a large number of plans have no history. Providers are trying to, take, uh, uh, trying to contract with new plans that themselves, the plans, do not have all of their internal systems in place. Sini Panis recognizes the need to allow for growth in the marketplace. However, the system must have checks in place. Only seven more counties are scheduled to enter mandatory managed long-term care before the next state fiscal year. There's no need for dramatic expansion of MLTCs at this point in time. Therefore, we urge the legislature to leave the cap on the number of MLTCs in place until the system can absorb the current influx of new plans. We also would like to draw the committee's attention to one critical matter that would dramatically impact our ability to, to survive without corresponding action from Medicaid. All of our workers receive well over the minimum wage. However, the overtime rules for home care workers and personal assistance in CDPA are not based on time and a half of their base pay rate, but time and a half for minimum wage. An increase in the minimum wage will increase workers for, for overtime hours to levels above what is their current pay rate. While we would welcome this change, it is unsustainable without a corresponding rate change for Medicaid. Uh, therefore, if a minimum wage increase is to occur, the Medicaid system must um, accommodate this and allow for higher agency reimbursement. As consumers tr transition to manage long-term care, there will be a strong need for them to have resources available for individual and systematic advocacy. Therefore, we endorse uh, the governor's proposal for an ombudsman, um, ombudsman program and urge its implementation as soon as possible. We share the concerns of other organizations when it comes to consumers' rights under managed long-term care. Uh, therefore, we endorse um, um, uh, C.D. Panny stands with other advocates in urging the legislature to actively intervene and strengthen consumers' rights with managed long-term care plans by ensuring access to aid continuing and a right to fair hearing as a first resort rather than a last resort. The governor's budget also takes steps to put in place provisions for several, dem several demonstration programs that have been in development. The Fully Integrated Duals Advantage Program, or FIDA, is a complex program that will eventually seek to merge all of the healthcare needs of consumers in Medicaid and Medicare into one system. Uh, what we're concerned about is the uh, proposal to allow um, uh, the, the possibility of uh, obtaining uh, the, um, uh, they have one provider without a pro uh, proper uh, uh, RFP process. Uh, to protect consumers, we urge that it be clarified that these programs are demonstrations and C.D. Panis urges the legislature to mandate the creation of three FIDA plans based upon a request for proposal process that is open to all bidders. Because of the nature of consumer directed, C.D. Panis has a long history of ensuring strong consumer protections. We also have a long history with the Nurse Practice Act because of the program's exemptions allowing our personal assistants to do skilled nursing tasks. Um, as an exemption becomes trickier in the traditional model, uh, there's the proposal to allow the advanced home health aides to perform more skilled tasks. Um, we, uh, uh, we have no problem supporting such a proposal, but we're concerned about the language um, uh, being inserted into the budget, which would allow an advanced aide to perform nursing tasks on any self-directing individual, not merely those who the aide had experience with. Therefore, um, we strongly urge the legislature to work with the governor and the department to provide further clarification, language similar to what was in the MRT proposal. It seems like the, budget, but, uh, the governor's budget uh, has a more uh, broader definition of what the aid can do. Uh, and we, prov um, we endorse uh, further clarification to the language included in the budget to ensure that it accomplishes the same goals of the Medicaid redesign work group. Thank you very much. Are you okay over there? <laughs> no, I'm, a, I'm sorry. I'm Italian, and I'm from New Jersey. Well, and I, yeah. uh, uh, I just, uh, I'm an Italian from Syracuse. But the, the last two pages of your proposal lists all the a summary of what you like and what you don't like. Um, uh, I'm just mentioning that to the members of the committee because uh, it's a quick summary of what was a seven-page single-space statement. And well, you got to look. My only point is I'm not trying to criticize anybody. We're up here listening to you read something. Your points will be more well served, I think, if you kind of summarized it and gave the reasons why. The last two pages are perfect. It gives exactly what you're saying. So just for future reference and future speakers, that's the best way to do it. So I get, I get, a, I get two points for the, the summary. and. Minus three points, so. 
<laughs> uh, I, I just well, was you get in ten the meantime, for the summer. In the That's meantime, the Italian side let, me, of me. let me just say, you're actually touching upon some extraordinarily important things as we go through the transition, and you're a totally unique enterprise. And I think you need to spend, or your people, or your lawyer need to spend some time with the respective finance committees and the and the health chairs to go over this stuff. Otherwise, you're going to get crushed by the transitions. So it's very important. I remember as we I haven't looked at this since we really introduced it as a, as a full part of the budget, and there's a group of people who are taking care of themselves and they're doing a great job, but the bureaucracy and the regulations need to be addressed. So thank you, but come back. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, next, Renee Nagalis, Program Director, and Timmy Courier, Nurse Family Partnerships. The next speaker after that will be Rob Hack. Good afternoon. My name is Renee Nogales, and I'd like to thank um, you all for the chance to come and testify on behalf of Nurse Family Partnership, and I also want to thank Chief Courier for coming down from Messina to join me today. Um, as you all make really difficult decisions um, regarding the budget in the next um, upcoming weeks, I'd really like to ask you to restore $2.5 million for Nurse Family Partnership, or NFP. And this public health program is really an excellent example of cost-effective prevention. So much so, it was included in the um, 1115 waiver amendment that New York State submitted to CMS as part of its Medicaid redesign efforts, and we're very grateful for being included as one of the public health innovations. Still, while Nurse Family Partnership received overwhelming support during that process, it's really unclear when the waiver amendment will be approved and when it'll become fully operationalized. So until that time, it's really important to restore the 2.5 million in order to um, keep the programs whole. Um, otherwise, ca um, capacity may need to be reduced, um, placing hundreds of infants um, born into poverty at even greater risk. So as many of you know, Nurse Family Partnership is a voluntary community, um, a community public health program for, um, that helps vulnerable mothers who are pregnant for the first time. They match each mother with a registered nurse that starts visiting them in the homes during pregnancy, and they receive home visits until the child's second birthday. Um, our nurses help women have healthy pregnancies, help improve the child's health and development, and also help the families become self-sufficient. And right now, we've got programs in Monroe and Onondaga counties in all five boroughs in New York City. Um, and since the program began in 2003, we've served um, almost 11,000 families, and right now we're serving about 2,200. So over 35 years of rigorous research really show that Nurse Family Partnership works, and several reputable independent studies have found that it's cost-effective and yields benefits to taxpayers. For example, one analysis showed that for every family served in New York, in New York State, state and local governments can receive up to almost $11,000 by the time that the child um, hits his or her 12th birthday. And then offsets will continue to accrue based on savings, um, saving offsets due to reduced spending on Medicaid, TANF, food stamps, and costs associated with child abuse. And then there's an additional um, $1,300 in savings further down the road um, due to offsets resulting from reductions in criminal justice costs. Um, and importantly, the study also determined that Medicaid savings alone actually makes the program budget neutral by the time the child is five or six, depending on whether you're talking about statewide average or New York City. Um, some really quick um, notable um, NFP outcomes I just want to highlight really quickly. Um, the program um, can yield a 56% reduction in emergency room visits. 48% reduction in state verified reports of child abuse and neglect, 31% reduction in very, very closely spaced pregnancies, 67% reduction in child's behavior and emotional problems, and among the clients that are 18 years or older at intake, 67% are in the workforce at program completion, up from 34% at intake. And I'd just like to end by talking about one of the many successful clients in New York, and I'm changing her name to protect, protect confidentiality. 
Maria was 18 years old and pregnant when her foster care agency, Foundling Hospital, referred to her to NFP as it was making discharge plans when she was leaving the foster care system. And she met her nurse, Kathleen, when she was 22 weeks pregnant. Um, and these are Maria's words. Kathleen helped me understand how important good nutrition and good prenatal care was to my baby. Best of all, I learned so much, I felt less scared. I learned what to expect from labor and delivery, and I learned how to take care of my baby after he was born. But I felt like I knew what to expect, and if something happened, my nurse was there for me. I didn't have a mom, so I didn't know what to do. My nurse taught me how to bathe him and how to play with him. She taught me what his baby cues meant, when he was hungry, when he was tired, and when he wanted to play. I don't know what, would have, what I would have done if I didn't have a nurse from Nurse Family Partnership. I'm afraid we both would have been lost to the streets. And it's really because of NFP that vulnerable kids like Maria's child, um, are, they're really getting a positive start to life um, and getting the benefits that can really transfer it for generations to come. So with your help, we can continue this good work and help more families be successful. Members of the committee, good afternoon. Thank you for listening to my testimony today. I'm Tim Currier. I'm the Chief of Police in Messina, New York. I'm also the co-chair, one of the co-chairs of Fight Crime Investing Kids, which is an organization of more than 300 police chiefs, sheriffs, district attorney, and crime survivors across the state who support investments in proven prevention strategies. I want to thank Renee for setting the stage for my discussions. I'm here today to ask you to restore the $2.5 million in the state budget to help support the sustainability of the NFP. That funding, which you generously provided last year, would provide the much-needed services for pregnant women and young children. I don't have the NFP program in my county, but with expanded services, I hope to someday. You may think it's quite odd for a police chief to sit in front of you and talk about maternal prenatal or early childhood home visitation. So let me give you some reasons for me being here today. While most survivors of childhood abuse and neglect never become violent criminals, research shows that an estimated 3,000 of the 77,000 victims of abuse and neglect in New York State in 2010 will later become violent criminals in our state and who otherwise would have avoided such crimes if not for the abuse and neglect endured as children. The randomized control trial of the NFP program shows that children of participating mothers had 48% fewer substantiated reports of abuse and neglect than the children of mothers in the control group, indicating that home visitation can cut abuse and neglect nearly in half among the at-risk children. The children left out of the program also had more than twice as many arrests by the age of 15, and they were twice as likely to be convicted by the age of 19. <coughs> These large reductions in abuse and neglect and crime mean that home visitation can save more than it costs us. These are measurable outcomes that will strengthen families and make our communities safer. I police in a community who has more than a 17% above poverty rate in my county. Police officers all over this state, and I can tell you with my 25 years of law enforcement experience, that it's become commonplace to see generation after generation of the same family become criminals. We've come to expect, unfortunately, that children of criminals will do no better than their parents. But fortunately, we can stop this cycle. We can reduce child abuse, we can reduce neglect, and we can reduce crime. And we can increase school readiness with the NFP program. In law enforcement, we know that if we stop the cycle of abuse, it reduces crime, makes our citizens safer, and we have less victims. I believe that the home visitation also improves a child's chance in education, and there's a clear and undeniable connection between education and crime. We see it in our streets every day. Our prisons and jails are full of people who did poorly in school. Because a, ch because a child is born into a family with low resources or into a socially disadvantaged environment, we can, and in the interest of public safety, we must provide programs that help that family, help that child, and make our streets safer. The Nurse Family Partnership is a proven program that gets results. That's why I'm urging you today to restore the $2.5 million for the sustainability of the NFP home visitation program. 
Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you. Oh, yes, go ahead. Um, you say that 83% of the infants are assessed for develop developmental milestones by age four months, and does that continue f until they're two? I'm sorry, which one was that? On page uh, four, your bullet points, the second to last one. Yes. And that continues until they're two years old, is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is Rob Hack here? They didn't sign in. Okay. We'll just take his testimony. Uh, uh, Marie Ostich, Osowich, Ostoyich, uh, Irish, New York Association of County Health Officials to be followed by AARP. Your, your forces are dwindling back there. I don't see as many red, red shirts. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Soon to be evening. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. We have abbreviated our presentation. Um, unfortunately, we did not have time in the last five minutes to make it just bullets. So. We'll make it a, what? Make it just bullets, as you no, requested. No, 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 I didn't mean that. I just meant. I um, kind regards from our state's local health officials to all the distinguished committee members on both houses. My name is Marie Cross Ostoyich. I am the public health director of Greene County, and I currently serve as the president of the New York State Association of County Health Officials. Sitting with me is Linda Wagner, our executive director of NYSEHO, or New York State County Health Official Group. Thank you for the opportunity to present this input to the 2013-14 Executive Budget Proposal on behalf of my constituents at all 58 local health departments in New York State. I am a registered nurse with a master's degree in maternal child health. I also am a certified diabetes educator. I represent local health departments. We provide essential population-based health services that protect all New Yorkers. Examples include, but are not limited to control of communicable disease, vaccine preventable diseases, prevention of lead poisoning, maternal child health services, tobacco control efforts, restaurant and camp inspections, and chronic disease prevention. Related to Article 6 under general public health work, the governing public health work proposed changes to the proposed budget reflect the recognition by state and local officials of the need to update and streamline the statuses that govern the work of our state and local health departments. This need has arisen in the context of a rapidly evolving national landscape of health care, health insurance, disease and injury prevention, accreditation, technology, and health outcome data. Because these developments have been accompanied in recent years by fiscal constraints, facing all levels of government, revisions of the law to encourage greater efficiencies and cost effectiveness have become even more urgent. NYSEHO greatly appreciates the fact that the New York State Department of Health has sought significant input from local health officials as the department sought to modernize the public health law, Article 6, which is general public health work. It is reflected in many of the statutory changes that accompany the proposal for the budget. Stream streamlining the process that health departments must follow to report their public health activities and seek state aid reimbursement will bring welcome administrative relief to local governments and should reduce the delays in reviews, revisions, and payments that have plagued the existing process at both the state and local level. The proposed increase in state aid base grant is a concrete and vital step towards strengthening the basic infrastructure of local health departments and allowing greater flexibility for decision making about local public health needs. The current influenza epidemic highlights, and I did hear somebody sneeze not long ago, um, highlights the importance of having a strong foundation yes, it was you, for the local government public health system. As this epidemic has emerged, local health departments have been encouraging and providing flu vaccines, monitoring the incidence of the disease, and promoting efforts to prevent the spread of flu. 
Recognition of chronic disease prevention as a core public health service is an important acknowledgement of local health department priorities in their communities today. Chronic disease, such as diabetes, heart disease, and cancer are among the leading causes of death in New York State, and their prevention must be viewed as a public health essential service today. Requiring that health education is conducted within every and each, each and every core of public health category is crucial to improved health outcomes and lower long-term health care costs. Health education is a foundation for public health. Hence, it is essential that this mandate, while not identified as a core service, is recognized as a requirement, a required component of all the core services. NYSEACHEL supports the concept of performance-based initiatives of increased state aid to foster quality improvement and looks forward to collaborating with the State Health Department on the development of the performance criteria. Public health emergency preparedness and response is essential to the preservation of health and safety in our communities. Considering either an upstate county like my county, Green, impacted by last year's tropical storms, Irene and Lee, and Sandy as well, or the downstate community, communities of Nassau, New York City, and others still responding to those devastated by Hurricane Sandy. You cannot deny the depth and breadth of public health impact of these events and the need to maintain strong local health department infrastructure in, order, in ordinary times in order to meet the demands during extraordinary times. Related to Article 6 changes, we have concerns related to certain areas. While NYSEACHEL recognizes that the state law requires the state health department to publish and invite public comment on the proposed regulations, we are concerned that the proposed Article 6 statutory changes eliminate the language in the existing law that requires the New York State Commissioner of Health to consult with local health department officials prior to promulgating or changing the rules and regulations. Because local health departments are, in effect, local enforcement of arms of state government, NYSEACHEL believes it is preferable to strengthen the existing law to require the State Commissioner of Health to consult with the local health department officials during the development of the regulations that will require action or enforcement by the local health department. There's a proposed new prohibition on state aid claims as well for primary prevent. Unless specifically authorized by the State Commissioner of Health, NYSEACHEL feels, feels that the proposed statutory changes could have a negative impact much broader than intended to address the state's specific concerns. We agree that all health sector stakeholders need to work toward ensuring that children under the age of 21 have a medical home and those not covered by private health insurance are enrolled in existing public health insurance plans, such as Child Health Plus, Medicaid, or in future plans that are expected to become available after 1st of next year. However, health insurance exchange plans are still evolving. Provider capacity for necessary care that is available on a timely basis is not insured in all communities at all times and the definition of an uninsured child is not clear. To meet their public health obligation to assure primary and preventative care, many local health departments currently provide direct services to children who would not receive needed care otherwise. And then we would apply for state aid through the primary prevent line. We believe that local health departments must be allowed to maintain their important role as a safety net or provider of last resort, and that counties and municipalities need the flexibility to ascertain needs to meet those needs when there's no other option. Article 6 funding has been critical to support this assurance role of local health departments. The executive budget includes a significant cut to the primary prevent line, which would go into effect January 2014. The state's health insurance exchange will ramp up after January of 2014, but the provider capacity may not be sufficient to enable these children's needs to be absorbed by the private health care sector 
or by federally qualified health care centers. We urge the state to hold off on this change. NYSEHA is also concerned that the proposed prohibition against state aid claims to cover the indirect and fringe expenses of contractors will serve as a disincentive for local governments that could achieve greater efficiencies and cost effectiveness by entering into contracts with non-governmental entities. Under early intervention, NYSECHO applauds the proposed statutory changes regarding the provision of EI services to special needs children. These changes will ensure that the crucial services are provided to children who need them while bringing early intervention into the mainstream of the health care system. The proposals bring insurers to the table, require providers to work with the health coverage plans, and reduce unnecessary evaluations that are a burden on the child, parents, providers, and local health officials. Under Article 23, Sexually Transmitted Illnesses, NYSEHO applauds the proposed changes to Article 23 as a long overdue correction of many obsolete prohibitions. That will bring the statue in line with public health practice. Of critical importance is language to allow the counties to seek third-party reimbursement for the clinical diagnosis and treatment of sexually transmitted diseases. We believe the proposed language will provide sufficient protections to those for whom such insurance claiming might pose a barrier to treatment. All who come to clinics seeking care will receive it regardless of insurance status or failure to provide related information. Under consolidation and restructuring of local health program funding, we understand and support the need to measure the outcomes and ensure the accountability for public funds. This is always a priority for those working in local government. However, we caution that the state's process needs to be administratively simple and avoid cumbersome requirements and reviews that delay decisions and delay payments. We are also concerned that this consolidation is accompanied by a 10.13% decrease in funding for local health programs that have been essential to public health prevention, health quality, and workforce training efforts in our communities. During a period when resources are so strained, such a cut will make it more difficult to achieve the health outcomes that the state seeks in important public health goals and objectives of the New York State Prevention Agenda. Those include tobacco control, cancer screening, lead poisoning prevention, environmental health protections, HIV and AIDS and other communicable disease prevention, and a broad range of family health goals such as nutrition assistant, assistance and adolescence pregnancy prevention. In addition, it is important to recognize that some of our smaller counties, like my county, don't have adequate resources to compete for categorical grant funding. The state should always find ways to ensure that the co consolidation of local health programs and an increase in competitive process for funding doesn't penalize communities in our state that have the greatest need. In conclusion, as always, NYSECHO and its member local health departments are committed to working with the governor, the legislature, you, and our local governments to prevent and reduce harm to New Yorkers. By preserving public health, you fulfill a central responsibility of government to keep healthy and safe the people who live and work in our communities. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, AARP, Derek Holmes and Lindsay Ettringer. Ett Ettringer. Is that Ettringer? How do you say? Yeah, it was close. And followed by Kathy James and Elaine Spote. Is she here? Just Kathy James is next. Okay, go ahead. Good, good afternoon, Senator DeFrancisco and other distinguished members of the committee. My name is Derek Holmes, and I am an AARP member, and I serve as a volunteer leader in the Capital District. With me today, as you just introduced uh, herself, is Lindsay Ettinger, who is the AARP Coordinator for Advocacy. Uh, Advocacy. AARP is a membership organization with over 2.5 million members in New York State. 
I would like to thank you for allowing us to speak today about AARP's views on the executive, executive's health and Medicaid budget proposal. Before I begin our testimony, I would like to offer, on behalf of AARP members in New York State, our sincere thanks to the legislature for restoring the EPIC co-payment assistance that took effect January 1st of this year. It is our understanding that EPIC is fully funded for the entirety of the year, keeping in place the legislature's restoration of funds after last year's cut was implemented. We have heard from our members who have concerns about prescription affordability that EPIC is crucial to enabling them to afford the prescriptions they need in order to maintain their health and effectively manage complex medical conditions. Thank you for making EPIC a priority. Today I would like to focus my remarks on three basic areas that are priorities for our membership, Medicaid, caregiving, and managed long-term care. AARP believes everyone should have access to affordable health care. Under the Affordable Care Act, states can help hardworking people who have lost their health insurance or who do not have coverage to get Medicaid health coverage by expanding Medicaid eligibility. This issue is particularly important to our members because many individuals who are over age 50 are not yet eligible for Medicare and are without coverage. These middle-aged adults are more likely to face the onset of health conditions that, if left untreated, could increase their need for and use of health care and long-term care down the road. Having access to basic preventive health care can alleviate the need for costly emergency room and delayed treatment. AARP New York strongly supports the governor's proposal to expand Medicaid eligibility for those at 100% of the federal poverty level to include those up to 133% of the federal poverty level. AARP believes that expanding Medicaid to single adults will help more than 77,000 individuals in New York State, many of whom have lost their jobs or are struggling in jobs without health benefits but do not qualify for Medicaid under current income guidelines. AARP does not believe that New York State is making a meaningful investment in informal family caregivers. Our review of the executive budget found less than $3 million in state funds that are specifically appropriated for direct assistance to informally fam informal family caregivers. The New York State Office for the Aging estimates that over 80% of all long-term care is provided by family members, friends, and neighbors. In addition, SOFA estimates that without the support of these unpaid caregivers, over 50% of older residents would likely be placed in institutional settings like nursing homes. In New York, in New York families provide an estimated 32 million, excuse me, 32 billion a year in services, yet the investment the state provides is less than $3 million. In our opinion, this math does not add up well. New York's failure to adequately support informal caregivers needs to be addressed. These programs pro provide people with the care they want while saving taxpayer money by keeping individuals out of the significantly more expensive institutional care settings, more, most likely funded by the Medicaid program. Uh, Recent polls commissioned by AARP show that the majority of New York State residents age 50 and over would prefer to receive long-term care services at home instead of going into long-term care facilities. The polls show strong support for New York to manage and implement a consumer-focused long-term care system that helps our aging population to age in place. We strongly believe in the delivery of effective, quality long-term care services, particularly as they enhance the ability of seniors to stay at home and in their communities while receiving those services and supports. Services most tru must truly be person-centered and designed to maximize consumers' choice and independence. With that said, AARP supports the executive, executive's budget uh, proposed expenditure of $3 million to 
to establish a managed long-term care ombudsman program. This investment will provide advocacy assistance for older New Yorkers and people with disabilities in New York's managed long-term care system. We recommend that the legislature accept this timely proposal as the state is beginning to implement mandatory managed long-term care for New York's Medicaid program. <clears throat> the repeal of spousal refusal protections as they pertain to applications for Medicaid-funded home care services received in a community setting must be rejected. AARP agrees with many advocates that this protection is needed because income protections for Medicaid-funded community-based services, such as home care, do not have parity with the income protections for the community spouse that exist when individuals apply for Medicaid-funded nursing home care. AARP believes New York's spousal refusal provision eliminates the huge inequity that forces married couples to institutionalize a disabled spouse. The rules allow the community spouse of an institutionalized spouse to keep enough of the couple's combined income and resources to realistically meet his or her living expenses, up to $2,841 in monthly income and between $74,820 and $109,560 in assets. However, the same spouse who seeks to obtain Medicaid funds to care for a spouse at home must impoverish him or herself so the couple's combined assets are only $20,850 and combined income of $1,179 per month. These levels in many parts of the state are not adequate to live. This creates pressure on the well spouse to institutionalize the disabled spouse as a purely financial decision. In many cases, the only alternative is divorce. We strongly believe that the proposal to eliminate spousal refusal in the budget should be rejected. We instead recommend that a statewide standard be institu instituted that is consistent with nursing home income protections that are in place for community spouses of nursing home care recipients. So in conclusion, thank you again for allowing AARP to testify today regarding these important budget issues. AARP believes that creating access to affordable health care will not only save taxpayer money in the long run, but will also give New Yorkers the ability to age with good health, independence, and dignity. Thank you. Thank you. I want the record to also reflect earlier there are about 40 to 50 red shirts in the back. And, yes, uh, but due to the length, due to the length of the uh, event, uh, I uh, commend the final three uh, for being here the whole time and that it was noticed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You. Yes, give them a round of applause. Next, Kathy James from the Alzheimer's Association, followed by Blair Horner, Cancer Action Network. Good afternoon, Senator DeFrancisco and members of the committee. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased to be here, and thank you so much for uh, providing this hearing today to invite me to share some insights with you regarding the executive budget proposal for health and Medicaid. My name is Kathy James and I serve as both the co-chair of the New York State Coalition of Alzheimer's Association chapters and the chief executive officer of the Alzheimer's Association Central New York chapter. The Coalition of New York State Alzheimer's Association chapters advocates on behalf of New Yorkers living with Alzheimer's disease. For over 25 years, the seven chapters of the coalition have provided care consultations, consumer and professional education programs, a 24-hour helpline service, safety services, and support groups across the state. I'm here today to discuss several proposals in Governor Cuomo's budget that impact the individuals that we serve. And since the coalition has submitted our written testimony, I'll summarize points um, and really three points for you to make the best use of my allotted time. 
We are concerned about the proposal within the governor's budget to eliminate funding for numerous, numerous public health programs in the Department of Health budget and consolidate these programs into six competitive pools. All funding for community-based services to support those living with Alzheimer's disease and their caregivers was eliminated in this proposal. This includes $246,000 for Alzheimer's support services, $49,000 for Alzheimer's Disease Community Assistance Program, or ALS-CAP, and $295,000 for the Alzheimer's Community Services Program, CSP, to support education and caregiver respite programs. We're concerned about the lack of transparency surrounding this proposal. We do not know much, if any, funding will be invested in programs to support those living with Alzheimer's disease. Funding for Alzheimer's-related programs will most likely come under the chronic disease pot of $63 million, but we fear at a significantly reduced level. The coalition will likely have to compete for fewer resources when we believe our focus of time and energy should be spent providing services to those living with Alzheimer's disease in the communities that we serve. We ask that the legislature reject governor, uh, the governor's proposal to consolidate funding for public health programs and fight to increase funding for Alzheimer's disease-related programs. We are also asking that the legislature restore funding for the ALS-CAP program and increase the funding line to $5 million in the state fiscal year 13-14 budget. Currently, ALS-CAP is funded through the Department of Health and it supports the delivery of community-based services to help individuals and families struggling with Alzheimer's disease by the coalition chapters. Although the coalition is sensitive to the state's economic situation, the time has come for significant increase in state funding to ensure appropriate services are provided to this vulnerable and growing population. Currently, there are more than 320,000 New York residents living with Alzheimer's disease. By 2025, it is estimated that approximately 350,000 New Yorkers will suffer from this disease, a sharp increase over the current number, and we still feel that those are very conservative numbers. And while these numbers are significant, they do not include the nearly one million informal and unpaid caregivers in New York that are providing care to individuals with Alzheimer's disease, and I, I thank my colleagues from AARP for, for pointing out those important informal and unpaid caregivers. An increased investment by New York State in the ALS-CAP initiative would also generate Medicaid savings. There's strong evidence that community-based services delay nursing home placement and reduce the state's Medicaid burden. A research study that was provided by Dr. Mary Middleman of New York University concludes that use of community-based services will delay the median delay in skilled nursing facility placement by 557 days. So based on data from MetLife's 2011 market survey of long-term care costs, the average potential savings per person is $179,354. New York State lags behind other states of comparable size in funding initiatives to support individuals with Alzheimer's disease. Over the past five years, California has invested $28 million in Alzheimer's initiatives, Florida has invested over $100 million for Alzheimer's disease prevention and outreach services. In that same period, Ohio has invested $43 million and Texas over $16 million. Currently, New York State budget allocates a mere $1.84 per person with Alzheimer's disease. New York has a long history of investing in the fight against HIV and AIDS and cancer. New York's investment in public health was a key factor in diagnosing, treatment, and awareness of these diseases. It's now time for New York to invest $5 million in ALSCAP programs to assist those with Alzheimer's disease and their caregivers. And lastly, I'd like to um, state that the coalition is also concerned about the executive budget proposal to eliminate spousal refusal in the Medicaid program. Currently, when couples reside in the community and only one spouse requires Medicaid, the sixth spouse can apply for Medicaid as a single individual and the other spouse can exercise spousal refusal, declining to make his or her income and resources available to the sixth spouse. The proposal to eliminate spousal refusal in the executive budget would eliminate this protection for couples seeking community-based services. 
a non-applying spouse would have to reduce his or her income assets to the federal poverty level in order for the applicant spouse to receive Medicaid benefits. This policy change would encourage a spouse to place their loved one in an institution rather than care for the person at home. Although this proposal is advanced to save state dollars, it would have the opposite effect in driving up Medicaid costs for nursing home placements. We urge that this proposal would be detrimental to many couples and be rejected. And I thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. When you talk about the uh, New York State allocating $1.84 per person, is that per fiscal year or something else? That's per fiscal year, and Thank that's you. based upon the line items that I had, had mentioned, correct? Thank you. Any, anyone else? Thank you, Kathy. Pre appreciate Thank it you, very Senator. much. Um, Blair Horner, Cancer Action Network, followed by Barbara Crozier of the Cerebral Palsy Association. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, almost evening. Um, my name is Blair Horner. I'm uh, the Vice President for Advocacy, American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. To my left, your right, is Michael Burgess, uh, who is now the uh, New York State uh, Advocacy Director for uh, the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. Uh, and I um, thought I would just drag him along so you could see that there's somebody else working on this besides me. Um, you have a testimony in front of you. It's 19 pages long, single spaced. I'm going to read every word. Just kidding. Um, I thought I would sort of. Well, <laughs> excellent. Uh, you'll be I, here I, alone, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, I would. Uh, I, I will try to summarize some of our key points. Uh, we cover a lot in the testimony. Um, let me just start with uh, first on page two. You will see. Uh, some data on the, the number of um, cancer diagnoses and cancer deaths in New York State in 2012, estimated. Uh, and uh, basically, the st statistics are that one in two men and one in three women will, in a lifetime, get a cancer diagnosis. It's a big deal. Lots of people get it. Everyone knows someone that gets cancer or knows someone, uh, or the, they themselves will get it. And so we think public policy be, should be driven by three goals. One is how do you keep people from getting cancer? Second is how do you help them identify it in its earliest stage and often most treatable stage? And then lastly, if you're, uh, what public policies can be enacted uh, that will help cancer patients deal with the financial uh, and medical and personal costs uh, that come with treatment? So just to go back to the statistics, on page eight uh, of the testimony is a, a listing of cancer rates uh, uh, for the New York State compared with the country. And the reason I put this in here is it, it shows something that we thought was interesting when we were looking at this data. Uh, on the previous chart, there are basically four cancers that account for half of all cancer diagnoses and deaths, prostate, breast, colon, and lung, lung being the number one killer. And what you're looking at here is when we broke down those four cancers, uh, the, the rates of cancer comparing New York State to the rest of the country, <clears throat> Well, again, I won't go into all the details on this, but the interesting thing that you see is that New York State's cancer rates, both in terms of incidence and death rates, are lowered dramatically because of New York City's much lower cancer rates, lower than the national average. Um, That's and, because they sent all their garbage upstate. Uh, I, I, I won't speculate on that, but... Uh, and where you see it the most, where you, where you see the most significant difference is in lung cancer rates. Um, now I'm going to come back to that in a second. On page nine of the testimony identifies the cancer, uh, the counties that have the highest lung cancer rates in New York State. They are, uh, the ones with the highest ones uh, are, for men and women, are in upstate New York. Uh, downstate New York has uh, significantly lower, as you saw before, significantly lower lung cancer rates than upstate New York. So we wanted to point those out because we all know what the vast majority of lung cancers are caused by. They're caused by smoking. And so when you take a look on uh, page six of the testimony, there's a map at the bottom of the page which shows broken down by county the smoking rates 
in New York State. And what you'll see is the lighter the shading, the lower the smoking rate, the higher the shading, uh, the darker the shading, sorry, the higher the smoking rates. Upstate, it sort of makes sense when you put those two, that chart, these charts together. What you see in upstate New York is a, a significantly higher lung cancer rate that's really driven by smoking rates. Some, some counties up, you'll see Yates, for example, has over a 30 percent smoking rate. Now, I, I put this in some context because if we agree that public policy should be to reduce the cancer rate in New York State and keep people from getting cancer, what jumps out at you when you look at this is that New York State should be doing everything it can to reduce the smoking rate. Senator, are you just telling me? Oh, okay. Did you adjust, did you test for any other variables? Age of the people upstate. Whether or not, for instance, before you looked at these statistics, whether and before the great anti-smoking events in New York City took place, whether the rates were closer upstate, downstate? Over time, the gap in the, in the lung cancer rates has grown and the smoking rates has grown over time, uh, over the last few decades. Uh, and you're right to point out that New York State has, uh, downstate New York has had a history, not just New York City, but the suburbs, of enacting local restrictions on smoking that you didn't have in upstate. Upstate's uh, change has really occurred as a result of state law. But there are other variables besides, um, besides um, smoking rates in terms of, I mean, uh, cancer is a disease most, most closely related to age. And so upstate is older. Upstate tends to be poorer. You will see other bad outcomes. But the reason, I, the reason lung cancer, so, I think, is an interesting one for policymakers is the vast majority of lung cancer is the result of smoking. It's not, you may get it later in life, but it's really from smoking. And uh, this brings, it, brings me to the point that uh, I wanted to focus our testimony on, which is what should you do about it? Now, the governor's proposal um, advances in his proposal. He basically eliminates the tobacco control program. That's gone. We believe, we've been told, and we've seen you know, some documents, that it's being lumped into the chronic diseases pool um, I guess in some sort of budgetary Darwinism, uh, the governor's proposing to take roughly $75 million in lines and stick it into a $63 million appropriation. And we don't know what that means for the state's tobacco control program. But here's what we do know. We know that in the, when the legislature created the tobacco control program 10 plus years ago, you set up an advisory board to advise the state on how to do it, you, sent up, you set up an annual audit of the program to make sure the money's being spent properly. The evidence is considerable that the state is doing everything right except spending enough money. And so even with all this evidence, the program has seen a 50 percent reduction in its funding over the last five years. The governor proposed a $5 million reduction last year. And there's certainly no evidence in this year's budget that the number is going to go up. We would argue that you follow the advice of the independent auditors of the program, which have recommended increasing the funding for the program, not decreasing it. And here's where the funding matters most. The cuts in the program have impacted on the tobacco control program's marketing efforts. Marketing drives smokers to the quit line. There's, and you'll see comments, there's like some graphs on that in the, in the uh, testimony about uh, the correlation. The more people see ads, of, smokers see ads about smoking, the more likely it is they want to stop. And what you'll see in there is there's been a decline in the quit line calls as the cuts have been occurring in the state's um, smoking uh, marketing program. So I'm, I'm sorry, uh, anti-smoking marketing program. So we believe that the pool creates a problem because we don't know what impact it's going to have on the program. And then secondarily, there's another cancer services program that's in, we think, in that pool, and that's the program that provides free insurance for the uninsured for breast, cervical, and colorectal cancers. That funding uh, has been flat in the last few years. It's been reduced. But this, the health department says that they can only reach 20 percent of the eligible population under the current funding system. So if the goal is to reduce cancer in the state of New York, we would argue that the state's that uh, we would urge you to reject 
uh, the governor's uh, plan unless there's some indication uh, that the state is going to be spending um, more revenues to fight cancer uh, as compared to less. And we would urge that as the legislative branch that you uh, work to ensure that that is in fact the case uh, when the uh, final budget is approved. So that's nine minutes. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Senator Kruger. Good evening. Thank you. So I wasn't in the legislature when the whole tobacco securitization deal um, came down, mm -hmm. but I think both of you were working here then. Was there any other paper trail or assumption that some of that money would go towards um, smoking cessation or prevention and tobacco? Well, there's two different issues here. One okay. is the uh, litigation between the states and the tobacco companies on Medicaid funding, through, mm -hmm. and that was a, a, an agreement, settlement that came out called the Master Settlement right. Agreement uh, that freed up billions of dollars to the states over time to pay back for their losses incurred right. in Medicaid. In New York, it was split between localities and the states. Um, at that time, uh, all the press releases were filled with how the money was going to be invested in programs to keep kids from smoking and to help smokers to quit. So the releases from the attorney, then Attorney General Dennis Vaco, uh, the governor at the time, everyone was talking about it, and that was the promise, both in New York State and the rest of the country, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, the second issue is when the states securitized at least a portion of their tobacco settlement money, what happened to that money? Uh, and that was largely used, as I recall, to help fill the budget shortfalls uh, after 9-11, uh, uh, that that was used to help plug, I think, a $10 billion gap. Uh, in the state's budget, but I don't recall there being any promise around securitization that some of that money would be used for that. But the state raises roughly two to two and a half billion dollars in tobacco revenues right now. They spend two cents, the state spends two cents on the dollar in programs, which is a far cry from uh, the recommendations of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which say that the state should be spending more. Uh, and so we would certainly urge uh, that that's the direction. I don't know if that's a too long of an answer to your short question, Senator, but uh, the, at the time of this master settlement agreement, uh, people were, were quite clear on what they wanted to see at least a portion of the money used for. And um, I guess it was today, but it was many hours ago we were talking with Dr. Shaw about the six um, pools right. in Department of Health that each took approximately a 10 percent hit. And as I understand your testimony, the tobacco cessation money is in one of those six pools That's that also is taking an approximately a 10 percent cut. Well, that we don't know. All we know is what all, all we know. Yeah. <laughs> and and that this is uh, based on what we've been told is that we the the two programs that I described are in the chronic diseases pool, which totals which the appropriation total is 63 million dollars. We don't know. I mean, I think if Dr. Shaw was here, he'd be telling you, well, it'll be based on the best available evidence about what we're going to fund. And theoretically, tobacco could get more, I think he would even argue. But, but that, there's no history of that, and there's right. no evidence of that, and so we're skeptical. But you're competing, then, quote, unquote, yes, it's with definitely, a list of other right. programs that are all defined within the chronic illness category. That's right. There is so. a Hunger Games element to yes, the way that, that this was, is I being constructed. Point. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Horner. I just want to get a little parochial here. Your comparisons with upstate and uh, the city of New York, the smoking rates. Um, coming from Staten Island, I do want to caution you that Staten Islanders have the highest rate of cancers, of smoking, of heart disease, of um, obesity, everything that you can relate to uh, smoking. Staten Islanders throughout all of New York City has the highest rate of it. So when we talk about smoking cessation programs, we have to really have the conversation uh, turn to how to deliver those programs because clearly the city of New York is failing Staten Island when it comes to smoking cessation. Uh, so I just want to caution you on that point. Uh, that's a very good point. On page seven of the testimony, we do sort of tele telescope down into, or microscope down, I guess, into the counties themselves and the city of New York, you're right, Staten Island has, uh, uh, in the city, uh, has uh, higher smoking rates. You're absolutely right. And, I mean, we're talking about the hard to reach population. We're talking about the urban poor in urban areas. Uh, we're talking about um, in places in rural, poor, and upstate New York, and hard-to-reach populations are, by definition, hard to reach. 
Uh, and the only way you can do that really is with uh, robust programs following the expert advice. Uh, the expert advice is issued by the CDC to the state of New York, and we're just urging that um, when the budget is finalized, uh, that there be uh, adequate resources to do that. So that's a very good point. You're absolutely right. Uh, thank you. One question is, does the federal government still provide subsidies for tobacco farmers? Does the federal government still provide like subsidies, subsidies for oh, That's a good question. I, I'm not sure of the answer. I know that it was an issue on the chopping block. I don't know the answer. I don't think they call it that. They call it farming. Well, they, they, they well, might. Yeah, but they does might. is tobacco one of the farming subsidies? And I guess if you could let me know that, that would be very interesting. I will, uh, will look into that. How are you doing, Blair? <laughs> good to see you, Assemblyman. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you. Barbara Crozier of the Cerebral Palsy Associations of New York State, to be followed by Julian, Julian, Julianne Hart of the Heart Association. Well, that's clever. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you if, very if, much. If it's uh, any consolation, if you testify in the evening past six, that we bring uh, uh, some gin out rather than the water. <laughs> just, uh, what, so I came too early. No, 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 no. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for all staying um, and for the opportunity to present testimony. Due to the lateness of the hour and all the individuals who have yet to testify, I'm going to try and make this short and you have my testimony. Um, my name is Barbara Crozier. I'm with, I'm Vice President of Government Relations for Cerebral Palsy Associations of New York State. Cerebral Palsy Associations was founded almost 70 years ago by families of children with cerebral palsy who were looking for services. Um, the, our 24 affiliates across the state uh, now provide all kinds of supports and services for children and adults through the full continuum lifespan, from health services to school, special ed school services, early intervention, clinics, and a full range of services through the Office of, for the People with Developmental Disabilities. And that's traditionally where we would pre be presenting testimony, but um, as I said, we, we do traditionally, we have for a long time provided Article 28 services and early intervention. But this year's budget is actually uh, very different. And uh, we've long supported the idea of managed care and care management, for, particularly for people with developmental disabilities. And actually, under the first Cuomo administration, uh, Cerebral Palsy Associations of New York State had a grant through to look at managed care for people with developmental disabilities. And what we found out at the time was that um, the individuals we serve are very expensive. And at the time, there really weren't any managed care companies uh, were interested in providing managed care services to people with developmental disabilities. And then it was just the health care services. Well, we are now back the sort of full continuum. That was in the um, early 90s. We're now back and looking at managed care for all services for people with developmental disabilities. Not just health care services, but residential, day, putting all of the services into managed care. And we're extremely concerned with the governor's proposal because at the same time we're looking at a new waiver, a people first waiver to put all these uh, services into managed care. We're also looking at uh, the governor's budget proposes moving all Medicaid administration into the health department. And when probably 95 to 99 percent of the services and programs in the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities are Medicaid, that means really moving all of the services into the health department under the office auspices of OHIP. Um, and I think because cerebral palsy has uh, such a history of working with the health department through our clinics um, and with the specialized health care needs of people with developmental disabilities, we're particularly concerned that the staff at the health department don't have the knowledge 
um, and the understanding of the needs, uh, uh, the needs and the services for people with developmental disabilities. In particular, the cerebral palsy affiliates, again, because they were founded by families um, with children with cerebral palsy, have tended to serve individuals with de developmental disabilities who have more medical needs, physical disabilities, medically frail, high cost individuals as well. And it's taken a long time for us to differentiate those individuals um, in, a, in the clinics and how they're different from typical Medicaid patients uh, in, in our services and on our Article 28 clinic services with the health department. So not only are we concerned about how we'll be managed by fiscal intermediaries unfamiliar with our truly high need individuals, but more importantly, we're concerned that the department staff don't know enough about people we serve to develop good public policy regarding their access to care. As recently as with the implementation of MRT 26, we saw how a lack of understanding can negatively affect the people we serve. Uh, while most of OPWDD um, was not included in the MRT proposals and we're not included in the cap, um, the health department did decide that our Article 16 clinics, which are clinics that provide long-term therapies for people with developmental disabilities under the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, should also have a cut. And rather than the 2% across the board cut, as with, was done with other um, MRT cuts, in fact, what the health department determined was that for individuals who received more than the average number of therapies and for clinics who provided more than the average number of therapies, those were the clinics that would be cut. So regardless of what an individual's diagnosis was or their medical condition. Uh, so the CP clinics, again, which typically serve individuals who have more um, medical conditions, Clinics are the CP clinics alone that provide medical services to CP patients? No, Article 16 clinics are clinics under, it's Article 16 of the Mental Hygiene Law. I got that. So it's um, their AHRC, ARCs, they're every kind of developmental disability provider. All the, D, all the DD medical clinics? They're DD, yes. You have to be OPWDD eligible in order to receive services from an Article 16 clinic, correct? Yes. So it's only individuals who are qualified for OPWDD services can get services from an Article 16 clinic. Primarily, they do the long-term therapies. Uh, so and previously, the CPs had only had Article 28s, but in, there was a part-time clinic issue, and so then the health department had all the, the uh, therapies moved over to Article 16, so even the CPs who had just 28 then opened to 16 for the long-term therapies. So DOH wanted them taken out of the Article 28 and put over into the 16s. Uh, and then they, so they determined then that regardless, so as a result, the clinics that serve individuals with, you know, more physical needs, and again, these are, these are um, prescriptions written by a physician. Uh, and so clinics like the CPs that serve the more physically disabled and those who are, who are medical conditions are the clinics that received cuts, um, the full brunt of the cut on the Article 16 clinics. And clinics that served individuals with developmental disabilities who stayed below the 4%, again, regardless of whether they even needed therapy um, or had any physical diagnosis, those clinics received zero cuts. Um, so to us, it was a, an example of, and additionally, OPWDD tried to get the health department to understand and to do it as an across the board cut. And the health department, from our understanding, said no, that you know this is how it has to be, that it's only for clinics and for individuals who receive more than the average number of therapies, which I think was about four therapies a month. 
to us. They just simply use the standard more than the average? Yes. But in any population, there's always some less and some more than right. the average. Right. And there's a physical re there's a reason why uh, someone who has spastic quadriplegia would need more, more um, therapy than someone who is a perfectly healthy but hap happens to be um, intellectually disabled, but physically This is healthy. the converse of Lake Wobegon, where everybody's above average. Yes. <laughs> so as a result of this, um, as you can see, we're very concerned, particularly now that the governor has proposed moving all of Medicaid into the health department, particularly when so much, you know, all of our services are Medicaid services, so it begs the question of what will be left in the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities. And we're very concerned with then the policy decisions because at the same time we're moving everything into managed care and we're starting these discos, which are going to be sort of the care management because it's not only health care, it's group homes, it's day services, it's supported employment, it's everything. And it's never been done in any state um, in particularly in the kinds of an extent of services that New York State has provided. So we're very concerned about that. There was a recent decision, a federal decision, that said that um, for Medicare purposes that um, habilitation services are Medicare fundable um, and are eligible for Medicare. So we, we are just asked that in the movement, if all of Medicaid is moved over, that there clearly and truly be policy decisions and policy making remains within the Office for People with De Developmental Disabilities and that the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities has a voice in, in the services and the direction and, and what happens to individuals because we're very concerned. I also have some um, concerns about the early intervention uh, changes, but you can read those. Thank you. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Thank and I have read your other recommendations as you were talking. Um, uh, Julianne, Julianne Hart, uh, American Heart Association, followed by Dr. Brian Ludwig, chiropractors. Hi, I'm Julianne Hart with the American Heart Association. Um, and yes, that really is my last name. Um, you spell the, it differently, though. What's that? You spell it differently, though. Yes. Okay. Um, the Heart Association is the largest volunteer organization dedicated to fighting heart disease and stroke. Heart disease is the number one killer of New Yorkers, um, and that's across all racial ethnic groups. A lot of people still think of heart disease as a man's disease. That's not the case. It is also the number one killer of women in New York State. Um, the stats are alarming, over 47,000 deaths in New York State in 2009 from heart disease, um, and almost another 6,000 from stroke in 2009. Um, I do want to note that the American Heart Association does not receive state tax dollars, but we advocate for programs and policies um, that make environmental changes and healthy behaviors the default. Um, so towards this end, we have some grave concerns with the executive budget and particularly the proposal to consolidate the already limited prevention dollars that exist. We're concerned about how this will impact and it could possibly jeopardize funding for the tobacco control program, the healthy heart program, and a current line um, that's in the, the current year budget for obesity and diabetes prevention funding. Um, right now, none of those items are in the executive budget proposal. We're assuming that they are in the chronic disease pot, but we don't know how much or if any of these funds will be given towards these areas. Earlier in the day, there was some discussion about the costs associated with obesity. Um, 8.5 million, that's actually not the cost of obesity, that's the number of New Yorkers that are considered overweight or obese. That's six out of 10, and that's just adults. That's six out of 10 adults are considered overweight or obese. So this is no longer an emerging health issue, it's a serious health issue. And we're concerned that um, you know, there are already limited dollars here that we shouldn't be decreasing these dollars, instead we should be placing more money into these prevention efforts. Um, in addition to the adult obesity rate, about um, one-third of children ages 10 through 17 are considered overweight or obese, so um, this is a significant trend among our children in New York State also. The 
Right now, a couple of these prevention programs, the Healthy Heart Program and the um, Obesity and Diabetes Prevention Fund, they fund efforts such as the Healthy Schools Program. Um, this is a program that works with the schools to increase their physical activity um, and also help them improve compliance with um, PE standards. Right now, compliance is dismal for particularly at the elementary level for their physical education standards. So this is a group of contractors that go in and help them comply with these standards and also help them figure out ways how can they improve physical activity throughout the school day so the kids are not sedentary throughout the day. Unfortunately, there's a limited reach. They are not in every area of the state because of limited dollars that exist already. Um, so these are two items that we would urge that um, there be dedicated funding be preserved for the Healthy Heart Program and the Obesity and Diabetes Prevention Program. Um, we would also urge that obesity and diabetes funding, which was consolidated in previous years, actually be separated so we know how much amount is going to each of these programs. There was discussion earlier in the day about the tobacco control program, so I would just like to echo those comments that we also have grave concerns about the tobacco control program possibly being eliminated, eliminated and there's not a dedicated funds. Unlike most programs, this is statutorily required to have an independent evaluation. So we know the program works. We know it's reducing smoker, smoking rates. We know it's keeping kids from quitting. When the program started in 2000, the youth smoking rate was at about 27%. And it's a little above 12% right now. It's made, had a great impact on our youth smoking rates. However, there's still a lot more work to be done there. Um, so lastly, I would just like to emphasize that there is a return on investment with prevention dollars. Investing in community prevention programs pays. Um, for every dollar that's invested, typically you see a return on investment um, of $5.60 within five years. Um, so there, the time frame is not that long. There is a significant return on, invent, um, on um, investment for investing in um, prevention programs. Thank you. No questions? No questions. I have a question. Do you know, uh, do you know uh, Stephen Maliti in your yes, organization? Yes, I do. It's my, she mar he married my uh, niece. Yeah, Just he's, for the he's one of our partners in crime. I want that uh, on the record. And so I have a lot of family pressure as well. I just want yeah. you to know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you have all these personal discussions. Well, you got to you got to get midnight. have a little break. Dr. Brian Ludwig, Chiropractors Council, the Steve Sanders Agencies for Children's Therapy Services on deck. I'm only kidding you, John. I'm only kidding you. Hello, and hello. Thank you, Joint Committee, for having us here today. Uh, I'm a doctor of chiropractic. I practice in Cobleskill, New York. I'm also the district president for the New York Chiropractic Council, and we represent doctors of chiropractic throughout New York State. Um, our mission is to direct people to the realization that healing comes from within, and ultimately promoting health and wellness, like others before me have talked about, is superior to treating a disease after it's already there. So the purpose of the New York Chiropractic uh, Council is to promote the basic philosophy, science, and art of chiropractic to protect the welfare of the practicing doctor of chiropractic without compromise, with parity and respect, and to protect the public's ability to receive chiropractic care without prejudice or uh, financial penalty, and to keep the practice of chiropractic separate and distinct from all other healing professions. So on behalf of the New York Chiropractic Council, thank you for allowing me to appear before your important committee today and offering this testimony. And I don't know if you have a pool to uh, see who has the biggest divot in your chair and what the uh, reward for that at the end of the night. I don't recommend a whole bottle of gin. Maybe a, a trip to a spa would be more appropriate. Um, well, the good news is I'm going to be brief. I'm going to be positive. And we wish to thank and commend the Department of Health for including safe, natural, and cost-effective chiropractic care as a covered service under the essential health benefits, the benchmark health plan selected by New York State. So as it uh, establishes its health benefits exchange as required under the ACA, the uh, Patient Protection Affordable Act. We're not here asking for anything. We're here to look to partner with you to help save the government money and to uh, provide effective care for patients in New York State by improving access to essential health services at the same time 
reducing health care costs. Uh, the ACA Health Benefits Exchange clearly represents a positive step in this direction. I'm also pleased to know that two of our officers, the Chiropractic Council President, Dr. Robert Brown, and Vice President, Dr. John LaMonica, are serving on the Department's Health Benefits Exchange Regional Advisory Committees. So when we're looking at how healthy New Yorkers are, you know, we want to comp have a comparison with something. So I looked at how the overall United States health is in comparison to other nations. So we spend two and a half times more than any other nation in the OECD on health care. We spend more in hospitalization, more in surgery, more in pharmaceuticals, but yet the health of the average New Yorker, the average United States citizen, falls short of many citizens in many countries. Why? We're not getting the cost value from the dollars that we're spending. So I wanted to let you know about there's more and more evidence, scientific evidence, that wellness care provided by doctors of the chiropractic reduces health care costs, improves health, and improves patients' and citizens' quality of life. There's more and more evidence that in addition to wellness benefits, there's a clear cost value benefit to chiropractic care. So you have my testimony in front of you. So if you need more information on some of these studies, I'm happy to, to forward that to you. You know, there's 35 different pages that I could have attached to this with the whole study that's on there. But basically, if you look at, you know, 12 years ago, they did a study on people over 65. They had chiropractic wellness care for five years. They ended up having half the medical visits of people that didn't have that. The need for hospitalization and costs were reduced markedly. Um, in 99, in Chicago, an HMO compared people that utilized chiropractors as their primary care physicians. Now, these chiropractors, what they did was they practiced without drugs, without surgery, and when they compared claims, they, what they found to a normative group was that um, there was a 43% reduction in hospital rates, half the pharmaceutical costs, 40% less outpatient surgeries and procedures. So you can see the cost savings there. They followed up from 2003 to 2005. What they found with an even larger number of people that they checked was that there was even more cost savings. How much cost savings? Well, over seven years, there was a decrease of 60% of in-hospital admissions, 59% less hospital stays, 62% less outpatient surgeries, and 85% less pharmaceutical costs. Now this is compared to people in the same area getting the same HMO product okay, within the same time frame. In North Carolina, no, that, was, that was wellness care. No, people receiving injury care in North Carolina, they wanted to see how well their workers' compensation system was working. So 43,000 claims, 19 years, showed that people that saw a chiropractor, they had $2,900 less in costs per worker, and they got them back to work quicker. Cost the government far less to do it, and they got back to work quicker. In Canada, the Ministry of Health, they were having a budget crunch. So they wanted to see how they could save health care dollars. Lower back pain is one of the biggest costs for health care. So when, what they did was they found out that chiropractic care was safe, it was more effective than other treatments, and it was much more cost effective. The researchers proposed that if they doubled the utilization from 10% to 20%, that there would be a clear net savings. And when I read the study, the numbers jumped out at me. They said as much as $700 million could be saved in that Ontario Ministry. So what is a, this lesson that we can learn in New York and how is it relevant to our state budget? So alternative and complementary health care providers such as chiropractic offer scientifically proven, it's cost effective, and it won't involve hospital stays, won't involve surgeries, won't involve prescription medications. So not only people using less money, they're healthier. We look forward to partnering with the state to help 
lower costs and provide better health care for our citizens in New York State. Um, as a representative of the New York Chiropractic Council, I look forward to speaking with you in the future. And if you wish any more information on this, we'd be happy to provide it. Um, I, I wish you luck on this important work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? By the end of the evening, you think we get a free adjustment? Because we've been sitting in these. I'd be court. happy to look at your Assembly records and uh, <laughs> carry on your chiropractor's work. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stephen Sanders, Agency for Children's Therapy Service, to be followed by Kathleen uh, Kalan, uh, New York State Area Health Education Center System. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman DeFrancisco, Chairman Farrell, Chairman Hannon, uh, members of the Assembly, and Senator Kruger, my former senator and still good friend. Uh, the hour grows late. You have my uh, testimony. I'm not going to read it. I'd like to make a few comments about it, hopefully which will take much less than had I read the testimony. Uh, but just one fast observation, I'm, I am gratified, even though the hour is late, that the, the important people are still here. <laughs> of course, I'm referring to your staff, who is sitting uh, behind you, uh, still here. That's correct. Um, I, 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 <laughs> I should know better, you know, <laughs> I really should. Um, I want to talk for a few moments about uh, early intervention. Um, it's a very important program in the budget. It is almost always the subject of some controversy. It certainly was last year. Um, and I want to bring you back uh, for a moment to last year. And in so doing, I, I just want to um, uh, indicate that I thought the colloquy that Senator Hannon, sir, that you had with Commissioner Shah this morning was very important. Senator, you asked uh, uh, the commissioner some questions about last year's changes which were made in early intervention, and specifically you asked about uh, the fiscal agent. Very important, because the changes that the legislature made last year in early intervention, mostly with respect to how billing would be done in the future, and also relieving some count relieving counties, all counties, of some of their responsibilities. Uh, notably, uh, there will no longer be uh, local contracts with municipalities. Approval will all be done pursuant to a state agreement. Um, uh, the, the legislature also rejected um, a, uh, a proposal that was made by the governor last year, basically to allow for an insurance industry takeover of the administration of early intervention. And in the colloquy, uh, Senator, uh, the commissioner said, well, we know it's 10 months since uh, you passed the last budget, but we still don't have a fiscal agent in place 10 months later. And they still don't have the agreement uh, document uh, that providers will have to sign in order to change the contracts from local contracts to the state. The reason why I mention this is that the changes that were made last year were, were important, they were uh, broad, they were complicated, and they haven't been implemented yet. And the governor comes back uh, this year with basically the same proposal that is, that is very complicated, in my judgment, very bad policy, the same proposal that the governor made last year calling for the insurance industry to take over the entire running and administration of early intervention. I'm not sure if the second floor misunderstands the fact that early intervention, unlike other health programs, is, is really not a health program. It is not a medical program. It is, at its core, an education readiness program and it doesn't easily or nicely or even properly comport to managed care, which is in essence what the governor tried to do last year, which you uh, rejected, and what he tries to do again this year. The notion that the insurance companies will run early intervention, will set the rates, 
will establish the utilization policies, will be able to, for the first time, charge parents uh, co-payments or deductibles, will require that all providers must join a network in order to provide services, as well as evaluators will have to join a network, a network that they may be denied from joining because that will also be up to the insurance companies to decide who they let in networks and who they do not. So why is the governor doing this? For me, the answer seems to be quite simple and quite evident. This isn't about reform of early intervention. This is about mandate relief. Counties no longer wish to pay for the cost of early intervention. It's as simple as that. And by propagating this proposal now two years in a row, it is essentially a gift to the counties. It is saying to the counties, we will relieve you of your costs of running early intervention and in most cases making any reimbursement and will basically say to the providers and the parents, okay, now you're with the insurance companies, good luck. Good luck with that. Because we know what the track record with counties was in trying to get reimbursed by the insurance companies. It's one of the reasons why they don't want this program under their jurisdiction anymore. Because counties could not get reimbursed from insurance companies. And, and essentially what the governor wants to do is, is, is require much less powerful entities, individual providers and therapists to have to vie for themselves with the insurance industry in order to get paid. So my message to you, in a way, is pretty simple. Last year you considered this proposal, you vetted it very carefully, I am sure. I know there were a lot of discussions centered around this proposal last year. And you said no. You didn't say no to all the governor's proposals. You accepted some that seemed to make sense, although, as I say, those proposals have not yet really been developed or certainly not implemented yet, even though in two months from today, or two months from Friday, the implementation of the fiscal agent is supposed to take place, as well as the new contract with the state, even though we don't have a contract with the state yet, hasn't been written, even though there hasn't even been an RFP put out for a fiscal agent. And now the, the governor wishes to come back and, and reassert his proposal that was rejected last year that will only create enormous chaos in, in a program that is enormously successful. My last point about this, unlike a lot of other very good programs in the budget that you consider every year, early intervention does not cost the state money. It saves the state money. How does it do that? For every youngster of all the 75,000 kids who are in the early intervention program, most of them will be much less likely to require much more expensive programs were it not for early intervention. Were it not for early intervention, most of those kids would require far more extensive and, and expensive services in preschool special education and then a decade of school age special education. So I just wish that the governor would not muck around with a program that is working, that a program which for the state is cost effective, for which a number of changes have been made by this legislature, it's time to allow those changes to take place, see how well they work before we try to do something that the legislature did not approve as recently as last year. So I hope the outcome is the same this year. Certainly the issue is the same, and certainly the problems that would be caused if this insurance takeover were allowed to occur would also be the same. And like Blair Horner, I only use nine minutes. However, reading your testimony would have taken less time. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So it is obvious that you were a former legislature the member. Senator, I've always known you were a fast reader, and you, you also <laughs> grasp the issues real fast, so I'm buoyed by that thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, thank, you Kathleen, thank you all. Kathleen Callan. Is it Callan or Callan? Well, it's Callan, but I'm Mary Smith Cambridge. Uh, <laughs> but you're what? Mary Smith Cambridge. Oh, so you're neither. I'm neither. You're somebody else. <laughs> okay, well, if you could state your name when you get to the mic again so the stenographer could get it. And you're from uh, New York State Area Health Education Center System. Next is Tim Egan. Uh, and for those who are anxiously waiting, we, in the later part of the list, we've had two cancellations. So there's hope. Okay. Who are they? They'll need more help. They yeah, are, they are uh, Housing Works and Center for Disability oh, okay. Rights. Okay. Go ahead. I think I can still say good afternoon. Um, my name is Mary Sinkevich. I'm the director for the New York State Area Health Education Center System. I did edit my notes in anticipation of making a shorter uh, comment. I'm hopeful I can still track my uh, thoughts here. But um, I'm the director for the New York State Area Health Education Center System. Um, this afternoon throughout the day, Hurricane Sandy was mentioned several times. And some of the most moving images from Hurricane Sandy were of medical professionals who risked their own safety to care for patients. We know the depth of that commitment because we see it every day. AHEC is focused on the recruitment training and recruitment and training of the next generation of health professionals and retaining current providers working in underserved communities. We work side by side with the state's finest healthcare professionals in private practices, health clinics, hospitals, SUNY campuses, and academic institutions to guarantee that we have enough well-trained workers who reflect the diversity of New York. We are well aware of the budgetary challenges facing our state. We are also aware and understand that the legislature must closely evaluate programs for efficacy, efficiency, and priority, or in other words, how much does it cost, how well does it work, and does it align with the state priorities? So I'd like to focus on each of those areas briefly. In terms of cost, we believe the New York State AHEC system has demonstrated um, to be a responsible steward of state resources. Since 2000, the state has invested $24 million in the New York State AHEC system. In return, we have delivered an additional $58 million in matching funds from federal and other sources. That means for every state dollar provided or invested in the New York State AHEC system, more than two additional dollars are contributed. Of the $58 million in matching funds received since 2000, $28 million were federal funds contingent upon state monies. And I also need to note that these federal funds would not have um, come to New York without AHEC. As in past years, if there is no state allocation for the New York State AHEC system, we are not eligible for federal funds. In the 2012-13 state budget, we received $2.2 million. We are hopeful to receive level funding in 2013-14 in order to maintain our federal and other match funding and to continue our important outreach and workforce training activities. To the second point, effectiveness. Last year, the New York State AHEC system continued with impressive outreach to 40,000 students statewide. Through partnerships between the health workforce supply side, secondary schools and post-secondary academic institutions, and the demand side, healthcare employers and communities. The testimony details types of students and highlights those experiences. I'd like to focus attention on the outcomes of these programs, which are remarkable. Students report that AHEC program participation influenced their decision to pursue a health career. AHEC program participants' college enrollment exceeds national and state rates. Nearly all AHEC program participants in college are attending New York State academic institutions. Long-term results show that previous AHEC program participants are serving their communities by delivering health care and giving back by precepting medical, nursing, and other health profession students. To the point, alignment with state priorities. Earlier this year, the New York State AHEC system launched a five-year strategic plan which aligns both with the state's health care and economic development priorities. We have heard passionate calls from the governor and members of the legislature for more meaningful connections between secondary and post-secondary education 
and the skills needed to succeed. Every day, the New York State AHEC system coordinates with academic institutions and employers to tie classroom learning to available jobs in the healthcare economy. AHECs are conducting on-site experiences for students to learn and practice with current health providers. We also work with non-traditional and displaced workers in their quest to develop job skills to seek healthcare employment. The New York State AHEC system has been actively involved with the health department's initiatives such as Doctors Across New York and the Medicaid redesign team process. The testimony that I've provided so far demonstrates that the New York State AHEC system is cost effective, outcomes driven, and works side by side with the state to achieve shared health goals. My remaining comments are focused on this year's budget. Since 2000, the New York State AHEC system has been a line item in the state budget with a specific allocation. This year, $2.2 million. Health workforce development is a central mission of the New York State AHEC system and has been since our inception. In recognition of our accomplishments in the health workforce arena over many years in partnership with New York State, we are confident that we are included in the workforce development pool. We are awaiting final confirmation of a 2013-14 funding level and that's been commented by other speakers earlier. We ask the legislature for assistance in securing a dedicated and continuing funding stream of $2.2 million for the New York State AHEC system in 2013-14 so that we can continue our work of addressing health workforce needs and expanding primary care access. This is important because our federal funding is only available with state support. Our activities result in professionals providing health care in New York's most deserving communities. Since healthcare is a major driver in local and regional economic development, our ability to recruit and help train health professionals is an integral part of a healthy local, regional, and statewide economy. I thank you for this opportunity and your continuing support. I did provide, in addition to the testimony, copies of our annual report that we provided to the commissioner for our most recent um, completed year, and that provides um, both details on outreach and outcomes and um, over the course of, of the entire year. So I appreciate the opportunity to um, provide testimony uh, this evening and look forward to um, continuing collaboration with uh, New York State and certainly would address any questions anyone would have. Thank you. No questions. The lack of questions is not from a lack of respect or interest, believe me. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Tim Egan, United New York Ambulance Network, followed by Joe, J Joe Wiederhorn. Well, let me be the first to say good evening. <laughs> well, you're right. You We're just about there. Good you evening. Uh, my name is Timothy Egan. I'm the chair-elect of the United New York Ambulance Network, and we represent uh, commercial ambulance services throughout the state of New York. On my right is Steve DeZura. Steve is the vice president of the New York State Volunteer Ambulance and Rescue Association. Uh, we sit here shoulder to shoulder on the same issues. Uh, we're here today to speak to you about the governor's recently released proposed changes to Article 30 of the public health law, uh, which I'm sure, as you know, governs EMS operations and training. Uh, it's our position that a review and overhaul of Article 30 is long overdue uh, and that some of the governor's proposed changes make good ep economic and operational sense. Uh, however, we also feel that some of the proposed changes may require additional information uh, before we can clearly evaluate the efficacy of, efficacy of the proposed changes. Uh, we'd like to go on record as suggesting six areas of concern that may need to be addressed in order for there to be meaningful changes to the EMS health care uh, delivery system. The New York State Volunteer Ambulance and Rescue Association and the United New York Ambulance Network answer at a minimum over 60 percent of the 911 EMS calls that originate in New York State each year. Um, and as such, have a deep appreciation for how the EMS system in New York State functions and how some of these proposed changes would affect the system. Uh, we are concerned that many of the EMS stakeholders involved in the state have had no input in these proposed changes to date. I'm going to summarize uh, the six areas of concern rather than just read them uh, in the interest of time. 
Uh, the first issue is the consolidation of four existing councils into one advisory board. Of those four councils, two of them represent EMS. One is the State Emergency Medical Advisory Committee, and the other is the State Emergency Medical Services Council. Uh, CMAC has 31 members currently, and SEMSCO has 32 members. The new advisory board, uh, as the, uh, according to the proposed budget, will have 31 members. Uh, just based on the fact that it would be four councils into one advisory board, we anticipate having approximately eight members on that new advisory board instead of the 63 combined members that we currently have on the two councils. So as you can see, our concern is representation on the proposed new board. The second issue is on the reduction of the number of regional emergency medical services councils, the local REMSCOs, uh, from the present number of 18 down to 10. Uh, our organization certainly agrees that having 18 REMSCOs may not be the appropriate number. However, we don't have the appropriate demographic data to support uh, uh, the reduction, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. We're, we're reluctant to offer a suggested number because we don't have accurate data. Um, our only real concern with reducing the number of REMSCOs uh, is that the final number of REMSCOs adequately represents the needs of all geographic areas of the state. Item three. Uh, we are concerned that the governor's proposal will remove statutory authority uh, from the local regional councils as well as the state EMS council. Uh, it's the opinion of both of our organizations that both the local councils and the state councils should retain the duties, powers, and the statutory authority that they currently possess. Uh, the state council would serve to ensure that any challenges to the decisions of the local regional council will have the benefit of the system of checks and balances. That would be lost if the local councils and the state council did not have any statutory authority and all decisions were simply made by the Commissioner of Health. We think that a system that utilizes multiple bodies to provide oversight on statutory proceedings is always a good idea, similar to how the executive branch of our government was created. It ensures that due process is upheld. Item four, uh, regarding EMS education funding. Uh, while the governor's budget proposal does not decrease the amount of EMS training funding, uh, it does limit how the money is spent. We support the use of distance learning platforms, much like those seen in community college campuses across the nation, uh, and we believe that they're the future of EMS and integral to ensuring certification requirements are met into the future. Our biggest concern with education, however, is that we believe that the original EMS certifications must continue to be validated by both a written and practical skills examination. Uh, recertification could utilize alternative educational approaches that do not require the written and practical certification process, though. Item five, and this is probably our most important issue. Uh, preserving the use of the certificate of need process as the key determinant of the need for any new ambulance service. Uh, the CON process was originally designated to evaluate the actual need for a new service or facility, uh, and, and that decisions would not negatively affect the system as a whole. That said, our organizations are both sympathetic to situations in which a perceived public health emergency exists. Under that circumstance, where a community is without EMS coverage through no fault of their own, an emergency ambulance operating permit should be granted by the Department of Health without any requirement of a formal CON process. However, absent a public health emergency, we strongly believe that all service providers, specifically proprietary, not-for-profit, and municipal providers, should be required to undergo a mandatory CON and approval process based on public need as currently defined outside of that emergency provision. Item six, statewide EMS mobilization plan. Our organizations both wholeheartedly endorse the formation of a workable state EMS mobilization plan uh, that incorporates the systematic use of all of the EMS resources available throughout the state in a uniform and consistent manner. Um, both myself and Steve are available to provide any additional comment and testimony or answer any questions that you may have, and we certainly thank you for your time this evening. As I said, I tried to keep it brief. Thank you for that, and thank you for your testimony. Any questions? I well, just want to comment. Senator um, Hannon. I'm not Senator. going to add the questions, but if each of you with your respective organizations could send us a little bit more about who's part of your organizations and which geographic areas, who is part of your organization and which geographic areas those members are representing, I'd appreciate it so I get a better handle as to um, what's going on. No problem. We'd be happy to do that. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Joe Wiederhorn, uh, Associate Associated Medical Schools of New York to be followed by Joanne Zanoni. That was Egan. That was Egan. 
Hello, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm Joe Wiederhorn, the president of the Associated Medical Schools of New York, an organization that represents New York State's 16 medical schools. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Um, uh, I just wanted to know, though, uh, should I wait to begin my testimony until this is switched for the gin? It's switched. Yeah, okay. It's already been switched. <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank, thank you, Chairman uh, DeFrancisco, Hannon, and Farrell, members of the Assembly, and Senator Kruger. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, the continued support that you've been providing to the medical schools of the state of New York. In particular, uh, funding for the NYSTEM program, which is the stem cell program. Uh, this year, the executive uh, put it back into the budget for $44.8 million, and we're hoping that you'll continue to support it going forward. There is some really remarkable research that has begun in these schools um, because of this program, including um, a consortium of schools upstate, which includes upstate medical school, Rochester and Buffalo, uh, that is um, doing the initial work that they need to do in order to get FDA approval for clinical trials for a drug that could, in fact, um, reduce uh, the, the number of and the severity of multiple sclerosis. So these, these schools are doing some really important things with these monies, and we really appreciate your support on it. We also um, appreciate your support on the Centers for Excellence program that the governor put into the budget this year. And um, also, uh, we wanted to just let you know that we are um, fully in line with the idea of the economic region of the regional economic councils. Uh, we want um, we are um, uh, we are one of the one of the largest economic drivers in the state. Uh, and for every dollar that is put into research in the state, there is a seven dollar and fifty cent return. So. Uh, we just like to emphasize that uh, we are not only patient care, we're not only education, but we're economic drivers as well. So now that I have thanked you all, I now am going to ask you for your help. Um, we have been running diversity programs to get students into medical school. Um, minority students or students who come from underserved educationally or economically underserved areas since 1985. Since 1995, we've been running a diversity in medicine program that consists of seven programs. Uh, four of them are post-baccalaureate programs. And these programs are extremely important and very unique nationwide because what happens is in order to get into them, the student has to be vetted by the medical school referred to the program. And if the student successfully completes the program, they automatically enter medical school in the next year's entering class. Uh, there are no other programs in the country that keep that conditional uh, acceptance open for students. We provide funds for these students so they don't have to work. Uh, and so that they can devote their time to their studies. These are very successful programs. There are four of them. Three of them actually provide master's degrees for students, so that even if they don't go to medical school when they've completed the program, they do get a master's degree and in, in, a, in a sci an MS in science, and they're able to go out and get a job in industry. The th those three programs are located at Upstate Medical School, Stony Brook Medical School, and New York Medical College in Valhalla. Our largest program is at Buffalo, the University of Buffalo. Um, that one has been around the longest. Uh, that one takes the most students. So these programs are funded through the Diversity in Medicine program at, uh, from the Department of Health. So I am here, as many people have been here today, uh, to say that we really object to and would like to see the budget change for um, putting all programs into pools. We have been funded since 2008. Uh, we've had a line item in the budget. Last year, and for a number of years, we received $1.7 million. 
Um, we are now in a pool with 10 other programs. We don't know if we're going to get the money. We don't know when we will learn if we're going to get the money. If we have to go through an RFP process, that um, is really problematic for us. And it's problematic for us not because we don't think we can compete, because we can. And you'll see we have outcome data that is attached to the testimony. We can compete. The problem is all of our programs that are funded through this money begin July 1st. Students apply to them and they are interviewed and they are told whether or not they can enter these programs and the programs all start July 1. To put these programs into an RFP process or to even to, to not know what the dollar amount is going to be for these programs puts them all at risk. There is a good chance that if that is what happens, we'll not be able to run the programs. Uh, they, they need to know now. They need to make offers to students. They need to uh, ensure they have faculty, lab space, all of the other things that go along with... Uh... Got it? Okay. <laughs> Well, as long as you've got it, <laughs> I'll move on to my next topic then. And my next to topic is uh, just a plea for the SUNY um, uh, health centers. Uh, we have four SUNY medical schools that are tied to health centers. Three of them are tied to, to hospitals. Uh, we're very concerned about the cutbacks in the funds to the hospitals. They are intricately tied, the hospitals and the medical schools. They provide services to one another. There is often a financial exchange between one another. And um, they, the hospitals have been cut every year now. This year they're in the budget at a 30% less than last year. Um, and last year it's because the legislature bumped them up 30% um, because the governor put them in at the same level. Uh, and, you know, the problems that they have are that the state does the negotiating on the contracts for them and then passes the, passes the cost on to the hospitals and the medical schools at the same time they're cutting their budgets. So they're basically set up to, go, to um, not be able to pay their bills. Uh, so what we would like is to have them funded at a rate so that they can afford the contracts that have been negotiated for them. Um, by the state. And that's all I have to say. Any questions? Senator Hannon. In light of the uh, exchange and the eligibility of many more people for health care and insurance, have any of the schools increased the number of students? Yes, actually, um, from 2002 until now, the number of medical students in New York State has increased by 14 percent. Uh, that's due to a number of reasons. It's true. That's no, due to no, a I was number say, of reasons. Huh? How about excluding the new medical schools? Uh, excluding the new medical schools, I can tell you Buffalo is in the process of increasing their size up to 180 students from 140 students. Mount Sinai is increasing their class sizes. There are um, a number of schools that are increasing. There are also a number of schools that aren't. And the reason why they aren't generally comes down to an old topic, which probably is too long to get into at this point. But there are no clinical rotations to put the students in. The clinical rotations, which is the core clinical clerkships where the students learn how to become doctors, um, they go to hospitals that the uh, medical schools have had relationships with. Uh, these core clinical clerkships are being bought by offshore for-profit medical schools. Uh, so, that, so it is getting more and more difficult for the schools to find places to put their students. That's one reason. Uh, another reason is a lack of faculty, a lack of teaching space. Uh, and another reason is that as hospitals shrink, there, um, there are fewer places where they can do their, clerk, their core clerkship. So if you're on a medicine clerkship, you need to see a certain number of different diagnoses. You have to be able to do a number of procedures. But there aren't enough people in the hospitals these days to, do, to be able to do that um, with the students. So as beds shrink classes, there is the potential that class sizes may have to shrink. 
too late to, too late to follow up, but tell your folks we'll have a further discussion. Okay. Uh, not too late for me because uh, the question that I, uh, I didn't realize this, that there's offshore medical schools that are buying clinical time with New York State hospitals? Yes. Because they get more money from these uh, organizations than they would get from the state of New York or from however else it's well, financed? Traditionally, the medical schools have not paid for um, putting s students into hospitals for training. They have faculty and they and the faculty are the attendings at the hospital um, and so there hasn't been a slot per a dollar per slot cost that the medical schools have paid. Mm -hmm. The offshore schools, particularly those in the Caribbean, and I'm talking about the for-profit schools, there are about three extremely large ones in the Caribbean. Um, they pay 400 to 500 dollars per slot per week for students. And what percentage would you say of the clinical space was uh, consumed by these offshore clinics or offshore uh, medical schools? Well, let me put it this way. The um, Department of uh, Education did a survey in 2009, so it's a little, the data's a little old. Uh, at that time, there were approximately 4,000 students doing clinical clerkships in New York hospitals. Uh, of that 4,000, there were uh, 2,000, I'm sorry, 4,400. Of that, about 2,000 were students from offshore schools. And of that, about 1,900 were from three offshore schools. What percentage would that be of all students, approximately? 10? 50 percent. 50 percent. So uh, because of this system, offshore schools are taking up the clinical space, <laughs> and we can't expand our medical schools because we, me uh, we don't have space. And then after, when we're looking for doctors, we end up hiring doctors that went to schools outside of the United States. Right, schools so that are kids, accredited. Kids that are dying to get into medical school can't get into medical school because there's no space. And then we end up having uh, going to a, a physician in the in an emergency room or wherever where that doesn't speak English. Right. Well, oftentimes. Well, I, 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 maybe I always exaggerate, <laughs> uh -huh. but it just seems so unbelievable. It's just this concept. So what? And I'll, maybe you can let Kemp and I know. What do we do legislatively to make it to make, open those spaces, not for offshore medical schools because they get more dollars for that, but to open those spaces because it's outrageous? Well, I think the one thing that that could be done legislatively, and we have spoken about this among ourselves, is that the hospitals in New York State um, need to give priority to New York to students who are from New York Especially and who go to New more York money State Medical us. Schools. I mean, that in and of itself would be something that we're very, um, we well, how, really how, would like. How about if we restored the money to SUNY that you're talking about on a condition that they do what they should be doing anyway, giving preference to New York State? Oh, the State. SUNY hospitals aren't the problem. I, I don't think, you know, the SUNY hospitals aren't the problem. The SUNY the hospitals that are directly affiliated with the SUNY medical schools, they take, you know, they take SUNY students. They're not the issue. The issue yeah, but are did smaller they, did hospitals. They, did they contract with uh, offshore medical schools for clinical space in their hospitals? I Not the SUNY hospitals, okay. no. Okay, all right. No. Okay, last The day. Health and Hospitals Corporation, though, has a $10 million a year contract with one offshore medical uh, school. Man. To put students in their hospitals. Unbelievable. All right, uh, I got one other question. Stem cell research. Yes. Is any of the money for stem cell research uh, devoted to uh, research with stem cells from umbilical cords? I don't know the answer to that. Could I find that out, please? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Assemblyman Titone. Um, thank you. I just want to point out, and I, I think I'm going to be really directing my comments to Chairman Farrell, 
so many of the things that you've said I agree with and, and look forward to advocating for it, but especially I want to point out that the program where you're placing high school students at Staten Island University right. Hospital, yes. I can tell you that's been extraordinarily successful, not only for the, for the high school students, but for the hospital itself. So, Chairman Farrell, be forewarned, <laughs> when conference comes, <laughs> that's, that's terrific. something I'd be very proud and happy to advocate on, on behalf. Thank, thank you. Um, we're going to be up here in February with the directors of the programs, and we will try to get to meet with each of you and go into our outcome data more completely and have the other four, um, I'm sorry, the other three programs that I didn't speak about also come up. So Feel free to contact me beforehand, and maybe we could get some of the kids up here or at least the hospital up here. Sure. 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 Okay. Any further questions? No. Nope. Thank you very much. Thank you. You liven things up a little bit here. I got, I got excited again. Uh, next speaker, Joanne Zanoni, New York State Coalition Against Sexual Assault, to be followed by Tracy Brooks. Okay. Are you able to see that clock all right? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, thank you for hanging in there, and thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony. Um, my name is... Move the mic up, please, closer to you. Oh, yeah. How is that better? Good. Um, my name is Joanne Zanoni. I'm the executive director of the New York State Coalition Against Sexual Assault, NISCASA. Um, NISCASA is a coalition of community-based rape crisis programs that are approved by the Department of Health and located throughout New York State. And with me is Sue Sisto. She's from the rape crisis program in Troy. Um, my written testimony includes some statistics that I hope you find compelling, but I'd actually like to talk a bit more from the heart to you now. Um, I've been working to address sexual violence for the last 13 years, and I truly appreciate, I truly love doing this work. And yet many days, it's extre extremely discouraging. This is why. I'd like all of you to just pretend that the three females that you love most are standing before you right now. Two of them will be sexually assaulted or abused during their lifetime. That's a lot of our daughters, our wives, our partners, sisters, friends, our moms. Lots of boys and men are also sexually assaulted. Um, actually, in New York State, uh, close to half the population will be sexually victimized at some point. So basically, everyone in this room has been impacted either by our own victimization or that of a loved one. And yet, sexual assault remains a silent epidemic. People don't want to think about it. They don't want to talk about it. Many people um, find it difficult to even say the words sexual assault. And so all of this discomfort has really created um, sexual violence as an ignored epidemic. It's not just silent, it's ignored. When people do speak about sexual assault or try to respond to it, um, oftentimes they do so in very hurtful and victim-blaming ways. This causes a lot more harm than people realize, especially for victims who don't have support. Sexual assault and abuse cause a lot of trauma. Over 150 um, physical, psychological, and behavioral health issues are associated with violence and abuse. And this is exactly why our rape crisis programs are so vital. When a victim advocate is present, then a victim is much more likely to have a police report taken and to receive more care in the emergency department. <laughs> These are the victims who experience fewer health issues. Um, a lot of people don't really understand what rape crisis services mean or what does a rape crisis advocate do. And so that's where Sue comes in. She's gonna talk about that. Good evening, and my, again, my name is Susan Sisto. I work at the Sexual Assault and Crime Victims Assistance Program over in Rensselaer County. Um, I've worked there for 14 years, and over that time, I have seen the need for our services to drastically increase. 
Um, unfortunately, we're seeing more and more children and we're seeing males, something that I never saw the first four or five years I was there. Um, most of the sexual assault agencies in this state are um, grant funded and um, there's no extra money in our budget for, you know, any kind of travel, any kind of expensive education and training. We depend on other agencies to help um, get us continuing education programs. Most of our agencies are backed by volunteers. Unfortunately, that's a pool that's dwindling. So it is not uncommon for us to be called out in the middle of the night or on the weekends. Um, we have to have staff manning our hotline 24 hours a day. Um, and the reason for that is not only um, do people have questions in the middle of the night or victims can't sleep because of the traumatization they're going through and experiencing, um, but we go into the hospitals 24 hours a day to accompany victims. Um, some of our services are primary education. We're out in the community. We're teaching children how to stay safe, how to say no, how to get help. And we're teaching adults how to keep their children safe. Um, we do crisis intervention counseling and long-term counseling. We do medical accompaniments, as I said. We do legal accompaniments. As Joanne said, we will have go with the victims to the police, we go to the district attorney's office throughout every proceeding, and we stay with the victim throughout the entire process, which many times, unfortunately, takes more than a year to complete. Um, I am happy to say prosecutions have gone up because when I hear a victim say, I can't do this anymore, I just want it to be behind me, we, I'm frustrated, I don't have an answer, from you know, whatever agency they need. I'm proud to say I work with a team. I work with law enforcement. I work with the DA's office. So I can call them and say, what's going on? Help me out. And because of that, we've had very successful cases. Um, and I, I really appreciate those other agencies. Um, sexual assault, unfortunately, is a public health issue. It has long-term effects on a person's body. People years ago thought it was mostly <laughs> mental health. There are a lot of physical effects that people experience as a result. Um, and the counseling has really made a difference. Um, one of the things I would like to mention as far as uh, public health, we've had clients speak on our behalf to our funders and say, thank God for an agency like this. My medical insurance allowed me four, six, or eight visits to a mental health provider. That does not help. It might help with medication if they need that, but the counseling takes a long time to deal with this trauma. So um, it is a, you know, a public health issue. Um, we do know if clients get counseling earlier in the process, they will recover better. And there again is a cost-effective um, session in that they don't develop the um, unhealthy coping mechanisms. They will not, usually they will not become um, self-medicating or self-mutilating, which is what we do see many times. Past survivors also can get help at our agency. Many times because of our prevention education programs, I have a, a parent call and say, I thought I dealt with this 20 years ago and I just saw this information and it's kicked up everything. We help them and they come in right away and get counseling. Also, this has such a rippling effect. When we have a college student sexually assaulted, many times the roommate will come and say, I need help. I don't know how to handle her in these crisis situations. Or for other friends or parents, I have to tell you, most of my counseling is many times with parents and lots of times with dads. Dads have usually the role to, to protect and fix, and now they're in a helpless situation because they can't do that. So I deal a lot with dads um, and many times teach them how to speak to their daughters. They'll say to me, I can't say a word. She's going to snap my head off. Everything I say is wrong. That's where they come and find it very safe to come and first of all express their emotions and their feelings and then to learn how do they 
kind of twist their words a little bit so that the victim is hearing it in a safe way. Thank you. Um, and it's not just the value of the, the services. It's also, you should know that there was an increased demand for services. Between 2011 and 2012, the total number of victims that were served by rape crisis programs increased 62%. Um, Meanwhile, the rape crisis programs are dealing with dwindling resources. It is really a big struggle. Um, Karen Ziegler, who is the director from the program in Albany, um, she included written testimony. She explained it this way. Not that long ago, the center had 16 staff members. Now we have 11 and a half. In the past few years, we've lost almost 15,000 in grant funding. It may not sound like a lot, but we are working on bare bones budgets. Um, four of our staff work part-time jobs after hours to make ends meet. They haven't received raises in five years. They, they can't get enough volunteers because volunteers are now also working multiple jobs. Um, you know, there's a domino effect. This leads to a lot of trauma and burnout for staff. Um, the New York State budget has included less than $2 million for rape crisis intervention and prevention services since 2008. Yep, just under. Um, and uh, we really need more resources. I mean, frankly, that's it. Um, another 190 advocates statewide. Um, I know two million may sound sound like a lot, but when you've served 31,000 victims in a year, that comes to about $65 per victim. I don't know a lot of places where you can get good service for $65 per victim. And as Sue explained, it's, it's not like, it's not an hour worth of service. It's long-term service. Thank you for your time. Th thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Kruger has a question. Well, I guess it is, I guess I'll start with the statement. It's actually appalling to me that the state of New York is putting under $2 million into services for survivors of sexual assault. But having said that, how could you have responded in one year to that large a jump in your statistics? What were people doing or what do you think happened you know, in that 12 month period in the state? Uh, did you I was gonna <laughs> say, but our agency, we find going and doing our primary education programs, the biggest um, door to open to victims. I'll go into a school and do a program and I can almost pick out I'm talking second graders, children who have been abused and who come up to me and will tug on my jacket and say, I have a secret. And my throat, I get a lump in my throat, and I'll say, what do you want to do? Because I want to empower them. And they'll say, I want to tell you. And so that's just one example. Our primary education um, programs just let it be safe that you are not alone. There's people who will believe you, and then they come for help. Um, and, and what we're also doing is going into the schools and doing counseling one-on-one. -on -one. The schools want us there. And, um, and we're also doing some group counseling so we can get groups of people in to try and get one counselor to reach many people. And at one time, at least in the city of New York, I'm from Manhattan, um, some of the hospitals were helping to underwrite the rape counseling services. Do you, is that still happening anywhere? Yeah, I work in a hospital. And um, to their credit, they will, our rent is minimal. Our phone is minimal. They give us employee benefits. But that's the best, you know, that we get. They don't give us any cash per se. Uh, and that is not necessarily the case in every mm -hmm. um, hospital. Um, we, we did have um, one program that was in a hospital in New York City that um, was the hospital was not going to support the program any further and um, thank goodness another hospital that has a rape crisis program came in to help. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is uh, Tra uh, Tracy uh, Brooks, Family Planning Advocates. Housing Works uh, submitted their testimony so they won't be testifying, followed by uh, Kate Breslin. Good evening. 
Uh, thank you so much for letting us testify. And as you're all very well aware, Family Planning Advocates represents all the family planning health centers across the state of New York, the 11 Planned Parenthood affiliates, include, as well as hospital-based, federally qualified health centers who receive the Family Planning Benefit um, Grant, county health providers, as well as freestanding Family Planning Health Centers. You've got my testimony. Uh, we're telling you a lot about how we survived the last five years, how we've streamlined our businesses, and how we're ready to move forward in the health care reform. So what I'd really like to talk about are the six buckets. Um, a lot of my colleagues have come up and talked about, please restore my funding. It's not only a, it's not about restoring funding. It's about the fact that the Department of Health couldn't possibly get this accomplished with so few staff. So we have all been surviving the Medicaid redesign and the implementation of Medicaid redesign, as well as all of the cuts, because it has been a very trying four years, five years. And the health care delivery system has changed exponentially. You heard both hospital association um, presidents talk to you about really what's happening with the delivery care system, right down to the family planning providers. And we've hung in there. We're all still in there. We are becoming lean. We're closing health centers to look at coordinated care models and how to deliver health services in a coordinated fashion. We're making sure we're going to be where patients are at. But to finally stabilize Medicaid at some levels, and some people disagree with that statement, for my providers, Medicaid is somewhat stabilized, but now turn to the grant side of the house and throw that up in upheaval. In the year that we're all preparing to be able to help enroll and treat more patients who are going to have health insurance, recognizing that the soft roll of the exchange should happen sometime this summer, and that by January 2014 we'll all be ready, and that we'll have our staff in place, and that we're adequately, adequately appropriately sized for the new patients, to take approximately 30% of any one given provider's budget, or rape crisis 100%, of their budget and throw it into question without having firmly in place the new RFA process, all of the approvals that have to happen when you write an RFA. All, I mean, I can't tell you how many times we have to listen to the Department of Health tell us it's going up the chain for approval, it's not approved yet. The contracts for 2013 haven't, all the way, haven't gone all the way through the approval process yet. And I'm being told it's not being held up because of this budget. But to, to wait and to be able to be sure that cash flow continues to keep health care providers able to be appropriately staffed to provide the services to the folks that we provide services to has to be the number one top priority. So when we look at it, I'll tell you, our grants that we get from the state, we thank you very much for and for securing during this difficult time, are the grants in which people on a sliding fee scale come and seek care, who don't have health insurance or can't access their health insurance because their deductibles or co-pays are far too high. So when we look at that, it's direct access to services that could be in jeopardy. So what I would ask is if you can't get this six-bucket bundle undone, or if you find a way that the legislature actually still can be part of the two branch check and balance on spending in the state with the six buckets, because I'm concerned that that goes away as well. What I would ask is no implementation until every RFA is approved through every level of the Department of Health, the AG's office, the OSC's office, the second floor and division of budget that no provider should have to move into this new competitive grant system until the Department of Health has dry run it itself to know that it will not hold up reimbursement for any of the providers. I understand that they're looking at 89 different contracts that start at every single different month of the year and that they really have a problem with predictability of spending. I am all for streamlining. The folks that provide family planning are all for streamlining and ensuring that we have quicker turnaround. But we can't be the guinea pigs anymore. We've sat in guinea pig through Medicaid redesign. Presumptive eligibility was supposed to be live November 1st, 2012. It's barely live in upstate New York and on hold until March because of Sandy in New York City where we have over half of the patients who will benefit from presumptive eligibility for family planning health services. Having programs go live that providers can't work with, that hold up revenues that have been budgeted for, would be irresponsible. And it would also lose 
the safety net, entry points at primary care, comprehensive and women's health, at a time when we're building up the strength of our network to prepare for health care implementation and more people having health insurance. Got it. Got it? Thank you very much. That's my biggest sticking point. My second point I will say is I agree, and I'm sorry that Assemblyman Godfrey's not here. We are very concerned with the Family Health Plus proposals. Um, if there is a basic health plan, that is certainly the direction we'd like to see it go, but also agree with the wraparound from the 133 to 150% of um, folks straight through, not with a deadline of December. Um, I think I did it in about five minutes and 15 seconds. If you have any questions, sure. On the bucket, every one of those is a currently supposedly funded program. I wonder if at least the ones within your scope of topic jurisdiction, you look at them and say, are you current in the payments from the 12-13 budget or from the 11-12 budget? I'd really like to find out just what's the existing state of fact <laughs> before they try to implement Sure. I can tell you for the family planning grant, the CAPS grant, and rape crisis, which is not this part of the budget, um, but I think it's in justice. It's not here in the health department. All of our fund, all of our payments are up to date. And um, one of the things the FPA does for its membership is help to push vouchers and payment. And we have just finally been successful yesterday in getting our first um, advance for 2013. So the fourth quarter of this fiscal year uh, paid out to our folks. Our contracts all start on January 1st. So it's the advance of the first quarter of the new contract year. So family planning providers, we are all up to date. You have it. Any reapprope that you did in our line would be for providers who, for whatever reason, no longer um, are uh, accepting the grant or taking the grant, whether county has closed or a hospital has closed a family planning, or that they never, they're 51 grantees. At one point, they didn't have all 51 granted out. Okay. Um, and I think, I really tried to narrow it down, so I just want to make sure no I missed anything. And then I can come talk to you if I did. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Senator DP. I was just going to say your point one about anti-buckets is very well said. Very thank well you. said, and I think you got a lot of support over here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kate Breslin, uh, President and CEO of Schuyler Center for Analysis and Advocacy, to be followed by Kathy Roberts and uh, Trilby DeJong. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Evening. You have, um, you have staying power. Thank you very much for your staying power. I appreciate it. Um, as said earlier, I'm Kate Breslin. I'm the president and CEO of the Schuyler Center for Analysis and Advocacy. We are a 141-year-old organization working to shape policies that improve health, welfare, and human services in New York. Um, I'd like to use this. Uh, you have my testimony in front of you. I'm going to pull out a few of the key points. I like to use this as an opportunity to kind of flag a few issues that we're particularly either concerned about or supportive of. Um, and then circle back later. Um, I'll echo the concerns of Tracy and others about the buckets, and I think Tracy did a great job um, articulating those concerns. I also um, wanted to talk to you about um, something that I, th I don't know if folks have talked about much since uh, earlier, earlier on in the day, and that's the hospital indigent care pool. Um, the executive budget proposes improvements to the hospital indigent care pool distribution methodology that aim to improve transparency and accountability um, and also tie it more closely to um, the hospital financial assistance law. And so um, we're very supportive of that. This is something that I've talked to you about before. We're supportive of the, the governor's proposed changes to the hospital um, indigent care pool that'll make it more transparent and more accountable so that the, the huge amount, more than a billion dollars, actually goes to help cover care that actually gets provided to real uninsured people. Um, but we also would urge you to um, move forward with uh, a, a proposal by Assemblyman Gottfried that would speed, speed up that transparency and accountability even faster and require um, some, we think, some better reporting about how the money gets spent. The um, 
The governor has proposed funding for a Medicaid managed care ombuds program. This is something that um, I and our organization have worked very hard on together with our partners at Medicaid Matters New York. Um, you've heard a lot about the huge transition of the entire Medicaid population to Medicaid managed care and particularly for some of our most vulnerable people in the state, people who are um, aged or disabled, it's going to be a huge, huge challenge. And so the idea is that a Medicaid managed care ombuds person could, or, or actually it's a, it's a program, it's not a one single person, could help with that transition to Medicaid managed care. We know that people who um, are not disabled and who um, don't already have those challenges already have problems in the managed care system. So the idea is that um, this would help help those folks. And frankly, we're excited because it's something that, from our understanding, the Department of Health fully embraces because they see it as something that would help them too. So we, we urge you to support the funding for that. And, and the department included additional funding for that in their waiver application to the federal government. Um, I'll echo the concerns. I, I think um, Tracy mentioned them and also I think Tony Fiore did a good job explaining about the elimination of Family Health Plus. We have those same concerns. We would urge you to make sure that there is some way of kind of covering that set of parents that are in that, um, that gap of 133 to 150 percent of poverty, and we also um, urge you to consider the creation of a basic health plan. The, the state is waiting for guidance from the feds now, but we think that New York should be at least moving forward to get the pieces in place to create that for, for low-income folks who, according to the federal rules, might, could qualify for subsidies through the exchange, but for whom the exchange, it, it's likely that even with those subsidies, health insurance will be too expensive. And then I also um, was excited to hear that we heard about um, maternal, infant, and early childhood home visiting. Our organization convenes a statewide group of folks who um, both do home visiting and are supportive of home visiting. It's a really promising, maternal, infant, and early childhood home visiting is a really promising way to um, improve outcomes for extremely vulnerable and at risk moms and kids and their families. And um, we urge you to, to restore the $2.5 million that you all added last year for Nurse Family Partnership and continue to find ways to support um, evidence-based maternal, infant, and ch early childhood home visiting in the budget. Um, and and I, I think my, the folks before me did a great job talking about the huge um, savings that don't only accrue in health. And I think that's been one of our challenges is the savings kind of accrue across systems. Um, but we're making the case in the health. And I'll, I promise you we're making the case in other venues, too. <laughs> and then finally, something that we haven't heard um, talked about today, so that w that's why it was important for me to talk about. We, we at SCA have for a long time been part of an adult home reform coalition. And this is in the um, adult homes are regulated through the Department of Health. The executive budget includes funding for supportive housing services for adult home residents. Um, we've worked on this, as I said, for many years to increase housing options for persons with psychiatric disabilities who are living in adult homes. Adult homes were originally created for people who are aged, um, but now nearly 40 percent of adult home residents have a psychiatric disability. So we urge the legislature to support the very long overdue funding for adult home residents for supportive housing. Um, and finally, we urge you to support um, advocacy for adult home residents. The, the leading advocate for adult home residents is a partner of ours. I'm not asking for restoration of any funding for, of our own, but um, the Coalition of Institutionalized Aged and Disabled does lay advocacy in adult homes with adult home residents um, with psychiatric disabilities. And, they inform residents of their rights. They help um, work with residents with um, the adult home operators. And in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy, um, folks from the coalition, the CAD, the Coalition for, uh, um, 
institutionalized aged and disabled worked around the clock to help locate and relocate um, people for, in adult home in adult homes and um, have helped to work to find them stable housing going forward and so we would urge you to have the Department of Health fund that that essential lay advocacy um, for this extremely vulnerable population and um, I look forward to working with you over the next many months um, on the budget thanks any questions? Uh, you may. <clears throat> uh, Mr. President, as you're doing the uh, being happy with the ombudsman for the Medicaid managed care, um, when, we, the, when we passed the program originally, we put a number of consumer safeguards in, patient safeguards, so that we would, because there would otherwise be incentives to cut care. Mm -hmm. I would want to ask you if you would examine the, those safeguards that are there in existing Medicaid managed care. And I'm not saying they're all the best because we don't know. It was such a low population used. But then compare it to is there overlap? Is, will there be efficiencies, et cetera, with the ombudsman? Fair enough. And I think it, it, what, what we don't see in the budget is, is some of the work that I know we've, many of us at Medicaid Matters have been doing to, to really come up with a, a firm proposal, w along with um, the folks in the department. So what, we're eager to see the more, some more detail about that proposal well, so that, that, that we don't see yet. So would we. I think uh, Mr. Lytle pointed out there's potential of 200,000 people in Medicaid managed care. So that's a bigger population than, say, by almost by half than we have in our nursing homes in the state. So that and to tell you the truth, my, what, my real recommendation would be that $3 million is just not even close to enough. Well, but but yeah, I know it's I'm more, cognizant instead of, of the money, it would be the process. That would be the thing. Um, the other part, last part is you're talking about the mental health and, and adult homes. There's also a, there's a proposal in REG that just reissued that says that no adult home can have more than 25% of their population of people who have been in the mental health field. I'm understanding what they're trying to address, but I'm afraid what's going to happen to people who are now in a home and the home has to say you can no longer stay here? And what's the criteria for the home to say which of the number of people in their home that constitute more than 25 percent can no longer stay there? Well and we, we, that's one of the reasons we've been advocating for so long for the support of house, for the, you know, the other side of things, like you're saying. And I think the other thing to keep in mind is I, I don't think it, the, the plan isn't that pe the people will be, to, adult, adult home residents will be told you can no longer live here, that, but that they need to be given the option to move out. And so the, the idea, the, the reason we're supportive of, the, of funding for the support of housing is so that um, there's I don't, a, mind, there is a I don't mind the supportive housing, but I'm told it's a lot more than it's a lot more hurry up and get out than just an option to get out. And by the way, no one's in an adult home against their will. It's all voluntary. T to the extent they they have other options, it may be voluntary. Well, but the, but the point but is, that's my they, whole point. If there's, if there's going to be a requirement, where are they going to go? So, and as you know, we've now had the first supportive housing project. I don't know if they cut the ribbon or opened the door, but I saw the press release. But there's a lot more lead time to any housing project than one can imagine. Yeah. And actually, that's, that's also part of the reason that we're so supportive of um, funding for the lay advocacy that SEAD provides because they work closely with residents. They have and do work closely with residents when there are opportunities to move out of adult homes to help them as they transition into a different type of living arrangement. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Kathy Roberts and Trilby DeJung. Just Kathy Roberts. Just Kathy. Kathy's here. and. Okay, and after that will be Leslie uh, Grubler, and then the final, after that, is the final featured speaker, Paul Masalak. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe he's not the featured speaker. Maybe you are. I don't know. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to testify. Uh, I'll keep this brief. Um, my name is Kathy Roberts, and I'm a senior paralegal at the Empire Justice Center. Empire Justice is a statewide civil legal services organization. We focus on poverty law issues. We have offices in Albany, Rochester, White Plains, and Central Islip. Um, we've submitted some very detailed written testimony that you have before you. I'm just going to really quickly summarize um, our comments here. Um, we're very supportive of the executive budget's approach to implementing New York's health benefit exchange through integration and expansion of Medicaid as envisioned by the Affordable Care Act, uh, as well as the long-awaited reform of distribution of Medicaid's charity care funds. We're grateful that EPICS remained intact for our uh, low and moderate income older adults, uh, but we are concerned um, that some consumers are going to lose access due to the proposed budget's elimination of the Family Health Plus program, concerns that um, you've heard from others, um, elimination of spousal refusal, uh, as well as immediate needs Medicaid. Our suggestions for maximizing protections for vulnerable populations while recognizing critical efficiencies and savings to the program are laid out in our um, written comments. So as I already said, we're very supportive of the um, proposed uh, Medicaid expansion and uh, integration with the state health insur insurance exchange, um, including that adults will be able to receive continuous coverage for 12 months, that spend down will be, become available to um, single adults and childless couples, and that pregnant women be with incomes between 133% and 200% of the federal poverty level will be able to receive full Medicaid benefits, and we hope that you will be supportive of that as well. We're concerned about um, parents right now who are in Family Health Plus who are going to be um, essentially worse off under the exchange, and you've heard the, those concerns from others. So our recommendation would be that there would be a, a placeholder for a basic health program and that in the meantime that there's wraparound protection for those folks. Um, we are very supportive of the uh, comprehensive Medicaid benchmark benefit that the uh, proposed budget has laid out. We would um, suggest that there be complete alignment of the benchmark benefit with the existing Medicaid benefit in order to minimize administrative um, cost and maximize continuity of care. And there's more explanation in our written testimony of why we think that's important. Again, very supportive of the um, reforms to charity care distributions. We're also uh, supportive of Assemblymember Gottfried's bill um, that would call for public reports and tightening the transition time frame. Very concerned about the elimination of um, prescriber prevails protections in the Medicaid managed care pharmacy benefit, and we would actually recommend that those protections be strengthened, not weakened. Um, we did a, a very quick little um, chart here. We looked at um, the managed care plans that are available now in New York State, and we looked at how many um, atypical antipsychotics they cover, and the range is all over the board. You know, there, there's a plan, it's an HIV special needs plan, it covers all 11 drugs around the formulary. And you can see there are some plans that cover um, 10 drugs, and there are two plans that just cover four drugs. And depending on where you live in the state, you may, there are eight counties that only have one Medicaid managed care plan in mainstream managed care. So you may be stuck with one plan and may be very limited in terms of what drugs you can access. So we are also concerned that there's not much data on what's going on. That's a, a theme you've heard echoed before. Um, and until that data is available, we would recommend that um, prescriber prevail protections remain. Um, concerned about the elimination, the proposed elimination of spousal refusal rights, um, echoing the testimony that you've already heard from AARP about why that's important. Um, we're concerned about the continued rapid expansion of Medicaid managed care so that essentially everybody will be uh, rolled into Medicaid managed care. We're worried about how that's going to affect people with complex needs, particularly in rural parts of the state, and you know, people with terminal illnesses uh, who right now are, don't have to join managed care, that they may have to join. People with third-party health insurance coverage where Medicaid is paying for the premium could also be required to join managed care so that Medicaid would be paying two premiums. Um, 
We um, also, we have a, a lot of detailed testimony about the proposal for FIDA, the fully integrated dual advantage plans. Our recommendation that it is that it would be operated as a demonstration project before authorizing a broader program and that there be more transparency built into the plan selection and oversight. Um, and again, we have some very detailed recommendations in our written testimony. Let's see, I'm just going to try to speed this up here. Okay. Um, Want to make sure that there are due process protections uh, in managed long-term care as we continue to expand managed long-term care. Supportive of the ombuds program that's been discussed. Um, Want to make sure that there's meaningful support provided for health homes. Um, that there'll be um, and finally, uh, I don't think this has been discussed, so I want to just make sure that you're aware of it, that the executive budget is, has language that would propose to sharply curtail immediate needs Medicaid so that um, only certain populations would be able to get uh, in immediate needs Medicaid. People who've been determined eligible for Medicaid and are waiting to get their card or who qualify for presumptive Medicaid coverage um, would be able to access temporary Medicaid. But other populations, including people who are jointly applying for, for cash assistance in Medicaid and who have immediate medical needs, would no longer be able to receive temporary Medicaid so that they could get a prescription filled or go to the doctor. Um, so we would urge you to reject the um, proposed budget's elimination of immediate needs Medicaid for those uh, folks. I think I've kind of sped through everything um, and be happy to follow up with you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Um, the uh, Leslie Grubler, and uh, is uh, Paul Masalak here? Oh, thank you, Paul. <laughs> so you are the fe this is the featured speaker. We've been having all these prelims, all the first acts. Now here we go. This is the st everybody back there. Listen up. Listen up. This is everybody. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Sit up. Well, good evening, Chairman DeFrancisco and Chairman Farrell, Chairman Hannon, Senator Kruger, and um, Assemblymember Oaks, and Rhea. We're so pleased to be here today as your 41th, 41st and final speaker of the day. The idea of that is already overwhelming, as I'm sure it is to you, but being that we are clinicians, be it or early intervention clinicians, we couldn't help but do some self-assessments and assessments of your behavior throughout this entire <laughs> this entire event. Out, and excuse me, actually, you're, out of, you're out of order. You're out of order. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're <laughs> we're extremely impressed by your ability to um, attend and to alert yourselves. Each one of you has a different manner in which you manage that, and whether it's sipping water or touching your face or holding the microphone, or pressing yourself into the chair, or swinging back and forth, or walking. It's all very effective and very meaningful. So we just wanted to share that with you because as clinicians, we clinish, so. How about swearing under our breaths? Is that part of it? <laughs> now, there was one other thing. You, you make very funny jokes, and that's very important. Okay, so. very good. All right. Okay, so we're here today to speak to you about early intervention. I'm the founding director of United New York Early Intervention Providers and Parents as Partners, and I'm here with my colleague, um, Ann Bridge Law, who's also the New York City Regional Coordinator. I'm going to excerpt pieces of my written testimony because I know that you have this. Um, there are four issues that need to be addressed as a result of this year's proposals, all of which reflect on the question, what does New York State want to be in the area of early intervention? The issue of screening versus evaluations as an eligibility streaming measure, the role of proper utilization of commercial insurance in early intervention, the state's decision to maximize um, a medical model and minimize a developmental model in New York State early intervention, and then our seven um, points of light retrospective. If you take a look at section A under disadvantages, that's what I'm going to focus on, the disadvantages of the issue of screening um, versus evaluation. In IDEA Part C regulations of part of 2004 published in 2011, screening is optional. 
Because screenings are typically brief and not conducted by a professional trained in the area discipline screened, we run the risk that children will be missed in the screening process and fall through the cracks. Does New York State want that risk? What does New York State want to be in early intervention? New York State early intervention does not track or in any way follow up with children who have passed a screening. Um, that is, quote, if screening indicates there are no concerns, participation in the program ends. And again, I ask, what does New York State want to be in the area of early intervention? Screenings provide little opportunity to establish a connection with the individual. Such a connection is an important part of establishing a therapeutic relation, particularly in a parent-driven program like early intervention. While screen screening can possibly be administered to more children theoretically, the children who would be screened have already been referred through child find, that is, a child has already been removed from the general population. If we jump down to the role and proper utilization of commercial insurance in early intervention, Mr. Sanders had mentioned this piece. All of you had addressed this last year, probably ad nauseum in your discussions and your conferences. But there are a couple of pieces that are a little different this year that I want to highlight. Requiring insurers to cover service provision in the natural environment consistent with IDEA Part C, the home environment, and a community environment is critical. And that is one difference between this year and last year. The emergence of the fiscal agent, the entity prescribed in 2012-2013 legislation as a highly trained entity in insurance reimbursement should facilitate the desired increase in this reimbursement outcome to be determined. IDEA Part C does not list a representative of the insurance company as a potential member of the IFSP team, and that is very important because this differs from federal legislation. Currently, in the governor's proposal, he is suggesting that a representative of the insurance company become part of the IFSP team, and that's problematic. Um, does New York State wish to distinguish itself in this matter? How will the state ensure that commercial insurers do not drag their feet in paperwork processing that holds back services and reimbursement for those services? How will the state control when commercial insurers place inordinate demands on the therapeutic process and so doing are not in compliance with IDEA Part C and do not act in the best interests of our state's most vulnerable children? In section C, I'm going to jump to where it says, um, note the following, and this is regarding the state's decision to maximize a medical model and minimize a developmental model. I'm sure you've heard those terms before, but we provided a definition for you to refer to. As per 4 of 2012, legislation for the first time in the history of New York State, all providers are entering in agreements directly with the state, effective this April. The state has a golden opportunity to standardize, streamline, and appropriately train in the name of cost effectiveness. This is key, and it's something as providers, particularly independent contractors and subcontractors, that we've been looking forward to, the opportunity to directly be enter agreements in the state, bypassing um, agencies that have not been, in our estimation, meaningful in that way. According to the governor's proposal, each, propo each provider will be asked to become a network provider and, quote, the department will determine the number of insurers considered sufficient for the approved provider. Three, New York State is granting commercial insurers a seat at the IFSP table and requiring providers to join insurance networks. Parents who previously could choose their own evaluator must now choose only an evaluator in their insurer's network. That's a difference. The insurer will be required to ensure that, quote, there are a sufficient number of geographically accessible participating providers and there are sufficient providers in each area of specialty of practice to meet the needs of the enrollment population. The state is requiring providers to negotiate their rate with insurers, but not requiring insurers to negotiate their rate with providers. We have found across New York State that insurers will give us rates. There's no negotiation here. Are we replacing quality with cost savings? What will the impact on quality of services be? How do you spell control? This will gravely alter the direction of, of treatment in the state's most vulnerable children. The seven points of light serves as um, a review of what has transpired over the last three years, and it's just an important piece to mention. Eligibility standards have increased. Fewer children are deemed eligible. There has been a budgetary impact. 
The structure of agencies has been changed, a costly change to many. Agencies, small and large, are required to now have QA staff, and there has been a budgetary impact. The roles of providers have been, the rates of providers have been reduced due to rate reimbursement reductions, averaging 15% in addition to the WEF and TEF, and another 5%. Providers are now making less than they did at the inception of EI in New York State in 1993 under another Governor Cuomo. Rates will significantly reduce once again in one-sided negotiations with commercial insurance and what will the budgetary impact be. The conflict of interest executive order has been enacted. Providers cannot conduct evaluations and then treat the same child. We know there will be a budgetary impact for that as well. The Executive Compensation Order 38 scheduled to be implemented four of 13 promises that 75 to 80 percent, 5 percent of state funds will go to the children. There will be a budgetary impact on that. The fiscal agent has been initiated in legislation but has not come to fruition. Once that does come to fruition, there will be a budgetary impact. As per 4, 2012, legislation for the first time in the history of New York State, all providers are entering agreements directly with the state. The state has a golden opportunity to standardize, streamline, and appropriately train. So my question is, hasn't New York State early intervention done its share? In light of the fact that EI, early intervention in New York State, is a cost-effective program with a savings of 7 to $17 per every dollar spent in future uh, special ed costs. And I ask the, the final question, what does New York State want to be in the area of early intervention? A follower or a leader? An agent of change? Part of the maintenance of mediocrity or the manifestation of miracles? Does New York State want to provide the minimum in terms of quantity and quality of services? I thank you for your time. Any questions? I make a motion you go first next year. Thank you. I think everybody's probably uh, wiped out here, but at some point, I see all the questions and all, you know, it may, at, at some point, can you drop off to me what you think is got to actually, how your budget should change to accomplish what you're talking about? I, I see all the help you, the questions. We will. Senator, we always do. Okay. And we will be that, sure that you get one. That, that would be very helpful. Thank you so much. And thank Have you. a good we, evening. I Home you, safe. I'll, I'll be very honest with you. You were definitely worth waiting for. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you, ladies.